Tantor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents On to Stalingrad, Operation Winter Thunderstorm and the Attempt to Relieve Sixth Army, December 1942, by Horst Scheibert, translated by Janice W. Anker, narrated by Derek Perkins. Forward. Stalingrad. The name of the industrial city on the Volga will be connected forever with the cataclysmic battle that was fought here between August 1942 and February 1943, and which led to the destruction of the German Sixth Army in the ruins of the city that bore Stalin's name. The events of the battle within the pocket are well known and have been thoroughly studied, not least the gruesome details of human suffering on both sides. One episode in this struggle is, however, less known and understood. In fact, this chapter is often mentioned only in passing when the Battle of Stalingrad is discussed. This is the German relief attempt, which saw a German panzer corps fight its way towards the encircled Sixth Army. This operation, called Wintergewitter, or Winter Thunderstorm, was facing problems from the start. The Germans were not able to assemble the envisaged force of four divisions, and, in the end, the attack was launched on 12th December 1942 by only two divisions, the 6th and 23rd Panzer Divisions. During the operation, some reinforcements arrived, in particular the 17th Panzer Division, but the odds were against the Germans from the start. The Soviets realised the threat that this relief operation posed and threw large quantities of troops against the German 57th Panzer Corps. As a consequence, the German advance was slow and costly, but the German troops continued to fight their way towards the encircled troops in Stalingrad. However, by 24 December 1942, the troops were exhausted, and Soviet counterattacks forced the Germans to abandon the offensive. This sealed the fate of the soldiers in Stalingrad. The encircled troops had been able to hear the fighting of the advancing relief forces and their clashes with the Soviets. Over the Christmas period, they noticed that the sound of battle faded, and they realised that the relief attempt had failed. This was a bitter Christmas present for the encircled troops, who understood that this meant the end of the Sixth Army. The relief force was stopped approximately 48 kilometres short of the pocket. At this stage, the only chance of survival for at least a part of the encircled troops would have been the attempt to break through to the relief force. This order never came. The consequences were bitter for the soldiers in Stalingrad. The exact casualty figures are not known, but it is fair to assume that approximately 100,000 men died in the pocket, 90,000 went into captivity, and only 5,000 returned home. The Soviets suffered even higher casualties in this tragic episode of World War II. This book, first published in German in 1956, tells the story of the relief attempt. The author, Horst Scheibert, served as a company commander in one of the tank companies of 6th Panzer Division as it was fighting its way towards the perimeter of the Stalingrad pocket. He continued to fight in the Wehrmacht after the relief attempt had failed, and, by the end of the war, he had been highly decorated, including both classes of the Iron Cross and the German Cross in gold. After World War II, he joined the West German Bundeswehr and reached the rank of brigadier. Combining the reports in war diaries and other official communications with his own personal experience, the author creates a vivid picture of the struggles as the division desperately tried to fight its way to the perimeter of the Stalingrad pocket. The fighting was hard. As Scheibert states in the introduction, his regiment lost seven out of eight tank company commanders in December 1942. Only Scheibert escaped unscathed. It is this combination of different perspectives that makes the book particularly valuable, and which offers new insights into this less well-known episode of one of the most gruesome struggles in the history of warfare. Professor Matthias Strohn, Master of Studies, Doctor of Philosophy, Fellow of the Royal Historical Society, Head of Historical Analysis, Centre for Historical Analysis and Conflict Research, Camberley. Visiting Professor of Military Studies, University of Buckingham. Glossary of Rank Equivalents German General de Infanterie English General of the Infantry 
General der Panzertruppe, General of Armored Troops, General Leutnant, Lieutenant General, Oberst, Colonel, Oberst Leutnant, Lieutenant Colonel, Major, Major, Hauptmann, Captain, Oberleutnant, First Lieutenant, Leutnant, Lieutenant, Stabsfeldwebel, Staff Sergeant, Oberfeldwebel, First Sergeant, Feldwebel, Sergeant, Unteroffizier, Corporal, Obergefreite, Lance Corporal. Editor's Note These are only approximate equivalents, as some German ranks have no real equivalent in English-speaking armies. Introduction In his book, Verlorene Siege, Lost Victories, General Field Marshal Erich von Manstein writes, This life and death race, which began with the 12th December appearance of the 4th Panzer Army to relieve the 6th Army, can only be drawn here in broad strokes. It is impossible to describe the lightning-quick shift in circumstances that the 57th Panzer Corps faced, with an enemy who continuously threw new forces into the battle, tanks above all. The agility of our Panzer commanders and the superiority of our Panzer crews stood the test brilliantly during this time, as did the bravery of the Panzer grenadiers and the ingenuity of our anti-tank defence. At the same time, however, it also demonstrated what an old, tried and true Panzer division, such as the 6th, could accomplish in battle when fully equipped with panzers and assault weapons, and while under the superb command of General Raus and the Panzer commander Oberst von Hünensdorf, who would unfortunately die in battle later, while at the vanguard of this division. The task of the present volume is to represent as clearly as possible the situation described in the aforementioned statement. It is not possible to describe the quick-as-lightning shift of circumstances in the battles of the 57th Panzer Corps. In doing so, I hope to rescue from oblivion these difficult campaigns which were so momentous in their goals, tragic in their outcome, but rich in lessons learned. If this narrative relies heavily on the perspective of the 6th Panzer Division, it is because at one point in time this division, which was in the middle of the 57th Panzer Corps, had to shoulder the main burden of the battles. Moreover, thanks to its strengths, it helped to support its neighbours who were weaker in materiel. In addition, the author himself was a member of this division, serving as commander of a panzer company in battle group Hunersdorf, a key player, and participated in all the battles during that period. Lastly, for a certain time, the only original data sources from that period were from this division. The publications thus far, on the attempt to relieve Stalingrad, are almost all tarnished by inaccuracies as to time, locations, and numbers. There are also distortions, both intentional and unintentional, as well as exaggerated and embroidered versions of events. Relying as it does on a large number of documents, this book places particular emphasis on objectivity. A further reason for the scarcity of factual reporting thus far may also lie in the fact that the operation stood under the shadow of the Stalingrad situation itself. Of the officers involved, a great many were killed in this and in later battles, or were wounded and sidelined early on. From the 11th Panzer Regiment of the 6th Panzer Division, for instance, after just one month of deployment, from 3rd December 1942 on, out of the eight combat company commanders, only this author was still available for duty. For the other units, it was not much different. This fact explains why, until now, only the former members of the higher leadership staffs or outside observers have written on this subject. Even with the best of intentions, particularly for the latter group, it was naturally impossible to provide them with objective and precise descriptions from a military science perspective. In the spelling of the place names, it must be noted that at that time a variety of map materials were available. On the German side, 1 to 100,000 and 1 to 300,000. On the Russian side, 1 to 200,000. All editions provide designations in modified spellings. Except citations from reproductions of captured Russian orders and other sources, efforts were made to synchronize all the designations that appear in this book. 
The time designations on the German side are given in Central European time, so that due to the distances involved, the local time will be two hours later. Without the generous help, providing details, reports and documents, of many participants of the battles at that time, especially the former Hauptmann, Captain, and Adjutant of Battle Group Hünersdorf, Helmut Rittgen, it would not have been possible to complete this compilation. I wish to take this opportunity to express my gratitude for all their help. Weilburg Lahn, 31st December 1955 Horst Scheibert Chapter 1 Advance, Objectives, and Initial Situation End of November to beginning of December 1942 Maps 1 and 2 Equipment and battle strength of the 6th Panzer Division Transport from Brittany to the Kalmyk Steppe The Southern Front, mid-November the battles beginning on 19th November 1942, both sides of Stalingrad. In May 1942, after the hard winter battles of 1941-42 to in the Moscow area, the 6th Panzer Division was transferred to France, Brittany, for rest and replenishment. The 11th Panzer Regiment, previously supplied with equipment such as the Skoda 35T, was to receive new German weapons and vehicles, Although in previous deployments, Poland, France, the Baltics, Leningrad, and Moscow, the Skoda Panzers had proven excellent, members of the regiment looked forward to the new German models, in great measure because during the previous deployments it had grown clear that the Skoda, with its 3.7 cm cannons, was no match for the Russian T-34 and the K-6 and 2, which were seen more and more often. Unfortunately, these hopes were dashed, in place of the all-terrain wheeled vehicles so desperately desired, especially in the supply area, the regiment received more conventional motor vehicles, which came in a myriad of models, with problems such as weak engines and axles. In future deployments, the equipment situation would become not only problematic, but often critical. The same was true of tractors, one of the few vehicles of German manufacture actually usable in the eastern deployment but whose distribution was inadequate. The equipment inventory for the 11th Panzer Regiment was in accord with the War Strength Table of Organization 1103. It consisted of 21 Panzer IIs, 2 cm cannon, long, 75 Panzer IIIs, 5 cm cannons, long, 30 Panzer IIIs, 7.5 cm cannon, short, 24 Panzer IVs, 7.5 cm cannons long, and nine armoured command post vehicles. Translator's note. Most of these vehicles came in two variations, the first with a short-barrelled cannon and later models with the longer barrel. The longer barrel gave higher velocity and greater effect than the short barrel. With this, the division now owned over 160 panzers, compared with its previous inventory of only 200 Skodas, which were less powerful. This difference in numbers arose from the consolidation of three battalions into two during the process of the restructuring. Further, the staff of the 6th Rifle Brigade disappeared. The 4th and 114th Rifle Regiments were redesignated as Panzer Grenadier Regiments. The 57th Reconnaissance Battalion and the 6th Motorcycle Rifle Battalion, Kradschutz 6, were consolidated into the 6th Reconnaissance Battalion, but the nickname, K-6, still held on for some time. The author or the radio messages often confusingly refer to K-6. To prevent confusion, this translation will use 6th Reconnaissance Battalion in lieu of K-6. In the effort to strengthen armour, 2nd Battalion 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment received SPWs, Schützenpanzerwagen, for troop transport, as well as 1st Battalion 76th Artillery Regiment and one company of self-propelled gun carriages from the 41st Panzerjäger Battalion. SPW means Schützenpanzerwagen, which means armoured infantry carrier. This is most similar to the American half-track. See FM von Zenger und Etterlin, German Tanks of World War II, Stackpole Books 1969, plate number 144 in illustrated section. This translation will use SPW. 
These last three formations, along with parts of the now stronger Armoured Combat Engineers, 57th Pioneer Battalion, and the Panzer Regiment, were intended to represent the armoured component within the division. All exercises and war games were based on this. 57th Pioneer Battalion was an engineer battalion. At first glance, the division now appeared stronger than before. But at regimental level, this was not the case, especially when compared to the enemy, whose equipment had been strengthened in the meantime. Apart from the smaller number of German troops, the German Panzer models proved to be a poor match for the Russian ones. The German Panzer II and III, 7.5 centimetres short, were intended to be deployed primarily against the enemy's infantry troops, and when deployed against the T-34, the Panzer III, 5 centimetres long, was only effective at 800 metres or closer. The Russian T-34, on the other hand, could destroy every Panzer model present in the regiment, hitting from as great a distance as 1,500 metres. The penetration power of the Russian 7.62 cm cannon T-34 was met or exceeded only by the German 7.5 cm long and, naturally, the well-known 8.8 cm anti-aircraft gun, Flak. British and American nomenclature uses millimetres, for example, 76.2 mm cannon. These two stronger weapons, however, were available in only relatively small numbers, in the anti-tank units, Panzerjäger, designated anti-aircraft units, and the Panzer Regiment, with its 24 Panzer IVs. Assuming that in a longer deployment the number of Panzers facing the enemy quickly decreases and then levels off to about one-third of the starting inventory, not many weapons remained with sufficient power to challenge the enemy. Despite this, after the months-long infantry deployments of the previous winter in the outskirts of Moscow, and after the loss of almost all vehicles, the division was quite pleased to finally receive the weapons they had been deprived of for so long. Along with rest and recovery in Brittany, visits home and excursions to the Atlantic and Channel coasts, field exercises were carried out with enthusiasm and a desire to gain confidence with the new equipment and to orient their replacements in their new tasks. The division originated in Rhineland and Westphalia and recruited there. The Westphalians had outstanding soldierly qualities. The Rhinelanders brought mobility, whilst the men of the Ruhr offered mechanical expertise, which made up an impressive complement of talents. In previous deployments, the division had experienced substantial victories, and, thanks to good leadership, casualties remained within a tolerable range. This meant that, along with the irreplaceable older Lance Corporals, Obergefreiten, there was still a good stock of NCOs and officers. These were men who had sweated together through many of the same deployments, had experienced combat, and were filled with esprit. From this perspective, the level of combat power could be characterized as excellent. Every soldier felt far superior to his Russian counterpart, had confidence in his weapons, and confidence in his well-trained leaders. Particularly in the Panzer Regiment, there existed a relationship between all service ranks that was rich in trust and shared destiny. They fought as one team. The division commander, General Major Raus, like all regimental and battalion or detachment commanders, came up through the division and enjoyed the complete trust of all soldiers. Abteilung means battalion or detachment, depending on context. A few months prior to the first deployment of the 11th Panzer Regiment, the regimental commander, Oberst R. Kohl, was transferred to a different area of responsibility in the OKH, Oberkommando des Heeres, which means Army High Command, which caused no small amount of grief. But the new commander, Oberst von Hünersdorf, soon proved to be a fully effective replacement, particularly later in the deployment. The entire division now faced its new mission with confidence. By the end of October 1942, there were ever-growing hints that the pleasant time in Brittany was about to end. After the landing of the Americans in North Africa, there were hopes of being sent to occupy southern France. Such hopes soon proved false. Winter gear for both vehicles and men came rolling in, and by the beginning of November the first embarkations for the Eastern Front began. The train route began in a sweep around Paris, then continued diagonally through western Germany, through part of Berlin, 
and further on to the east. At the Oder River, the first snow appeared. Their stated destination was southern Russia, and their mission was to assemble behind the long front held by allies, Romanians, Italians, and Hungarians. Because there were no deployment orders yet, the division was to remain in the area between the Don and Donetsk, in the approximate area of Milirova, as Army Group Reserve. Baranovice Here began White Russia, and, with it, partisan territory. Destroyed locomotives and wagons were clearly visible on both sides of the train track, signs of the partisan warfare that had been waged here. All the way through the gigantic forest regions to Gomel, route security was strengthened. As a safeguard against mines, a wagon carrying sand travelled in front of the locomotive engine. Bryansk lay in deep snow. Further along from Kursk to Bielgorod, the terrain opened up and we entered Ukraine, with its steppe stretching to the south and east. The news from Stalingrad dominated our conversations. Despite a lack of clarity in the earliest reports, it was clear that since 21st November a large number of troops had been surrounded, and that outside of this Kessel, or pocket, the battles continued. To the officers it seemed quite certain that we would be deployed there sooner or later. At Kharkov we had to cross the Donetsk River in order to reach the area of Milirova. For most of the division the trip south toward the area of the Donetsk continued at an increased tempo. At Rostov we crossed the Don, continued further south near Salsk, and turned off to the northeast toward Stalingrad. From the opposite direction came trains with the wounded, and members of our division who first encountered them passed on the news of fighting at Kachelnikova. There was no longer any question about where the entire division would be deployed. As the journey continued, we moved more and more slowly, and the trains sometimes moved within visual distance of each other. The transports from Brittany to this region took eighteen to twenty days' travel, and every man longed for the journey's end. Only someone who had experienced transport with eight men in one section, with a perpetually stinking stove, constant freezing temperatures, never being properly washed, and never being able to stretch out, all of this for a period of 450 hours, could ever comprehend the term transport rage, transport colère. At the start of December, the first panzer transports unloaded about 30 kilometres southwest of Kotilnikova. They would not be given a long rest. The following overview of the previous day's events on the Don may provide a better understanding of what we faced. In mid-November of 1942, after the summer offensive, the southern flank of the German army east lay as follows. Army Group A was in the Caucasus, with its right flank at the Black Sea. Its left flank, however, became lost in the steppe south of Elista, never having reached the Caspian Sea. Russian resistance was hardening to the same degree as the Germans, with both suffering the effects of the enormous distances, shortages in fuel, ammunition, and all types of supplies. Far to the north, in the area of Stalingrad, a second very strong assembly of German forces, the 6th Army and 4th Panzer Army, was engaged in intense battles with the Russians, who were throwing increasing numbers into those fights. In the Kalmyk steppe, between these two groups, stood the Romanian 4th Army, front length about 250 kilometres, which had almost no contact with the one and only backup unit, the German 16th Infantry Division motorised at Elista. On a 600-kilometre-long front northwest of Stalingrad, adjoined to the Italian 8th Army and the Hungarian 2nd Army, was the Romanian 3rd Army. This front stretched from the upper corner of the larger bend of the Don almost to Voronezh. Not until Voronezh were German units joined with them along this front. Positioned behind the Allied armies were only a few reserves, but actually with no strong German troop units. This line was known to be dangerously weak. Army Group B, which manned the stretch from Elista to Voronezh, often pointed out this hazardous situation to higher-ups, but sufficient measures were never taken. The weakness of these Allied armies offered the Russians the chance to cut off Stalingrad directly. And on 19th November 1942, that is just what happened. The Russian forces, each with an assault army reinforced by masses of tanks, came at Stalingrad from the north and south. 
Within 48 hours, they defeated the weak Romanian resistance and closed the ring around Stalingrad. It would be unjust to shift the blame for this onto the Romanians. Unlike the Italians and Hungarians, whose lines ultimately crumbled, they fought with superb bravery, but neither in terms of equipment, strength, nor leadership were they a match for the Russian onslaught. The mistake lay in the basic approach to the summer operations by the OKW, Oberkommando der Wehrmacht, which means Armed Forces High Command. It attempted to achieve too much all at the same time, with forces that were too weak. Later on, they assigned the Allies a sector of the front that was too important and too long. By this time, it had become Hitler's obsession to capture the city that bore the name of his greatest adversary at any cost. Therefore, the OKW ordered Army Group B, in an incredibly ignorant assessment of the enemy, to throw all its units into the all-consuming battle for the city of Stalingrad. Although risk-taking does involve pushing limits, the limits here were greatly exceeded. After having failed to take the city in the first onslaught, there should never have been this kind of concentration of forces on such an exposed position. The northward attack by the Russians took place from a rather large bridgehead that remained available to them at the upper bend of the River Don. After breaking through the Romanian Third Army, the Russians rolled their tank corps toward the south and southeast, and soon reached the most important resupply railway and the strongest bridge across the Don at Kalach. The German troops fighting at Stalingrad were now cut off from their supply base. Coming across the Volga and from the Kalmyk steppe, the Russian southern vanguard overcame the defences of the Romanian Fourth Army positioned there, blocked the railway coming from the southwest, Salsk, and, after a hard fight against the weak and hastily built-up German lines of defence, was able to reach the Don south of Kalach, where they were able to shake hands with the Russian troops arriving from the north. Despite their immediate counter-attack, the 48th Panzer Corps held in reserve on the Chir River was unable to prevent the encirclement of the 6th Army. The larger portion of the 4th Panzer Army was also trapped with them. This Panzer Corps consisted only of the 22nd Panzer Division, which was not at its best in terms of materiel, and the Romanian 1st Tank Division, which had recently been created and was not yet experienced in combat. Later, with help from the quickly created Army Detachment, Holit, a new line of defence on the Chia River was built and strengthened with great effort. Army Detachment Holit is also known as Group Holit in some contexts. During the first days of the operation south of the Don, the Russians pushed slowly toward the southwest in the direction of Katilnikova, even though any great victories would have been denied them there. In the entire region between Elista and the Don, all that was left was the staff of the 4th Panzer Army and two Romanian cavalry divisions with a total strength of 1,200 riders. The Russians had made their thrust between the staff of 4th Panzer Army and its two divisions, the German security forces that were immediately formed from such elements as rear echelon staffs, supply troops, workshops, and so forth, Panwitz, Mikosh, etc., did in fact fight bravely, but were unable to withstand the strong enemy charge. This created a gap of 150 kilometers. The Russians did not seize this opportunity, possibly because they placed higher priority on the Stalingrad ring. More than that, they would face 19 German and two Romanian divisions, whose total strength of 200,000 men would stretch their capabilities. To achieve a tighter consolidation of the participating armies on the German side, Army Group Don was created under command of Field Marshal von Manstein. Under this command were placed the 6th Army, the 4th Panzer Army, and the Romanian 3rd Army. The remainder of the Romanian 4th Army was assigned to the 4th Panzer Army. Their stated mission was to bring the enemy attacks to a halt and win back the positions taken by the Russians. Army Group Don now received new forces. From Army Group B came Army Detachment Holit. From Army Group A came the General Headquarters of 57th Panzer Corps, along with the battle-weary 23rd Panzer Division. Further additions included the 6th Panzer Division, which was still in the process of transport, and, later, coming from further away, 
the 11th and 17th Panzer Divisions, with some Luftwaffe, Air Force, Field Divisions, although these were not battle-ready in terms of training and equipment. Army Detachment Hollid consisted of the 62nd, 294th and 336th Infantry Divisions and the 48th Panzer Corps. The 48th Panzer Corps included the 11th and 22nd Panzer Division, as well as the 7th and 8th Luftwaffe Field Divisions. These were tasked with halting the advance of the Russians at Chir, at the large bend of the Don River. Afterwards, in concert with the 4th Panzer Army, which had been reinforced south of the Don, they were to push on from the bridgehead at the mouth of the Chir to relieve Stalingrad. The 4th Panzer Army received the Corps headquarters of 57th Panzer Corps, which was just arriving from the Caucasus, along with the 23rd Panzer Division. Later, 57th Corps headquarters received the 6th Panzer Division, then later the 17th Panzer Division. The 17th Panzer Division had first been intended as a replacement for the 15th Luftwaffe Field Division, which never did appear. In addition to these larger German units, the 4th Panzer Army also commanded the newly formed Romanian Army, with its 6th and 7th Corps. This Romanian Army, however, in terms of equipment and fighting spirit, looked better on paper than in the field. The German 16th Infantry Division, motorized, at Erlister, which was also under the command of the 4th Panzer Army, could not be deployed. Army Group A inexplicably claimed that at that moment they were unable to free up any forces to replace them, after all, their very existence was at stake. The well-proven 4th Air Fleet, Freiherr von Richthofen, was to provide support for the army group, with the additional task of ensuring supplies for the 6th Army for the duration of their encirclement. The reckless promise made by Goering to Hitler of providing the supplies by air to Stalingrad would prove catastrophic. It was not the fault of the 4th Air Fleet that, due to a lack of cargo capacity, they were unable to fulfil this second task. From the very beginning they had maintained that this would be impossible. Yet, through all the fighting, the dedication of their combat units and transport echelon exceeded all expectations. At Kotelnikova, the 57th Panzer Corps gathered for attack. At the large bend of the Don River, the Russians increased their pressure, so that Army Detachment Holit could barely hold the mouth of the cheer. On 3rd December, the day designated for the beginning of operations at Stalingrad. It was clear that no further help could be expected from that quarter. Chapter 2 The First Attack 3rd to 4th December 1942 Maps 3 and 4 The terrain south of the Don The enemy and his enemy assessment The battle at Pachlobin the terrain around Katilnikova in early December 1942 was monotonous. In spring, the steppe may well have been a sea of flowers of rare beauty, but at that time of year there were only withered tufts of brown grass. Stands of trees were found only in the lowlands around the Don and near its tributary streams. Further to the south and east, hardly a bush was to be seen. The villages were scattered at long distances from each other. Between them lay ten to twenty kilometres of steppe where only scattered collective farms could be seen. The terrain varied little, with its largest hills delineated by sections of streams. From this spot, in good weather, it was possible to see nearly ten kilometres out with nothing to catch the eye. The village houses consisted of low, mud-walled huts whose rooms were half underground. Only at the edges of the villages were there signs of soil tillage. The primary livelihood was raising cattle, this region presented an ideal terrain for a superior panzer unit, but with one major challenge, the deep drainage ravines. They could be ten to twenty metres across, and were often impassable. Because they changed year to year, even good maps were often of little help. As it turned out, the winter of 1942 was not as brutal for us as the previous one, because we were now further south, on the same latitude as Milan, in early December the steppe was blanketed by only a few scant centimetres of snow that melted in the warm rays of the sun during the day and then froze during the cooler nights. In this weather the ravines presented an obstacle, as they often stretched ten kilometres or more, and it was not always possible to drive around them. 
Driving up and down the slopes in snow and ice was also difficult, as neither studs on the panzers nor snow chains on the motor vehicles were of much help. Had we been able to lay a grid of some sort on the ground in the manner of a carpet, it might have helped. For the pioneers, who had to rely on whatever the environment could provide, the barren steppe offered little help, no wood. The ice on the streams at this time of year was not yet hard enough to allow all of the vehicles in the division to cross without extra construction. When Feldmarschall von Manstein and his staff arrived from the middle front, Vitebsk, to assume command of the newly formed army group Don, the Feldmarschall took Generalmajor Raus, the division commander of 6th Panzer Division, with him in his personal train to Rostov. There, Manstein personally briefed Raus on the situation, and ordered him to unload his division in and southwest of Katilnikova, not Milyarova, as had previously been ordered. Raus was to place himself under the command of 57th Panzer Corps and halt the enemy advance there. It was known that the Russians were pushing forward to Katilnikova at the southern bank of the Don, on both sides of the railway lines coming from Stalingrad. They had one cavalry corps, the Russian 4th Corps, which was reinforced with tanks, plus two infantry divisions. It was presumed that behind those units lay the Russian 3rd Tank Army, which, after having secured the ring around Stalingrad, would now attack. On the morning of 27th November, 1942, the first transport of the 6th Panzer Division rolled into Katilnikova. The train had hardly come to a stop when the Russians began an artillery attack and pushed their way into the city, and within a few minutes our division suffered its first dead and wounded. The train station swarmed with enemy soldiers who had got past the security troops on the town's outskirts. The grenadiers jumped from their train cars with lightning speed and threw themselves into the train station, challenging the Russians with loud shouting and their empty weapons. That same day, with the help of additional transports, the train station and city were cleared and the enemy thrown out. Was there ever a more definitive example of an initial engagement in uncertain circumstances? Now came transport after transport, some of which unloaded along open stretches, which is difficult for a motorized troop. Additional forces arrived from the division, parts of which unloaded north of the Don in Marasovskaya and came via Zimlianskaya to the assembly area by land march, and, with their help, by the end of November, a blocking position was constructed around the city as far as the Don. After their first attack, the Russians did not further disrupt our unloading. The 23rd Panzer Division was assigned its assembly area to the right of the 6th Panzer Division, but it was held up during its overland march from the Caucasus due to terrain difficulties. Sudden temperature increases caused periods of mud. Except for its anti-aircraft and anti-tank guns, which had pulled ahead quickly, only a few of its units had arrived. The division had only just over 30 Panzers. Its grenadier regiments, however, were fully filled. The planned deadline for the attack, 3rd December 1942, now proved to have been set too early. As yet, not even one element from the Luftwaffe Field Division had shown up. Whether the 17th Panzer Division would still arrive in time as a replacement remained undetermined. Even though the 17th Panzer Division was also reportedly much weaker in numbers, the exchange would be welcome. By then it had become apparent that the Luftwaffe field divisions were less able to cope with the harsh demands of the East, and it was better to have a neighbouring division that was proven in battle and could be relied on, regardless of its strength. When it came to the Romanian Corps, not much could be said. They appeared to exist more in the planning than in reality. Their security forces, however, proved genuinely helpful in helping move panzers out of the repair shops, Panvitz, Sauvon, etc. The enemy was not expected to remain quiet any longer, and it was apparent that time and opportunity to head off a catastrophe were slipping away. On 2nd December, the first transports of 11th Panzer Regiment arrived and were greeted with relief. From the area of Remontnaya, where they were unloaded, the most recently arrived companies were thrown from the unloading ramp right into the heated battle. The primary data sources for the beginning of all combat action in this area are the war diary of the 11th Panzer Regiment and, later, from Battle Group Hunersdorf. The beginning of the fighting is documented in the following excerpts. 
War Diary of 11th Panzer Regiment Rimutnaya, 3rd December, 1942 Second Company being unloaded and moving into cantonment area west of Rimutnaya. 10.15 hours Call from 1A, Operations Officer of the Division Enemy attacking with tanks at Pachlyobin from the north Division has moved 5th and 1st Companies to Katilnikova Regiment must ready themselves for battle Division orders, all companies forward. Regimental commander to division staff. Under command of 2nd Battalion, Major Dr. Baker, will be 1st, 5th, 8th and 2nd companies. Staff of 2nd Battalion, 8th and 2nd companies begin march towards Simichny. Battalion Baker to be placed directly under the division. 1100 hours. Enemy has broken through with tanks at Pachlyobin from the north toward the south and has overrun the 3rd 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, which had been securing Pachlobin. 1300 hours. 7th and 6th Companies unload in Gachun, south of Remontnaya. Commander Major Löwe and parts of Staff Company, 1st Battalion, also arrive in the meantime. Companies to move as far east as possible in cantonment area of the regiment, so that they can be quickly sent forward. Enemy tanks south of Pachlyobin turned off west towards Mayorovsky and were fought off by tank destroyers. Division had ordered 1st and 5th Companies and 2nd 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment on SPWs to attack this enemy. What had happened? These enemy tanks were probably elements of the reinforced Russian 4th Cavalry Corps, which had penetrated the division's security lines at Pachlyobin and were attempting to go around Katilnikova. The first two companies of 11th Panzer Regiment, 1st and 5th, unloaded on 2nd December, were immediately moved forward, followed by companies and staffs as they became available. Organising of the units prior to deployment was no longer possible. As a result, the company commanded by this author, 6th Company, among others, was not with its own battalion, the 2nd, but instead went into battle with 1st Battalion. If we could not stop this enemy soon, not only would the entire assembly of forces be in jeopardy, but also the venture that was planned for later. For a closer look into the enemy's intentions, the following attack orders for the Russian 4th Cavalry Corps, which were captured in later fighting, are reproduced here in translation. Captured Russian Orders Verkhnya Yabolichny 2nd December, 42 2140 hours Map, 200,000 Enemy continues its defence of Katilnikova with two infantry regiments and forty to fifty panzers. The western perimeter of Katilnikova has been fortified by bunkers, especially in the area of the depot and MTS. MTS is an unknown abbreviation. The area of Simichny has been built up as a fortified strongpoint. In the area of Zegan Sacharova, trench systems. The 4th Cavalry Corps without the 61st Cavalry Division, is to occupy Katilnikova as of end of 3rd December 1942, and will advance with one of the regiments into the area of Malaraturny, brackets in original. The 302nd Infantry Division is to push in general direction of the railway line toward Katilnikova and occupy the outskirts of Katilnikova. Link up with Division only at Hill 142, east of Chilnikova, road fork eight kilometres northwest of Grenyachi railway station, Katilnikova. On 3rd December 42 by 1100 hours, the 4th Cavalry Corps, in the first wave with 85th Tank Brigade, is to occupy at Mayorovsky, Sacharova, Pachlyobin, and, pushing from the west, take the western border of Katilnikova, then pursue the retreating enemy along the railway line to Dubovskaya. The advance party, 1st Company Tanks, 1st Company Motorised Infantry, is to clear enemy out of Kudinova, Hill 104.5, at 0900 hours at Mayorovsky, left of Kormayarsky Aksai River. Advance party is then to move on the line from the Fork Inn Road at Katilnikova Pachlyobin Mayorovsky and secure the exits of the 85th Tank Brigade and the 81st Cavalry Division in the area of Mayorovsky Pachlyobin. The starting point, Visioli, is to be passed through at 600 hours.
The 85th Tank Brigade is to enter the area of Mayorovsky on 3rd December at 10.30 hours and assemble in the ravine northeast of Mayorovsky, run reconnaissance on Nagavskaya and place combat outposts in Patiemkinskaya and Romathgluki. At 1300 hours on 3rd December, the brigade is to attack Simichny simultaneously with the motorized battalion, without 1st Rifle Company, and one cavalry regiment from 81st Cavalry Division. After the occupation of Simichny, the motorized battalion of the brigade is to be brought in for the occupation of Katilnikova. Main force is to pass through the starting point of Vesioli at 0700 hours on 3rd December. The 81st Cavalry Division, with two batteries of the 149th Panzer Jäger anti-tank regiment, are to assemble in an area of Pachlyobin and the ravine south of there, leaving combat outposts in the strength of one platoon in Verkhnye Kurmoryaski. The mission is to attack and occupy the western border of Katilnikova, together with two regiments and with the 85th Tank Brigade. Beginning point for the attack is the road fork three kilometres east of Hill 60, single houses northwest of Hill 60. Attack will begin on separate order. Starting point of Vissioli is to be passed through at 0730 hours. First Cavalry Regiment with motorised battalion of the 85th Tank Brigade, without First Rifle Company, is to gather on 3rd December at 11.30 hours, south of the road for Katilnikova Pachlyobin Mayorovsky, with the mission of capturing Simichny. Start of the attack, 1300 hours. They are to be supported by First Tank Company. Leader of the group is Mayor Shavovarov, acting division commander of 81st Cavalry Division. The 149th Guards Mortar Battalion, GDM, means Garde Minenwerfer Battalion, is reserve, must be ready with manpower and firepower to hold down the defence system in the area of Simichny and on the western border of Katilnikova. It is to move behind the 81st Cavalry Division. The Training Battalion, without 1st Squadron, 4th Anti-Tank Battalion, two batteries from 149th Anti-Tank Regiment as reserve. Leader Captain Genev will follow behind 81st Cavalry Division and assemble on 3rd December at 1100 hours in area of Hill 76, west of Vesioli. Two squadrons of the training section with two anti-tank companies are to hold section Vyrchnya Yabluchny in order to prevent any attempt by the enemy to break through toward the north. At 1100 hours, the staff of 4th Cavalry Corps is to be at point 76, southeast of Vesioli, then Mayorovsky, Siemichny, and southwest edge of Katilnikova. Report in, on arrival, on reaching the assembly area, Mayorovsky, Pachlyobin, on readiness of the sections, on the beginning of the attack, and on the occupation of Katilnikova. Signed, Commander of the 4th Cavalry Corps, General Lieutenant Meshkin. Commander of the Staff, Oberstleutnant Schwefzschuk. A close study of this order can provide valuable insights, both in terms of form and content. In contrast to the German custom, for instance, the order goes into too much detail for corps-level orders and gives too little emphasis on the end goal. For this attack, the Russian corps had only the 81st Cavalry Division and the 85th Tank Brigade at their disposal and according to paragraph 2, the 61st Cavalry Division appears to be deployed elsewhere. Russian units were only slightly more than half as strong as the German units of the same designation, which meant that for this operation, the Russian 4th Cavalry Corps must have been approximately the size of just one German division. Another surprising detail is that the assembly areas are situated in the middle of enemy territory, from the Russians' perspective. They considered an advance party, Vanguard, of only two companies strong enough to clear this area. Reflecting on the assessment of the enemy in paragraph 1, incidentally a rather accurate image of their German enemy, this appears somewhat unreasonable, even when considering that the advancing Russian 302nd Infantry Division would be able to pin down a large number of the enemy, the Germans. But to return to the course of events. War Diary of 11th Panzer Regiment 1600 hours. Call from 1A. Enemy appears to have turned off. 
It is suspected that on the 4th the enemy will try to surround Pakhlyobin from Katilnikova. Orders from the division. Staff of Battalion 1, with 6th and 2nd companies, to move to Karelyov, west, northwest of Simichna. Regimental staff to division. It is expected that after presenting the reconnaissance results to the division commander on 4th December, the commander of the Panzer Regiment will take over both sections. 1900 hours. Commander is with battle staff at division. First and fifth companies advance on enemy tanks south of Pachlyobin at nightfall. The enemy, positioned behind a berm, allow the two companies to advance. One enemy tank destroyed, one of ours set afire. One dead, one wounded. Battle ends at nightfall. Sixth and seventh companies nearly veered off at Simichny during the night. The advance extremely hindered by the slippery ground. The ground is thawing and the roads are muddy. The regimental commander and commander of Section 1 are ordered there on the early morning of 4th December. Depending on results of reconnaissance, the division commander will possibly order the regiment to attack under command of the regimental commander. Initially, Battalion Baker is to be placed under the command of the 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment in Mayorovsky. The enemy must be defeated at Pachlyobin. Third Company will be unloaded in Remotnaya and remain there on orders from the division. Fourth Company is to be moved forward to Simichny on the transport train and unloaded with orders to remain there initially. During these events, the Russian 302nd Infantry Division came under artillery fire on both sides of the railway line, which was coming from the northeast towards Kotelnikova. It came to a standstill in front of the German 4th Panzer Army, which was securing that area. Meanwhile, the Russian 4th Cavalry Corps, which was advancing from the north toward Pachlyobin, having deployed a stronger tank force, overran 3rd 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment. 3rd Company deserves special praise for its lonely, devoted struggle there, as is shown in the following report from Oberst H. Zollenkopf, the then commander of the 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment. Report by Oberst H. Zollenkopf The 104th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, minus 2nd Battalion SPWs, reinforced by an anti-aircraft battery, 8.8 and 2 centimetres, and relying on cooperation from elements of the 76th Artillery Regiment, was positioned in the area of Zigan Pachlyobin Mayorovsky since early December, with the mission of securing this area. In this security sector, the Kormoyarsky Aksai flows from the north. This stream, with its small tributaries, was something of a panzer barrier. The slightly hilly terrain with its thin layer of snow was passable for all motor vehicles as far as the Don. The security in Chudinov on the Don was so weak that it had little combat power for a defence. An enemy tank attack from the north on Pachlyobin and Mayorovsky had to be expected. Based on this situation assessment, the anti-tank Schwerpunkt, main effort, was to be at those two villages. The forces in all three villages were allocated as follows. Mayorovsky. Second, 114th, plus elements of first, 114th, one platoon of 8.8 .8 anti-aircraft guns, one platoon from 9th 114th Heavy Infantry Howitzer. Staff, 114th Regimental and 1st 114th. Pachlyobin, 3rd 114th, reinforced by one anti-tank platoon, 5 cm, motorised, one 1st Battalion Infantry Howitzer platoon and forward observer. Zigan. This area is armour-proof, Panzerische, needing only remaining elements of 1st 114th. For the conduct of the battle, the division had ordered that the area of Zigan, Pachlyobin, Mayorovsky must be defended. In the case of strong enemy attack, Group Zollenkopf itself would be surrounded. In this event, the intent was to lead the attack with the armoured groups, 11th Panzer Regiment and 2nd 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, SPW, which were gathered further to the rear. On 3rd December 1942, at about 0830 hours, Lieutenant Graf Plettenberg, commander of 3rd 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, arrived in Mayorovsky to issue orders. He reported a quiet night.
At that moment sounds of battle could be heard from the direction of Pachlyobin. Graf Plettenberg immediately rushed to his company and wired that some mounted enemy reconnaissance troops had attempted to engage but had been successfully fended off. Other messages prior to 10.30 hours reported that the enemy had attacked with tanks, first with four, then with twelve, but after having lost two, broke off the attacks. Then followed a report of twenty tanks, T-34s, accompanied by enemy infantry, which, after hard fighting, managed to break through into the northern part of Pachlyobin. The losses were not yet all known, but were considerable. The Plettenberg Company still held the southern part of the village and the terrain around the stream in the direction of Zigan. Then the wire connection broke off. What had happened in Pachlyobin? Near 0830 hours, several strong mounted reconnaissance troops from northern Pachlyobin approached. The heavy machine gun platoon, Burian, allowed them to get closer, and then destroyed the majority of them. The commander, Lieutenant Graf Plettenberg, ordered Oberfeldwebel Weidler and Feldwebel Riedel's platoons to perform reconnaissance, and he himself took command of one reconnaissance troop. After advancing about one hundred metres, they could see into a ravine that ran to the north and diagonally to the village. Here, several T-34s with riflemen mounted on them, and lorries carrying infantrymen were gathering for a thrust on Pachlyobin. The reconnaissance troops rushed back immediately, and the platoons took their prepared positions at the outskirts of the village. The German anti-tank soldiers positioned between the Weidler and the Riedel platoons waited for the enemy tanks to approach, and fired on two of them. The enemy tanks turned back and disappeared into the ravine. Shortly afterwards, the Russians attacked the village outskirts with trench mortars. Amid all of this, a large group of T-34s with riflemen mounted on them attacked again, overran the anti-tank guns, and broke through into the village. The platoons of 3rd Company 114th, however, allowed themselves to be passed up. Using both light and heavy machine-gun fire, they attacked the enemy lorries filled with infantrymen, inflicting heavy casualties on the Russians, and forced them to back off while still outside the village. While the tanks, now separated from their infantry, penetrated further into the village, some hard, close-quarters fighting started on the outskirts of the village. The fighting was so fierce that platoon leader Burian, having shot his machine pistol dry, went after the Russians with a club. This battle against the tanks accompanying infantry effectively broke the momentum of the tank attack and stalled its breakthrough, winning time for countermeasures to be taken. Casualties included the dashing young Lieutenant Graf Plettenberg, who was killed in the midst of his troops, as well as the commander of Lieutenant Möller's 1st Infantry Gun Platoon. All of the platoon leaders, Lieutenant Tanner, Oberfeldwebel Weidler, and Feldwebel Riedel, were wounded. Altogether, two-thirds of the defenders of Pachlyobin were out of the fight due to injury or death. The rest clung to the snowy slopes of the Kurmoyarsky Aksai and attempted to make contact with 1st 114th, which was performing security. At around 1100 hours, the commander of 1st 114th, Major Hausschild, sent a liaison reconnaissance troop from Mayorovsky to Pachlobin. After a short time, it reported from an area south of Pachlyobin that enemy tanks were on the move in the area, and in the valley to the west were two battalions of infantry and several tanks conducting pre-combat checks. An enemy reconnaissance troop was moving in the direction of Mayarovsky. To avoid losing time in sending out a forward observer, the commander of the 114th, along with the NCO of the reconnaissance troops, attempted to bombard this gathering with artillery fire. The commander of the 1st 76th Artillery Regiment, Mayar Schultz, was already at the command post and ordered the NCO to observe some ranging shots with high-angle airbursts. This manoeuvre was successful. With concentrated fire from the 1st 76th and one heavy battery, and with effective fire from the heavy infantry guns of 9th 114th, the enemy's preparations for attack on Mayorovsky were completely shattered. At about 12.30 hours, further reconnaissance troops from the Pachlyobin area indicated tank and infantry movements there. It was not clear whether the Russians intended to advance further towards Mayorovsky or Katilnikova. 
When the commander of the 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment requested panzers and anti-tank guns, the division authorized two immediately available panzer companies for Pachlyobin, with a later addition of one anti-tank company. Until about 1,300 hours, a firefight was observed between several of our panzers and enemy T-34s to the south of Pachlyobin. The German panzers apparently could not move forward because of a ravine. Tanks from both sides were on fire. This unexpected resistance from the Germans discussed the Russian orders, paragraph 3, expressing opposite expectations, forced the Russians to prematurely pull stronger forces forward. The 6th Panzer Division, by bringing in reinforcements, was able to intercept the dangerous enemy attack south of Pachlyobin in good time. The Russians had pushed forward, and on the following day, the German commanders surrounded them with their newly, quickly acquired armoured forces. Planned reconnaissance had to explore the basis for a coming attack. War Diary of 11th Panzer Regiment Simichnaya, 4th December, 1942 The commander, along with battle staff and regimental staff, remains with the division in Simichnaya on the night of the 3rd and 4th. This is in order to be on hand on 4th December with two sections, six companies, for an attack, should the Luftwaffe reconnaissance determine strong enemy presence at Pachlyobin. 0245 hours. Adjutant ordered to 1st A. Reconnaissance reports sounds of tanks in Pachlyobin during the night. Division suspects enemy has received reinforcements, especially tanks, and orders an attack by the entire regiment as early as possible. Units available for the attack. Battalion Becker with staff of 2nd Battalion, 1st, 2nd, 5th and 8th Companies. Battalion Löwe with staff of 1st Battalion, 4th, 6th and 7th Companies. 2nd 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, SPW Battalion. 1st 41st Panzer Jäger Battalion with self-propelled gun carriage. 1st 76th Panzer Artillery Regiment one light and one heavy battery. Fourth Company was ordered directly to Simichny upon unloading at Simichnaya, but had problems during unloading and did not arrive at Simichny until 0645 hours. 0530 hours. Commander quickly briefs the section commanders in Simichny and then goes to commander of 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment for briefing on the deployment with reconnaissance reports at hand. Because reconnaissance was scheduled poorly and carried out late by the Grenadier Regiment, unnecessary time is spent waiting. The reconnaissance results say nothing about the enemy tanks. Only in the ravine between Pachlyobin and Mayorovsky have forward observers determined that enemy infantry has crept in. Commander decides on an immediate attack on Pachlyobin from the west and northwest and sets the time for issuing of the order for 0830 hours, at the command post of the 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment. The section commanders are instructed to bring their companies to the assembly area. 0830 hours. Orders issued. Attack Pachlyobin from the west and northwest. Destroy the enemy. Capture Pachlyobin. Attack to be carried out as far as the Aksai River north of Pachlyobin. Clear enemy from territory north and around Pachlyobin. Right flank. 1st 11th Panzer Regiment and 1st 41st Panzer Jäger Battalion, anti-tank battalion, is to hold back and prevent the enemy from retreating toward the south. The bulk of 2nd 11th Panzer Regiment is to attack Pachlyobin, with the right flank at Mayorovsky and with the Schwerpunkt to the left via Hill 76.6. 1st 11th Panzer Regiment is to attack from Hill 94.4 with its Schwerpunkt to the left via Kozlovaya Ravine, two kilometres north of Pachlyobin, from the northwest. 2nd 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment will follow between the two battalions in order to be quickly brought forward to the pachlyobin Veseli Road, in case the enemy retreats to the north. 1st 76th Artillery Regiment, with two batteries, will support the attack and take Pachlyobin and the nearby hills under fire before and at the start of the attack in order to set the enemy in motion, creating targets for the panzers. Heavy anti-aircraft guns from Katilnikova will fire on Pachlyobin when notified by radio signal that the regiment has moved into attack position. 0945 hours. 
First 11th Panzer Regiment reports all in ready position. Commander issues order to begin assembling. The plan of attack was to surround the Russians from the left, as our panzers would be blocked by the Aksai River. This section of the stream would likewise block the enemy's retreat as well, but the Russians didn't see this problem until the attack was underway. When they did catch on and began to move back, they met up with 1st 11th Panzer Regiment as it advanced toward Pachlyobin. This error in intelligence would cost them dearly. War Diary of 11th Panzer Regiment 0955 hours The attack begins, but 2nd Battalion only gains ground very slowly. The battalion attacks the hills of Pachlyobin frontally and is met by strong, well-placed fire from excellently camouflaged enemy tanks and enemy anti-tank units. In a short time, three tanks from the centrally positioned 8th Company take full hits and are out of action. The panzers explode. Several panzers from 2nd Company also burning from hits taken to the fuel cans attached to rear of the vehicle. The commander of 2nd Company abandons his burning panzer from fuel canister fire and is badly wounded once outside of the panzer. With the wounding of its commander, the company suffers loss in combat power. Due to difficulties in orientation, 1st 11th Panzer Regiment, which was supposed to attack Pachlyobin from Hill 94.4 from the northwest, is too far to the north. In addition, the enemy force, which they want to intercept, has already moved even further north. The regimental commander radios orders to 1st 11th Panzer Regiment to turn back around toward Pachlyobin, and then he drives from the combat zone to meet the battalion and brings it back from the north to Pachlyobin to deploy and support the unavoidably detained 2nd 11th Panzer Regiment. With the help from the 1st 11th, 2nd 11th Panzer Regiment recovers strength and their attack wins further ground. The hills and village of Pachlyobin are captured at 1200 hours from the west and north. After the wide sweep by 1st 11th Panzer Regiment, a gap opens between the two panzer battalions, which the enemy cleverly exploits and breaks through. Even though parts of the two panzer battalions and the SPW battalion immediately turn back, this cannot prevent a part of the horse-mounted enemy from breaking in. But, despite this, the attack is still a success. So far, 2nd 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment had followed behind the battle and is now ordered to clear the enemy from the combat zone. The terrain, with its troughs and deeply cut-out areas, works to the advantage of the enemy. Here he is able to dig in in front of Fortress Pachlyobin, allow the panzers to roll on by and then bring his defence back to life. Therefore the panzers are shelled again and again from close range, primarily with anti-tank rifles. After the capture of Pachlyobin, the enemy is pushed together into the valley between Pachlyobin and Mayorovsky, with its infantry and parts of its dismounted cavalry. Here, just before nightfall, 5th Company and two SPW companies are still clearing the valley of scattered enemy forces who were still fighting. Shortly before darkness, the regiment gathers at the southern exit of Pachlyobin. The battlefield is completely quiet. The results of the battle, 10 enemy tanks destroyed, 14 guns captured, 1,200 prisoners of war accounted for, 800 more reported later by the SPW battalion, which remains in Pachlyobin. The clean-up of the battlefield on the next day brings in a great number of enemy rocket launchers, machine guns and other equipment, along with 800 horses. The battle was won by the high-speed attack by the bulk of the regiment, about 90 panzers. Third Company and the light platoons from the regimental staff and the staff of 2nd 11th Panzer Regiment had not been unloaded until the day of the battle. Several panzers are sidelined due to mechanical problems stemming from the night march to the assembly area and the swampy, muddy road conditions. A particularly important share of the victory belongs to the 2nd 11th Panzer Regiment and the spirited and devoted struggle of 2nd and 8th Companies. Deserving of special recognition is Oberstleutnant Ranziger, commander of 8th Company, who was shot from his panzer three times, each time going on to mount another panzer. Our losses, one mechanised armoured ambulance, variant of SPW, and one SPW, as well as one self-propelled 7.62cm anti-tank gun, eight dead, 
and twenty-eight wounded. Five total missing in action, including one on 2nd December. Twelve out-of-service panzers, including five panzers mechanically sidelined before the battle. Prisoners from the battlefield state they were with the 81st Cavalry Division and the 85th Tank Brigade. This corresponds to information on orders belonging to the Russian 4th Cavalry Corps, which were captured during the battle. The combat zone is ordered to be vacated in the following sequence. 2nd 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, with two companies, Pachlobin. 7th 11th Panzer Regiment, 1st 11th Panzer Regiment, Mayorovsky. 2nd 11th Panzer Regiment, Simichny. The sodden roads and collapsed bridges prevent the implementation of the aforementioned ordered sequence. Report on Pachlobin Battle by Commander, 6th 11th Panzer Regiment. During the night of 3rd to 4th December, we drove in total darkness and on very muddy roads to our assembly area northwest to Pachlobin, only now and again receiving guidance from motorcycle messengers. At breaking daylight, 2nd Battalion was to attack the village from the south and southwest with artillery support. At the same time, it was our mission to capture Pachlobin by sweeping northward. My company, along with 7th Company, Hauptmann Gericke, and 4th Company, Hauptmann Wils, belonged to 1st Battalion. Behind us gathered the 2nd 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, SPW. Our two light companies, 6th and 7th, took over the lead next to one another in broad wedge formation. Fourth Company was tiered right behind my company. I moved forward to the right, in order to monitor our attack with their long-range, 75 centimeter long guns. The attack deadline was delayed somewhat, so that we did not move out until about ten hundred hours. I heard the marching order through my headset. Goldregen Marsch. Goldregen. Golden Rain was the code name for my company. At that moment I warned my two front platoons so that they would not collide with 7th Company, which rolled forward on my left. Then, during the crossing of one final flat ridge, the whole panorama of the Aksai sector north of Pachlobin came into view. From 1,500 metres away I saw the road that led to Pachlobin, completely clogged with Russian vehicles and convoys. Further to the left, the road led almost as far as the Aksai and further on to a ridge, which was also teeming with enemy, and among them I could make out tanks. Opposite me lay the hills on the eastern bank of the river, and over all of this hung a grey, endless sky. There was little time left for contemplation. We began the battle immediately, and the enemy responded with flashing lemon-yellow muzzle fire of anti-tank guns and tank rounds. One glance to the left provided a view of Pochlobin, which lay under artillery fire. Its valley was filled with clouds of smoke and dust. We could not remain standing still like this, as we offered too good a target for the enemy. On orders from the battalion commander, Major Lerver, both of us forward companies made for the road under the protective fire of 4th Company, which was positioned in the centre. Firing from all guns, or cannons, with no shortage of targets, we rolled at high speed right into the middle of the Russians, blowing up anything that tried to get in our way. While Gerica, 7th Company, followed the retreating enemy northward, my rear was left open. Because I was protected on my east side, I turned south toward Pachlobin. On the opposite side of the Aksai, large numbers of Russian soldiers were streaming up the slopes on foot, while under German artillery fire, pursued by bursts from our machine guns and high-explosive fragmentation shells, Soon I saw a large protective trench about one kilometre away that ran diagonally from the road. It was probably left over from the summer offensive, as presumably the Russians could not have dug it during the night. Later it was learned that it had been expanded into a tank obstacle south of Kaslovaya Ravine. The Russians had constructed their defence there, and we were soon caught up in a duel with anti-tank guns. On the hills south of Pachlobin we could watch 2nd Battalion's battle. Some of their tanks were on fire, sending up black smoke clouds. In the binoculars I saw scattered black spots moving around between them. These were our tank crews escaping from their burning tanks. Without fire support from heavy weapons, it would be difficult for me to capture the trench that lay before me. There was only one road across it, and it was occupied by enemy anti-tank guns. 
I radioed for support, and shortly afterward I saw artillery fire hit the trench. I never knew whether the hits came from 4th Company in response to my request, or whether the batteries south of Pakhlyobin had come to my aid on their own initiative. In any case, I decided to attack. To our amazement, on both sides of the road stood deserted Russian vehicles, and horses without riders, and camels racing around everywhere, bobbing about with their wide, sweeping steps. I led my company into the trench at a quick tempo, constantly jumping in and out of fire cover, and managed, by some miracle, to capture it without casualties. I was the first to drive across. While crossing, I saw the destroyed anti-tank weapons and their fallen crews. One had to admit that this enemy, while facing a superior force, had truly sacrificed himself. I radioed back immediately, ordering the artillery fire to cease at my location, and since I had no desire to be mistaken for an enemy tank, I requested confirmation of my position. The radio message had just ended, and I readied my company for the entry into the village. Promptly, the artillery fire at my location stopped, just as if we were on the exercise field. It now focused on the village, the eastern slopes, and far to the north behind me, apparently targeting the Russians in front of Company Gerike, 7th Company. Such was the perfection of our artillery. The village, about one kilometre away, offered us only light resistance. I decided, somewhat out of pride, to be the first to enter with my company. It was apparent that our attack enabled 2nd Battalion to catch its breath and move closer to the village. I pushed on into the village, and met almost only enemy infantry. The artillery fire stopped, and soon all that was left was the crackling fires from the burning huts. I was very proud to have accomplished this, all without losses. Soon we were able to shake hands with 2nd Battalion, which was rolling in from the southwest. They had had it harder than us. Several panzers, even the armoured ambulance, had been shot up, and Dr. Repno, our excellent and tireless staff physician, was wounded. The grenadiers were given the rest of the panzers for mopping up. They were still engaged in tough battles, and were bringing in large numbers of prisoners from all around. The following report by the commander, Major Dr. Baker, dated just two days afterward, documents the attack by 2nd Battalion. Battle Report on the Attack of 4th December 1942 2nd 11th Panzer Regiment In the Field, 6th December 1942 On 4th December 1942, at 1000 hours, 2nd Battalion stood ready in the hills northwest of Mayorovsky, with orders to capture Pachlyobin, which had been taken by the Russians on the previous day, and to destroy the enemy's combat force there. The battalion was arranged as follows. 5th Company, right forward, 8th Company, left forward, 2nd Company, left rear, tiered formation, battalion staff behind 8th Company, 1st Battalion, angled to the left, with 2nd 114th at its rear. At 10 hundred hours, the battalion received orders from regiment to assemble quickly, as the Russians were withdrawing toward the north. Advancing rapidly in the northeast direction, under artillery fire, the battalion reached the hills south of Pachlyobin at about 10.45 hours. During the crossing of the hills southwest of Pachlyobin, the battalion ran into vigorous fire from anti-tank guns from the western edge of the village. The 8th and 2nd companies particularly, as they were positioned nearest the village, returned fire with intense force. In doing so, 8th and 2nd companies put a number of anti-tank guns out of action. 8th Company also destroyed five T-34s that were retreating to the north. Despite this, the Russians succeeded in putting four combat vehicles from 8th Company out of the fight with anti-tank fire. Three panzers from 2nd Company were also put out of commission, and several others damaged. During this firefight, 5th Company pulled into position south of Pachlyobin and engaged enemy anti-tank guns, infantry and cavalry. 5th Company succeeded in destroying a large number of anti-tank weapons. At around 12.05 hours, the battalion received a radio message that Company Scheibert had arrived at 800 metres north of the village of Pachlyobin. On this, the battalion advanced further in the direction of Pachlyobin. The battalion was able to cross the southern edge of Pachlyobin and was able to destroy strong enemy infantry forces there, who were defending themselves against our attack with anti-tank rifles. Panzerbuchse, and armour-piercing hand grenades. 
5th Company advanced further to the southwest with orders to destroy the enemy infantry that had dug in and established his field positions there. 5th Company brought in 352 prisoners of war. At 14.30 hours, the battalion gathered east of Pachlyobin and, on orders from the regiment, began the march back to Majorovsky and Simichny. 7th Company remained as security with Battalion Kuper back in Pachlyobin. Losses 8th Company, 4 Panzer IVs hit, 3 of them total losses. 2nd Company, 3 Panzers hit. 5th Company, 1 burst barrel. Staff Company's SPWs destroyed. Loss of personnel, 8 dead and 24 wounded. Signed, Dr. Baker. Wehrmacht Report, 5th December 1942. Excerpt. Between the Volga and the Don, the Soviets also strike on 4th December in a powerful tank attack, but without success. 75 enemy tanks were destroyed, 13 immobilized in the shooting. The enemy suffers high losses in personnel and weapons. A hard attack by our own panzer troops destroys enemy tanks and cavalry forces, capturing 2,000 prisoners and 14 cannons. It had been an auspicious beginning. Not only did we recapture our former positions, but inflicted high casualties on the enemy. While it is true that the German side brought superior panzer forces to the battle, the fact remains that there was far greater infantry strength on the Russian side, not to mention powerful anti-tank units. Our success was due mainly to our enveloping attack. The German commanders proved themselves far superior to the Russians in the layout of the operation and the interplay of the individual weapons. Then again, according to statements from captured soldiers, the Russian corps have not seen much prior combat. At the start of the Russian attack operations at Stalingrad, they had been moved forward from their previous location and garrison near the Afghan border. In previous engagements, they faced almost exclusively Romanian forces. Thus, when facing the combat power of a new, well-practiced German panzer division, it was understandable that they would make some seemingly incomprehensible blunders and certainly the German side committed its own blunders. There were too few grenadier forces available for a complete encirclement, so that large parts of the enemy succeeded in breaking out. Moreover, 2nd 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, contrary to the attack order, discussed in the war diary of 11th Panzer Regiment, was too dependent on the 1st 11th Panzer Regiment. In the designated sector there were major difficulties in the terrain, which to some extent hampered the SPWs. With such a short distance to the attack target, 2nd Battalion ought to have waited out the fight and then later moved in to occupy the gap. During the first pure panzer attack, 2nd Battalion's participation was not urgently needed. There was a predictably large gap between the two panzer battalions north of the Koslovaya ravine, where the enemy seeped through and moved on westward. 2nd Battalion was too far away, so that the gap could not be closed quickly enough. Later, during the clearing and mopping up of Pachlyobin and its environs, 2nd Battalion was very much needed, and was of great help in wiping out the last pockets of resistance and bringing in prisoners. But this too shows that too few grenadier forces were made available for this attack. To what extent the division might have been able to free up infantry forces for this operation is unknown to this author. Of course, it had to fend off the enemy, 302nd Russian Infantry Division, as it pushed simultaneously from north and northeast to Katilnikova. Despite this, there were significant victories. It was to be expected that in future the Russians would be more careful. They might also have brought in reinforcements, which could have stopped our entire attack from the start. One very painful loss to the combat power of the Panzer Regiment was that of the commander of 2nd Company, Hauptmann Hagemeister, who died of wounds in the field hospital. Another was the total destruction of three Panzer IVs, the only real match for the T-34. In the following days, the many free-roaming horses and camels formed a pleasant diversion, especially for the older officers and NCOs, who had spent their earlier years in the cavalry. It would take a sharp order from the division to bring this circus to an end. Chapter 3 Preparations for the Advance on Stalingrad 5th to 11th December 1942 Map 5 
Situation of 6th Panzer Division prior to 11th December 1942. The deployment of the 4th Panzer Army. The situation at Army Group Don, 9th December 1942. The time prior to 12th December, the deadline finally chosen for the attack, was filled with anxiety, which becomes quite apparent in the following excerpts from the war diary of the 11th Panzer Regiment. Simichnaya. 5th December 1942. At 1300 hours, the commander speaks with the battalion commanders in Kotilnikova and issues reconnaissance orders for 6th December, so in case the enemy attacks Kotilnikova from the north or east, we will be able to carry out an envelopment at the enemy's flank. Simichnaya, 6th December 1942. Regimental staff from Simichnaya to Kotilnikova. Commander with battle staff held back because of new enemy situation. Enemy at Darganov, 40 kilometers east of Kotilnikova, advances from the north by way of that area, Romanian sector, and has put out feelers, for Fulin. Kotilnikova via Peperichny. It is assumed that the enemy will reposition his tank forces, 4th and 13th Tank Corps, with about 300 tanks, there, and will sweep around for a thrust on Kotilnikova, or west of Kotilnikova. It is feared that in this instance, fall Otto, plan Otto, we must stop and defeat the enemy tanks southwest of Kotilnikova. The commander points out that this tank movement would be the decisive battle in liberating the Stalingrad pocket, for which all tanks available to the corps must be deployed en masse. Only if this enemy tank corps is defeated will the road to Stalingrad open, and we will be able to break through and rescue our units trapped there. All units are standing by, ready to move quickly into, in the area of Semichna Verkhne Vasilievsky. Should the enemy break through from Dragonov, we would attack from Sovietskaya, 32 kilometers southeast of Semichna. Semichna, 7th December 1942. Reconnaissance reports that Budarka, southwest of Katilnikova, is once again clear of enemy. Enemy appears reluctant to enter Kotilnikova from the southwest. It is reported that our bridgehead at Chiriskaya on the Don has been seized by the enemy. Deliberations underway as to sending necessary support to our bridgehead at Chiriskaya. Fal Dora. Simichnaya, 8th December 1942. Order to move 5th and 6th companies to Kotilnikova at dawn. 3rd company is to remain for the moment in Simichnaya. All elements in Kotilnikova must be ready to march when the order to that effect arrives, anticipated at 0800 hours, so as to capture Grimyachi Verkhnya Yablochny. 0845 hours. March readiness suspended. Further orders expected. Third company relocating to Kotilnikova. Meanwhile, the entire regiment is assembled in Kotilnikova. Orders for third company are revoked. Company is to remain in Simichna as new reconnaissance reports enemy motorized forces in process of advancing from Aksai by way of Shutov II in the direction of Darganov Peperichny. 1100 hours. Commander is ordered to 1st A. Under discussion is the deployment of Fal Dora, Wilhelm, and Otto. It is anticipated that Fal Dora will take place. It will begin on 9th December 1942 at 04.30 hours. Under command of the 11th Panzer Regiment will be 2nd 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, mechanized, 3rd 76th Artillery Regiment, with 6th and 9th Batteries, the 8th and 10th Anti-Aircraft Training Regiment, Flak Lair Regiment, and 3rd Company 61st Anti-Aircraft Training Regiment A. Mission Starting out from Kotilnikova, capture Grimyachi Verkhnya Yablochny from the north, Nichnya Yablochny also from the north, and Verkhnya Kumoyarsky, if possible. Then the regiment is to advance further in the general direction of Generalovsky. Third company is to move immediately to Kotilnikova, along with the commander of the tactical operations staff of 11th Panzer Regiment. This means the entire regiment will then be in Kotilnikova. The regimental commander will order the battalion and battalion commanders under his command to area garrison headquarters at Kotilnikova at 16.30 hours. Orders are to be issued there. 
The deployment for Fall Wilhelm and Fall Otto will have about the same task organization as Group Hünersdorf. In Fall Wilhelm, the group is to advance along the railway toward the northeast. The mission is to destroy the ring around Stalingrad. In Fall Otto, the goal is to destroy enemy forces coming from Aksai via Peperichny in the attempt to capture Katilnikova from the southeast. 1800 hours. Fall Dora is becoming unlikely, as in the meantime, reconnaissance reports motorized convoys with tanks from Shabelin to Generalovsky and Aksai to Shatov. 2. The Dora attack would have come between these two enemy motorized units, and moreover, the situation at the bridgehead, Chiriskaya, has been cleared up in the meantime. 2130 hours. Call from division. Fal Dora is suspended. Regiment is to inform all applicable subordinated units. Katilnikova, 9th December 1942. Commander is ordered to Unrhein's command post. Enemy tank forces brought to Shabalin are on the way to Krasnoyarsky on the Don. About 100 tanks. It can therefore be assumed that these will be added to the rest of the 85th Tank Brigade, which battled the regiment at Pachlyobin on 4th December. It can be suspected that the enemy will again try to attack Katilnikova by attempting to sweep toward the west and from the north and come in via Pachlyobin or Mayorovsky. The enemy has occupied Kaslovaya Ravine, the northern one, five kilometers north of Pachlyobin, and some tanks were sighted. In this case, the Unternehmen Nordwind, Operation North Wind, is planned. In addition, the 11th Panzer Regiment and 2nd 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment are assembled at Semichna so as to destroy the enemy when it attacks, probably in the area of Mayarovsky. Remontnaya, 10th December 1942. 07.30 hours. Regiment received orders to relocate to the area of Semichna Verkhnya Vasilyevsky with attached 2nd 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment. Companies to march one at a time, Einzeln, individually. Simichnaya, 11th December 1942. During the night, frost. In the morning, minus six degrees. Light snow cover. At 0600 hours, the tanks were started up and tested. By 0630 hours, all engines had been started. Some of the panzers had been started twice in the night, but the ones that had not still fired right up. Ten hundred hours. Commander called to conference with division commander, which lasts several hours. The order to deploy on 12th December is issued. For concept of operations, see division order number seven. The regiment and the 2nd 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment will move to Katilnikova at midday. Issuing of order by Oberst von Hünersdorf. These excerpts from the war diary of the 11th Panzer Regiment reflect not only the respective enemy movements, but also the uncertainty and the constant changes that arose from developments on the Southern Front. They also reveal the friction between Army Group Don and the OKW. The newly formed Army Group Don struggled to convince Hitler and General Oberst Paulus, commander of the surrounded army, to either permit an escape from the pocket or to produce a decision from Paulus to break out. Meanwhile, the 4th Panzer Army made preparations for its mission, which was to protect the flank of the advancing 57th Panzer Corps. This army had to assemble its forces without delay, organize the Romanian 4th Army under its command for defense, and marshal all the fighting spirit essential to such a mission. The attack deadline was postponed to the 8th and later to the 12th of December, partly because of the uncertainty of coordinating with the trapped 6th Army. Further, the bulk of the 23rd Panzer Division still had not arrived, and the 48th Panzer Corps, at the mouth of the Chir, had not yet completed its advance, having had to fend off strong Russian attacks before it could fully assemble its forces. The OKH, Army High Command, had the 17th Panzer Division unloaded behind the Don Front on the left flank of the Army Group. It was the third unit that was to have replaced the 17th Luftwaffe Field Division, and it was promptly marched off to the 57th Panzer Corps, south of the Don. There, Italians were facing the threat of a major Russian attack. The attack actually took place somewhat later, but meantime there was a suspenseful wait for their last-minute appearance on the battlefield. 
The 6th Panzer Division was fully ready to deploy in the area of Kotelnikova by about 5th December. The largest part of its grenadier forces and artillery served as security and were positioned in a sweeping curved pattern from the Don in front of Kotelnikova to about 15 kilometers east of the city. From here, they provided cover for the entire assembly area. The armoured group of the division was positioned around Simichnaya, which was further to the rear, so as to either intercept a direct enemy attack or encirclement. On 11th December, the decision was made. A decision had to be made, as further postponement would threaten the overall situation of the Southern Front. Ultimately, the rescue attempt would have to be suspended. Fall Otto was abandoned. The 23rd Panzer Division was now fully deployed, and the enemy moved hesitantly near the deep right flank and was no longer considered a threat. This operation, like Nordwind, was planned for use only if the enemy were to attempt to seize the initiative by attacking. The main goal had not been to attack and destroy the enemy in this area, but rather to break open a supply corridor to the Stalingrad pocket. Fal Dora had a certain appeal. This plan was to reach the objective in two leaps across the bridgehead of the 48th Panzer Corps at Chiriskaya. Dora was also abandoned, however, as the bridgehead was barely holding on. This front was pushed back by the Russians on 14th December. Thus, what remained was to make a frontal attack on both sides of the rail line Katilnikova stalingrad This was also the shortest route. Naturally, this attack would draw in all enemy forces, and with this, not only resolve the uncertain situation on the right flank, but also bring relief to the 48th Panzer Corps, which was presently engaged in a hard fight. As was later learned, the Russians had left the southern part of their encirclement exposed in order to counter this threat. Although there were likely reservations as to whether the two German panzer divisions alone could fight through the 150 kilometers from Kotelnikova to the ring around Stalingrad, the matter could not wait any longer. There was still hope that the 17th Panzer Division could be brought in quickly enough for reinforcement, and that finally, in one last combined attack, they could reach the objective. Despite the previous failed attempts to do so, those in command positions at the southern front were certain they could still convince General Oberst Paulus to break out of the encirclement. The 4th Panzer Army was engaged in a struggle to relieve the 6th Army's situation, but the 6th Army provided no help of any kind. The last possible chance to relieve Stalingrad, although a weak one, was the last-minute deployment of the 17th Panzer Division. Considering the overall situation, an additional attack would be taking a risk on a scale not seen in the previous war, except perhaps once. The following situation assessment, dated 9th December 1942, was written by General Feldmarschall von Manstein as Commander-in-Chief of the Army Group, and sent to the Army High Command, describing the situation in the sector of Army Group Don. Letter from von Manstein Top Secret, by Hand of Officer Only 9th December 1942 2. Chief of Staff, OKH Operations Section, OKH. Situation Assessment 1. Enemy Assessment In the last ten days, the enemy has brought in strong forces for deployment against the Army Group. Most importantly, still more forces in addition to the reserves expected in the Situation Assessment of 28th November, number 1C. It has been determined that the total forces facing this Army Group are 86 infantry divisions, 17 infantry brigades, 54 armour brigades, 14 motorised brigades, 11 cavalry divisions, totalling 182 large units. In addition, another 13 independent armoured regiments and single tank battalions and anti-tank brigades. In specific, a. The fortress area Stalingrad is encircled on the Volga front by the Russian 62nd Army, with 8 infantry divisions, 3 infantry brigades one tank brigade in front, two infantry brigades, two tank brigades, two motorized brigades in reserve. On the northern front by the 66th and 24th armies, with total of 17 infantry divisions, one motorized brigade in front, four infantry brigades, and four tank brigades in reserve. On the western front by the 65th and 21st armies, with total of 10 infantry divisions, 
seven tank brigades, two motorized brigades, five tank regiments, one anti-tank brigade in front, four tank brigades in reserve. On the southern front, by the 57th and 64th armies, with total of seven infantry divisions, six infantry brigades, six tank brigades, six motorized brigades, two tank regiments in front, and apparently two infantry divisions, two infantry brigades, five tank brigades, one motorized brigade, and five tank regiments in reserve. In the last ten days the enemy has attacked alternately between the north, west, and southern fronts. His main pressure no doubt lies on the western front. He is relatively weak on the southwestern front. B. Our advance on Stalingrad faces following enemy forces. Toward the southwest, at the Cheer front, the 5th Tank Army with 12 infantry divisions, 5 cavalry divisions, 2 motorized cavalry divisions, 4 tank brigades, 1 tank regiment, 2 motorized brigades in front, with 2 infantry divisions, 4 tank brigades, and 1 motorized brigade in reserve. To the north, adjoining these and positioned in front of the centre and the left flank of Group Hollit, are 3 more infantry divisions. Toward the south and east of the Don, we face the 51st Army, with four infantry divisions, four cavalry divisions, one tank brigade, one motorized brigade in front, one tank brigade in front, and one infantry brigade in reserve. The gathering of more motorized forces behind the front is still not clear. C. The recent day's reconnaissance reports Unloading eastwards of Stalingrad as well as troop movements across the Don in front of the eastern front of Group Hollit toward the south. Although the enemy's security front east of the Don is basically passive, apparently because the gathering of rear motorized forces has not yet been completed, the enemy did attack at the Cheer bridgehead and west of Cheer train station on the other side of the Cheer with strong forces. As evidenced by the north-south movements in front of Group Hollit, an expansion of this attack further westward is to be expected. D. In the previous battles, the enemy no doubt sacrificed a considerable proportion of his tanks, but he compensated for the loss by bringing in new tank regiments. The attack strength of his infantry is still weak, but artillery activity on Stalingrad's west front has increased considerably. 2. Our Situation A. The Sixth Army has so far defeated all enemy attacks, although with considerable losses. Its present combat strength will be treated in a special report. The munitions supply in the essential types of munitions, shown in percentage of the initial supply, effective 5th December 1942, totals 5 cm towed cannon propelling charge, 60, equals 59%, 7.5 cm towed cannon propelling charge, 40, equals 39.4 percent. 15 centimeter mortar equals 25 percent. Light field howitzer equals 34 percent. 8 centimeter mortar equals 30.8 percent. Heavy 10 centimeter cannons 19 equals 21.6 percent. Light infantry gun equals 28 percent. Heavy field howitzer equals 36 percent. Heavy infantry gun equals 25 percent. The present supply of rations, after reduction to 200 grams bread, leaves enough bread until 14th December, midday rations until 20th December, evening meals until 19th December. Despite excellent efforts by the Luftwaffe, the resupply by air only brought in 300 tons due to weather conditions. Out of 188 aircraft used that day, two were shot down and nine lost. On all other days, the rations flown in totaled between 25 tons, 27th November, and 150 tons, 8th December, despite a minimum daily need of 400 tons. B. The 4th Panzer Army. Due to bogging down of wheeled elements of 23rd Panzer Division, the assembly of the 62nd Panzer Corps with its aviation combat squadrons will not be fully completed on 3rd December as hoped, but on 10th December. In order to salvage the situation at the Cheer Front, the 48th Panzer Corps, 336th Infantry Division and 7th Luftwaffe Field Division had to be deployed immediately. The battle is not yet over. C. Romanian Units At this time the Romanian 4th Army is holding its position to the north, 
adjoining the 16th Infantry Division, motorized. But in the event of an attack of any strength from the north, it cannot be expected to hold. It has been all the more compromised due to instructions from Marshal Antonescu to avoid getting marooned. D. The Romanian Third Army, except for the Romanian First Army Corps, which is assigned to Group Hollit, and is more or less intact, the battle strength of the remaining deployed Romanian divisions does not amount to more than one or two battalions. Artillery is not available in any degree worth mentioning. The restoration of units to the rear has not led to any significant results as yet due to lack of weapons. The fact remains that the Romanian commanders do not act with the necessary force. They characterize the defeat as having been caused by higher powers, meaning the German leaders. For the rest of it, the entire front manned by the Romanian Third Army is held by reaction forces, furlough units, etc. Without artillery and anti-tank guns, one cannot even make a show of strength. Long term, this front is not up to an attack from strong enemy forces, especially armoured forces. The cobbled-together units, which lack a strong inner structure, must be replaced with combat units for the foreseeable future. Their composition and battle strengths do not permit a long deployment on the front lines. Even when it comes to special troops withdrawn for rear duties, they cannot perform their individual duties long term without harm to the entire supply system. 3. Our Intentions The army group intends, as soon as at all possible, to begin attacking with the 4th Panzer Army, as reported, so as to establish communications with the 6th Army. At this time, however, the thawing of the ground prohibits an advance by the 57th Panzer Corps. Whether the divisions of the 48th Panzer Corps at the Chia Front can be completely released on 11th December is not yet certain. The participation of the 17th Panzer Division for this attack is necessary and has been ordered. Because it must be taken into account that the enemy could expand his attack on the Chia Front in the general direction of Marasovskaya in the foreseeable future, the relief of this front must take place, either with the help of Group Hollid, with an attack in the general direction of Perelazovsky, or by releasing a German division to us. 4. Overall Assessment The mass of forces that the enemy has brought in to face the army group Don leaves no doubt that he sees the Schwerpunkt of his overall operation here. He will continue to bring in more forces from other fronts as long as possible. Therefore, no matter how the situation, with respect to the Sixth Army, may develop in the near future, a constant addition of forces to Army Group Don will continue to be necessary. It is crucial that all means be used to bring in the reinforcements more quickly. At present rate, we will have to remain at a disadvantage. I also consider it necessary that everything be done to make the Romanian armies functional, especially in terms of their willingness to fight, and to restore their trust in the German leaders. As to the question of whether, after establishing communications with Sixth Army, we will be able to bring them out of the pocket, here are my own thoughts to consider. A. If the Sixth Army were to be left in the fortress area, it is quite possible that the Russians, too, will hold out stoically and gradually bleed themselves out in pointless attacks, and that Stalingrad will become the final resting place for its attack power. But one must also be clearly aware that the Sixth Army has to live and fight under especially unfavourable conditions in the fortress area, and that with the present ratio of forces, which will continue for a long time throughout the area, the possibility exists that communications with them could break down again. In any case, a decisive change of situation in the coming weeks cannot yet be expected. B. On the other hand, one must also take into account that the Russians might act properly, in terms of conventional doctrine, and while maintaining the pocket of Stalingrad, attack with strong forces in the area of the Romanian Third and Fourth Armies, with Rostov as their target. This will render our essential forces operationally static in the Stalingrad fortress area, and tie us down trying to keep the communications open, while the Russian will have freedom of action across the entire rest of the front of the army group. To me, maintaining this situation over the entire winter appears pointless. c. To pursue the decision to keep Sixth Army in Stalingrad must necessarily also be the decision to fight this battle through to a decisive victory. This depends on a. a. 
providing additional forces to Sixth Army for maintaining its defensive power by sending in Luftwaffe field divisions to be incorporated into the army units. B.B. Above all, support of the connecting fronts of the Romanian Fourth and Third Armies with German forces, since holding of these fronts with the remnants of Romanian units and emergency fill-in troops is not assured long-term. C.C. As soon as our forces permit, a serious offensive with the goal of definite victory. The issue of whether the forces can be made available for this in a timely way lies outside my purview. Commander-in-Chief of the Army Group Don. Signed, von Manstein, General Feldmarschall. 1A, number 0354-42, secret, for command headquarters. Chapter 4. The Advance. 12th to 24th December, 1942. Maps 6 to 15. The Breakthrough, 12th December. The Capture of the Axai Sector, 13th December. The Battle for Verkhnia Kumsky, 14th to 19th December. The Night March to Mushkova, 19th to 20th December. The Battle for Vasilevka, 21st to 24th December. The End of the Fighting, 24th December. War Diary of 11th Panzer Regiment. 12th December, 1942. The readiness procedures are delayed, as the march across the bridge at the northern exit of Katilnikova is proceeding more slowly than expected. Further, the arrival time of 0430 hours will not be possible, as it will still be dark. 0515 hours. All units have reported in, ready. 0520 hours. It has begun. The attack proceeding as ordered. West of Hill 129, the Panzer Regiment is to move north, then turn off eastwards towards Grimiaci. Order of battle. 1st 11th Panzer Regiment, 2nd 11th Panzer Regiment, Hill 129 pinned down by artillery fire and ultimately cleared by 2nd 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment. Meanwhile, 1st 11th Panzer Regiment, after reaching the rail line to the east and north, secures area. Then 2nd 11th Panzer Regiment swings in toward Grimiaci and after short battle captures it. Two panzers lost due to mines, one more destroyed by anti-tank system. Meanwhile 1st 11th Panzer Regiment is deployed northward along the rail line as far as Nibikovsky Station. In a valley to the southwest a short battle ensues with one enemy 12.2 cm battery and field positions which ended at 0730 hours. Overall, enemy resistance is not hard. Two Stalin's organs, Katyusha, a mobile rocket launcher, open fire, which is unpleasant but causes little damage. In addition, enemy vanguards are engaged by our reconnaissance. Those involved in the attack were surprised by the enemy's apparent lack of strength. Based on our own successful breakthrough, we were fully convinced of our own capability and were ready to face strong resistance. If not right away, then we expected it would appear further on at the narrow pass at the Nebikovsky station. This narrow passageway was also used by the railroad line to Stalingrad, and was bordered by deep sand dunes, so it could not be circumvented by motorized troops, and could have provided an excellent barricade for the enemy's defense. It would be no exaggeration to call this a portal to the Aksai. How could the enemy's surprising absence be explained? We could not assume that he had simply made a mistake, or that he was not expecting an attack. Considering the Russians' forceful reconnaissance in the previous days, their experience in Pakhlyobin, and their own country's well-functioning intelligence service, it ought to be obvious to them that the Germans had gathered their forces, and that their numerous panzers were not there simply for the sake of defence. Then we came to our own realisation that, like us, the Russians did not have unlimited forces available. At that moment, they most likely considered the fortress around Stalingrad to be their main priority. Because of the enemy's conduct in front of the 57th Panzer Corps, we began to suspect that not only had he sent his very best divisions to Stalingrad, but he had also withdrawn artillery and other heavy weapons from the Katilnikova front. He took this risk, perhaps in the assumption that the Germans would not counterattack until later, Thus, it must have been a considerable surprise when the Germans appeared so soon, and we intended to take full advantage of the element of surprise. 
Our first destination, the Axai River, lay within close reach to both us and to the enemy, whom we believed to be at Verkhnya Yablochny. In order to neutralize this flank threat, and to help Group Unrhein, battle group from 4th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, without panzers, 6th Division decided to attack Verkhnya Yablochny with battle group Hunersdorf, armor battle group consisting of 11th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, 2nd 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, among others, which had proceeded to this area from the south. At Nebikovsky Station, turning toward the northwest, the forces reached an area about six kilometers northeast of the targeted village at about 08.30 hours, almost without enemy contact. War Diary of 11th Panzer Regiment 08.54 hours First 11th Panzer Regiment is positioned on Hill 124.7 with the regimental commander. The 2nd 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment is ordered to move to a position to the right of 1st 11th so as to secure the refueling stop. The fuel and ammunition transports arrive surprisingly quickly. During this time, the 2nd 11th Panzer Regiment also catches up and closes ranks. The artillery moves into position, and the anti-aircraft unit creates an air defence barrier toward the north. For the attack operation in the direction of Stalingrad, the 6th Panzer Division had been organised into four battle groups, three of which were actually rather weak Panzer Grenadier groups, Solenkopf, Unrhein, and Quentin, plus the very strong battle group Hunersdorf. About four hours after the start of the attack, the following scene erupted. While Tolenkov, from the 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, minus 2nd Battalion, SPW, among others, dominated the area north of Pachlyobin, to the left between the Don and Katilnikova, Unrhein attacked almost due north towards Verkhnya Yablochny. Hunersdorf was positioned to the northeast of this village, and Quentin, consistently most of the 6th Reconnaissance Battalion, initially following Hunersdorf, turned with its right flank on the railway line toward Stalingrad, the boundary of 23rd Panzer Division, and headed toward Chiliakov. It was known that the 23rd Panzer Division had also succeeded in capturing ground toward the northeast. This left a gap of about 30 kilometres in the Russian front. Resistance was detected only in Verkhnya Yablochny and on both sides of the railway line. Unfortunately, at Chiliakov, there was another one of those narrow ravines that unexpectedly turned up in this region. War Diary of 11th Panzer Regiment 10.10 hours Arrival in Verkhnya Yablochny 1st 11th Panzer Regiment on the right, 2nd 11th Panzer Regiment on the left, and between them the Panzer Jägers on self-propelled guns. 2nd 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment follows in a broad wedge formation. The attack commences, initially according to plan and without enemy resistance, but then becomes stuck due to problems in the terrain. After withdrawing, the regiment deploys again toward the village, which it captures after a short fight against anti-tank and infantry weapons. Two enemy tanks manage to escape at first, but are destroyed by anti-aircraft guns, flak, at the Panzer Barricade at Hill 124.7. 2nd Battalion, 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, clears the area and finally hands it over to Group Unrhein, which has arrived from the south according to plan. The regiment regroups and leaves for Chiliakov by way of Hill 124.7 at 1330 hours, 1530 hours local time, arriving at Chililov at nightfall. Chiliakov has meanwhile been captured by Group Quentin. What made the entry to Chiliakov difficult was an iced over ravine, which was enough of an obstacle to prevent the last units from crossing until next morning at 0530 hours, 0730 hours local time. During the night, 1st 11th Panzer Regiment shelters at the Chiliakov train station. The 2nd 11th Panzer Regiment overnights in the dairy two kilometres to the west-northwest, while the 2nd 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment spends the night in the stockyard to the southwest. Little is available in terms of quarters, so almost everyone has to sleep in their vehicles. Daily Report Captured goods, five tanks, ten cannons, Ten anti-tank weapons, one Stalin's organ. This is the name the Germans gave to the Katyusha, a mobile rocket launcher. A number of lorries, many small arms, 450 prisoners of war, five motor vehicles destroyed. 
The intent for the next day is to cross the Aksai at Klikov, or Salivsky, and capture the hills north of there, intent approved by the division. Thus ended the first day of the mission to liberate the surrounded troops in Stalingrad. The important objective of the day, capturing the Aksai Bridge, was not accomplished. In retrospect, one must doubt the wisdom of having decided to first capture Verkhnia Yablochny, considering the few enemy forces found there. The village would have been captured in any case during the course of the day, probably by Group Unrhein. In any case, Unrhein's battle strength would have sufficed to tie down the Russians who were there, which would have averted a threat to the division's main forces advancing along the railway line. Nevertheless, as General Lee remarked after his unsuccessful battle at Gettysburg in 1863 to a member of his staff, in fact, this staff member happened to be the grandfather of this book's author, Captain, tomorrow every printer's apprentice will have some opinion about how I should have acted. It is only too bad that these strategists are so far away from the battlefield when they are needed. As it turned out, we still had to face the frozen-over ravines at Chiliakov, which, even with ice studs, were incredibly difficult. Even though this became easier during the day with help from the pioneers, the cost in time was so high that any further advance had to end at nightfall, which set in very early at that time of year. Only later did we realize that it was possible to conduct very successful tank attacks, even actual raids, in this terrain even at night. The evening reports showed that the other groups had problems as well. The Russians might have sent only weak forces against our division, something we had not planned for. Or the Russians might also have withdrawn their main forces across the Aksai. We would find out the next day. Hard fighting was expected. During the night, no enemy was to be seen around Chiliakov. Before us lay the same scene, fires burning in almost all directions, quivering balls of light, and the repeated flickering of machine-gun fire from the security forces. With no strict orders against it, they often shot at night, perhaps for the same reason dogs bark at night, to drive away uncertainty, or to just demonstrate one's strength for its own sake. It became bitterly cold, and the unit leaders didn't sleep. The ravine, its road no longer visible under the slippery, icy covering, required their constant focus. Then we also had to refuel, replenish ammunition, supervise the distribution of rations, attend meetings, and review orders for the next day. No one was quite satisfied with how the day had gone. The question was, where were the Russians? War Diary of 11th Panzer Regiment 0400 Hours Issuing of orders by Oberst von Hunersdorf 0500 Hours Fall in at vehicle observation point north of Chiliakov, train station. The regimental commander, Hunesdorf, rejects the division's plan to deploy the panzers at night in order to capture the Aksai bridge. It is far too hard to keep one's bearings at night, and the frozen ravines present too great a risk for panzers. In accordance with orders, we are to fall in at 0500 hours and proceed to the sharp bend of the railway line, two kilometres west of the railcar siding area at Birikovsky. The advance will be delayed further due to two frozen-over ravines. At this sharp bend, there is a short firefight with enemy tanks east of the railway. Group Quentin, advancing eastwards of the railway, requests support against these tanks. The commander has decided, however, not to allow ourselves to be pulled toward the east, but instead orders us to continue on northwest toward Salvaki. Over the course of 12th December, the 23rd Panzer Division was not able to advance to the hills of Chiliakov, as they still had unprotected flanks. In order to secure their flanks, Group Quentin, which was located alongside with the tanks on the opposite side of the rail line, had to move across the tracks. This enabled the 23rd Panzer Division to continue its advance. While Unrhein and Tsolenkov followed on the left in echelon formation, Battle Group Hunersdorf pushed on ahead, Taking the quickest route possible to Aksai permitted by the difficult terrain, they arrived at Chiliakov, having had almost no enemy contact. Despite calls for help, Hunesdorf refused to be diverted. Although he was in defiance of orders from division, he was able to avoid the mistakes from the previous day. With the first warm rays of daylight, the group reached its assigned sector. At that time, all that was known of the 23rd Panzer Division was that its desired objective for the day was also Aksai.
War Diary of 11th Panzer Regiment. 0800 hours. The bridge is taken with almost no enemy resistance. It is in bad shape, but can be made ready for all vehicles. The 1st 11th Panzer Regiment moves across that sector to the north and readies for an attack on Verkhnia Kumsky, which still had to be captured. After 1st Battalion crosses the bridge, the regimental commander follows, upon which the bridge fails. The commander's panzer sits blocking all further vehicles, and all attempts to tow it off prove unsuccessful. Once 1st Battalion crosses, no further forces can cross. The original plan was an attack by the entire regiment, with 2nd Battalion 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment and the artillery. After a heavy Stuka attack on Verkhnia Kumsky, the commander decided to attack with only 1st Battalion 11th Panzer Regiment. At 1200 hours, against weak enemy resistance, we took Verkhnia Kumsky. Battlegroup Hunersdorf had advanced over 25 kilometers within seven hours, had captured the Axhide Bridge against weak enemy resistance, and had secured a ten-kilometer deep bridgehead. It had left the bulk of the division, as well as its neighboring unit to the right, 23rd Panzer Division, far behind. It appeared that they would have an enemy-free route in the direction of Stalingrad. But the question remained, where are the Russians? Their traces were everywhere, but never in any numbers worth mentioning. Their previous losses were not so great as to suggest that they had been totally destroyed. It had to be assumed that the Russian troops lay further to the rear, either in the region between Selivsky and the Don, or to the right, in front of the 23rd Panzer Division, or possibly in both areas. But where was the mysterious Russian 3rd Tank Army? As to the threat of the German advance, the Russians couldn't possibly remain in a state of disbelief. Thus, despite the dreadful silence, the situation did not allow for a relaxed attitude, especially considering that the Aksai Bridge at Salivsky was now impassable. A splintering of the division's main force had to be avoided. This meant that, above all, the weak point at Salivsky had to be reinforced, as this was where the remainder of the battle group would remain until it became possible to cross to the opposite side of the river. Because Group Quentin remained tied down by the enemy, further to the right and rear, Unrein had to quickly reposition itself, while further to the left and rear, Tsolenkov and the Romanian 6th Corps provided security. The 1st 11th Panzer Regiment, positioned far forward in Verkhnia Kumsky, was almost without supporting units, and to bring them reinforcements meant the bridge had to be repaired quickly. War Diary of 11th Panzer Regiment The following equipment is to be sent forward. One motorcycle rifle company, the two scout platoons of 11th Panzer Regiment, and two platoons from 2nd 114th Panzer Regiment, mounted on panzers, which are still located on the opposite bank. Security for the bridgehead is to be taken over by 1st 4th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, with 1st Battery 76th Artillery Regiment. Despite all efforts, the panzer lodged in the bridge cannot be removed. Therefore, Bridge Convoy K will be brought in and, at 1200 hours, will begin with the bridge construction across the Axai. On orders from Division, 2nd 11th Panzer Regiment was tasked with scouting the terrain south of the Axai as far as the Chilyakov Ravine. No enemy tanks were found. Division also tasked 1st Company, 41st Panzer Jäger Battalion, to do the same on Hill 56.3, which was two kilometres south of Selivsky, since there ought to be tanks there. Previous reconnaissance only revealed that the village Vodyansky was occupied by the enemy, and that at Darafayevsky, three kilometres to the west, enemy cavalry has moved across a fording point toward the south. Since the bridge will not be completed until about 0500 hours, orders will be issued at 0400 hours. During the night, several surprise fire attacks by Stalin's organs at Selivsky in which even the regimental command post is hit and incurs some casualties. The construction of the bridgehead and the capture of Verkhnia Kumsky took place against orders from the division, which had wanted the regiment to turn toward the tanks eastwards of the railway. Apparently, the enemy had systematically cleared out of the Axai sector. Due to their quick action, the regiment prevents the formation of a strong centre of resistance at Verkhnia Kumsky. The destruction of the bridge across the Aksai at Selivsky 
brought an end to the advance on that day at 1,200 hours. It was an ironic stroke of fate that the fault lay with the commander of the battle group and his own panzer. Unfortunately, the panzer proved impossible to tow away, and its presence there prevented any restoration of the old bridge within the time available. A completely new bridge had to be constructed. Then darkness brought everything to a halt, just as on the previous day. All that went on was reconnaissance, security, and the arrival of additional elements of the division. The task given to 2nd 11th Panzer Regiment to search the terrain south of the Aksai in the direction of Chilyakov Ravine was in response to a call for help by the rather weak 23rd Panzer Division, which had to fend off an attack by a strong Russian force shortly before reaching the Aksai, and was unable to advance further. To deal with a possible threat from the east, the 6th Panzer Division commander decided to push in that direction with elements from two different units. This operation involved just two companies from 2nd 11th Panzer Regiment and one SPW company from 2nd 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment. This drive was undertaken as a secondary effort, as the two other companies of the Panzer Battalion were needed to provide security toward the west in the direction of Vodyansky. The author and his company participated in this advance. Despite what is reported in the war diary, it should be stated that we not only reached the Chilyakov Ravine, but crossed it. Shortly before reaching the railway line, we came upon enemy tanks, but once we opened fire, they turned off northwards. As it later turned out, this enabled the 23rd Panzer Division to catch its breath, and use the time to finish constructing two bridgeheads across the Aksai by nightfall on the same day. All of this meant that any issues with the right flank of Battle Group Hunersdorf and its situation at Selivsky had been overtaken by events. Its earlier decision to avoid becoming diverted eastwards prior to the construction of a bridge at Aksai was validated. The main concern now was the area west of Selivsky and the entire region around Verkhnyakumsky. It was certain that a larger fight could be expected next day. The entire responsibility for reinforcing that far forward point fell to the division and battle group Hunersdorf. Heightened reconnaissance activity would be crucial. Wehrmacht Report of 14th December 1942. Excerpt. In other areas of the southern sector of the front, the sometimes very intense battles against the powerful enemy forces continue. Our panzer forces, which advanced from the area southwest of Stalingrad, defeated strong enemy forces, whose counterattack collapsed with losses of over twenty armoured vehicles. During an advance that took place in recent days in the Kalmyk steppe into the enemy's rear, numerous prisoners were captured, and the enemy's supply line was seriously disrupted. 14th December 1942 The Battles at Verkhnyakumsky Map 8 Provided in a moment are all radio messages available to this author to and from Battle Group Hunersdorf in the eventful days starting on 14th December 1942. They are presented here in sequence to document each event. They provide a valuable insight into the manner of leadership during the movements that were to follow. Battle Group Hunersdorf Radio Traffic 0500 hours, radio message to 1st 11th Panzer Regiment. Deploy motorcycle reconnaissance to Gramoslavka, Shabalinsky, and Nova Aksaisky. Scout routes to Shestakov, both direct and via Hill 146.9. Majority of Hunersdorf to assemble across the bridge at an estimated time of 0530 hours. 0510 hours. Radio message to division. Events during the night. Two surprise fire attacks with Stalin's organs from the west. Command post Hunersdorf hit seven wounded, several motor vehicles destroyed. In Verkhnyakumsky it is quiet. Hunersdorf to assemble majority of troops after the completion of the bridge at 0530 hours. War Diary of 11th Panzer Regiment The mission for 14th December 1942 reads, Hold the bridgeheads, provide reconnaissance at Gramoslavka, Shabalinsky, and route reconnaissance toward the west and east. The regimental command further orders, after completion of the bridge over the Aksai, Group Remlinger, 1st 4th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, minus one company, the one in Verkhnyakumsky, with 1st 76th Artillery Regiment, 8th Company Anti-Aircraft Training Regiment, 
1st Company, 41st Panzjäger Battalion, and one 8.8 .8 anti-aircraft battery, are to hold the bridgehead. Group Cooper, 2nd 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, minus 5th Company, 6th 76th Artillery Regiment, and two platoons of 2 centimeter anti-aircraft guns, and 5th 11th Panzer Regiment, will be assigned to Oberstunrhein for special missions. Staff 11th Panzer Regiment, with 2nd 11th Panzer Regiment, 5th 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, 3rd 4th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, 10th Anti-Aircraft Training Regiment, 1 Platoon Heavy Anti-Tank Guns, 2nd 41st Panzer Jäger Battalion, and 3rd 76th Artillery Regiment, minus 6th Battery, are to go to Verkhnyakumsky, after completion of the bridge across the Aksai. The new bridge was not completed in the expected time, and during the night it was repeatedly destroyed by enemy fire on Salivsky, which brought further delays. War Diary of 11th Panzer Regiment 0700 hours Bridge completed at 0600 hours. After two companies from 2nd 11th Panzer Regiment had finished crossing, an attack by enemy tanks from Hill 79.9, two kilometres northwest of Salivsky, was reported. The 2nd 11th Panzer Regiment is deployed against them, one enemy tank destroyed, two others flee westward. An attack led by Battalion Remlinger to secure the west flank of the bridgehead toward Vodjansky, north of the Aksai, stalls out amid unexpectedly strong enemy fire. Remlinger has to transition to defence, and during the day is attacked from the west at his positions, north and south of the river. This was the opening move of the first day of the tank battle in the Kalmyk steppe, one that lasted almost three days, one of the largest and most brutal tank battles of World War II, a battle between 200 German panzers and 300 to 400 Russian tanks. This enormous number of armoured vehicles was engaged constantly and simultaneously on the battlefield, in an engagement that was almost entirely a tank battle. It ultimately ended in a tie, and it was only later that the German side gained the upper hand. Next morning, when we failed to capture Vodjansky, it became clear that the Russians had not totally disappeared. In fact, it was just the opposite. We were attacked at Salivsky by the two Russian infantry divisions positioned outside of Katilnikova, and the remainder of the Russian 4th Cavalry Corps, probably with support from parts of the Russian 3rd Tank Army. The 23rd Panzer Division was attacked as well, by what turned out to be troops from a mechanized Russian corps that belonged to the now slowly gathering Russian 3rd Tank Army. Battlegroup Hunersdorf, Radio Traffic 0735 hours Radio message from 2nd 11th Panzer Regiment Position 800 meters northwest of 79.9 Unknown hours Radio message from 2nd 11th Panzer Regiment Enemy clearing out of the ravine. One tank destroyed, two others fled. 0745 hours. Radio message to 1st, 4th Panzer Grenadier Regiment. 6th Company, 2nd, 11th Panzer Regiment, will initially remain for security at Hill 79.9, then will be moved on to Verkhnyakumsky. In response to the constant calls for help from Group Remlinger, along with reports that the troops ordered from Remlinger, troops originally meant for Verkhnyakumsky, were instead to be deployed at the bridgehead, the following order was issued. 0756 hours. Radio message to 1st 4th Panzer Grenadier Regiment. Deployment of any elements meant for Verkhnyakumsky is forbidden. Report continuously on which units have gone over the bridge. To clarify the order, despite the fact that Group Remlinger was hard-pressed at Selivsky and was requesting more forces, Oberst von Hunersdorf was determined to do his utmost to send the reinforcements to Verkhnyakumsky as originally planned. He was fully certain that this is where the main battle would develop. The following radio message from the logistics commanders for the Panzer Regiment and the 41st Panzer Jäger Battalion requests that the supply route be kept open, and at least not to order the anti-tank units back from their present positions west of Salivsky. 0810 hours. Radio message from Squadron Borgs. Panzerjäger south of the bridgehead engaging with enemy tanks. Unknown hours. Radio message from Squadron Niemann. 
Niemann encountering enemy tanks southwest of Selivsky. 0825 hours. Radio message from 41st Panzer Jäger Battalion. At 0800 hours, two enemy tanks destroyed, one kilometer south of Salivsky. According to statements by prisoners of war, tonight 20 to 30 enemy tanks moved into village 12 kilometers west of Salivsky. Should self-propelled guns follow after or stay there for now? 0835 hours. Radio message to 41st Panzer Jäger Battalion. Squadron should remain there for now. War Diary of 11th Panzer Regiment 0900 hours At 0900 hours the regimental commander arrives at Verkhnekumsky. At that same moment Verkhnekumsky is attacked from the north by enemy infantry with several tanks. First 11th Panzer Regiment ordered to sweep around and counterattack frontally and to the west. Reconnaissance sent out from Verkhnekumsky provides no information concerning enemy tanks, but all further reconnaissance is prevented by encounters with enemy recon patrols, which are everywhere. Battlegroup Hunersdorf Radio Traffic 0940 hours Radio message to division Hunersdorf in Verkhnekumsky Enemy presently advancing to Sagatskot and from out of the area of Verkhnir Kumsky northeastwards with infantry and tanks. Counterattack initiated. 1020 hours. Radio message to division. 1. According to motorcycle reconnaissance reports, between 0700 and 0800 hours, area south of Sagatskot is clear of enemy. Toward the north and northeast, no breaches. Five kilometers south of Gramoslavka, two enemy scout cars. An engineer officer states that in Gramoslavka, 300 tanks of all types. 10 kilometers south, 20 prisoners brought in. 2. Reconnaissance troops on Chabalinsky, 9 kilometers north of Verkhnekumsky. Two armored reconnaissance vehicles and 20 to 30 riflemen. Recon troops had to turn around. 3. Reconnaissance troops on Nova Aksaisky, Report trench work 1.5 kilometers northeast of the village. All this information taken together showed that the Russians were becoming active. In order to maintain our own freedom of action, Battlegroup Hunersdorf decided to transition to the offense at two important locations, Selivsky and Verkhnekumsky. Therefore, Remlinger, still under Hunersdorf's command, once more received the order to capture Vodyansky. Oberst Hunesdorf rejected the division's intention of supporting this attack with panzers from Verkhnekumsky, noting that he himself was battling strong enemy tank forces south of Verkhnekumsky. Group Remlinger, however, came upon a Russian counterattack and remained in position in front of the target just as he had been that morning. 11.10 hours. Radio message from division. If the Remlinger attack does not succeed and panzer support is not possible, Bring the battalion back. Hold the bridgehead with strong panzer defense, at least several panzers. 1431 hours. Radio message from division. Defense group will be under command of Unrhein for the time being. 1450 hours. Radio message to division. Bridgehead must be ready and able to hold out against 18 enemy tanks. But back to Verkhnekumsky. There, an exemplary report by the light platoon from 2nd 11th Panzer Regiment showed new enemy tanks to the southeast of the village. They would have to be dealt with as soon as 1st Battalion succeeded in defeating the enemy that had attacked from the north that morning. To exploit mobility and full firepower, the regimental commander decided to hunt the enemy in open terrain. For the 2nd 11th Panzer Regiment, which had just arrived in the village a short time ago, this was their big moment. War Diary of 11th Panzer Regiment 1200 hours According to prisoner of war statements, enemy tanks are in Sagat Scott. The commander has decided to sweep around Verkhnekumsky from the south and attack these suspected tanks between Verkhnekumsky and Sagat Scott. The commander, with 2nd 11th Panzer Regiment and 4th 11th Panzer Regiment, attacked at Hill 147.0 with their right flank three kilometers south of Verkhnekumsky, toward the east. After a short distance, the vanguard troops came upon enemy tanks. In a two-hour battle, in a heavy firefight, 32 enemy tanks were destroyed, with only two losses of our own.
Report by Commander, 6th, 11th Panzer Regiment. It was just after midday when the light platoon from my battalion, 2nd, reported enemy tanks had sunk at Scott. Our battalion mounted up immediately, and under the leadership of our commander, Major Dr. Baker, we rolled out to face the reported enemy. West of the road leading to Salivsky, using the terrain as cover, we headed southwards. After four kilometres we turned eastwards, crossed over the road, moved in a broad wedge formation, two companies in front, and carefully advanced further. My company found itself forward to the right. We were to surround Sagat Scott from the south, as from this area the light platoon radioed for help. They were being chased by T-34s. We had barely gone about two kilometres east of the road when we came to the top of a high flat ridge and came upon a surprising scene. At a distance of nearly one thousand metres stood a formation of about forty tanks, painted white like ours, with black numbers painted on the turrets, their crews either outside the vehicles or sitting on them. This could not be the same enemy that had been reported by the light platoon. My first thought was that these were panzers from the 23rd Panzer Division. The scene seemed far too German. But what were they doing in our sector? Then the riddle was solved. The barrels of the cannons were slightly too short. Also, the cupolas on the turrets appeared to be lacking. We rolled on aimlessly, debating back and forth by radio whether this was friend or foe. I nevertheless ordered my own panzer to aim in, just in case it was the enemy, but to fire only if I myself fired a shot. By now we were about six hundred metres away, all nerves on edge, when over there the crews jumped into their tanks and two of them charged us. I was just able to call out attention on the radio when the command came in through the battalion's radio frequency almost simultaneously. One side of the radio headset was for the company's panzers, the other for the battalion. Russians! Fire at will! But before a shot fell from our side, both advancing enemy tanks fired on us. They fired on the move, and despite the mere three hundred metres between us, hit nothing. They were sacrificing themselves for nothing, it seemed. Translator's Note Winkelrieder ohne Sinn Author uses the term Winkelrieder here, referring to a Swiss historical figure, and his self-sacrifice for a larger cause. But then roared a broadside, in the truest sense of the word, from the two companies positioned forward, with the kind of effect that very few can muster. Many of the men must have been watching through their sights, as the two tanks furthest forward literally blew up into pieces. The rest was child's play. At a distance of six hundred metres and less, even with a five-centimetre long tube panzer, every shot was effective. With our faster rate of fire and better training, we were flat-out superior. Hardly any one of them survived. Those who fled were stopped by the 7.5 centimetre long barrel cannons of the heavy companies, even from a distance of over one kilometre. The last ones were forced into a trough and fired on as if on the target range. Thirty-two black smoke clouds rose into the clear winter air. After regrouping, the battalion moved to the north in order to pick up the light platoon believed to be there and to hunt down reported enemy tanks. The crew members of the platoon were soon found, but could not be picked up until later, as the enemy tanks in front of Sagat Scott fired on us. Darkness forbade any further pursuit. Guided by illumination rounds from 1st Battalion, we rolled back to Verkhnyakumsky in complete darkness. Report by Lieutenant H. Kalfelds, Platoon Leader, Light Platoon, 2nd 11th Panzer Regiment. On 14th December 1942, at around 09.30 hours, as commander of the reconnaissance platoon of 2nd 11th Panzer Regiment, I received orders to report to the command post in Verkhnyakumsky. There I received the mission from the regimental commander, Oberst von Hunersdorf, to conduct reconnaissance to the east and northeast and report any possible enemy sightings. I was also assigned the regimental motorcycle messenger platoon for this mission. We left the village shortly before ten hundred hours, and soon reached an area with a great many ravines and had to move slowly. In one especially steep ravine we incurred our first loss, when one of my panzers slid and overturned. The crew suffered some light, some serious injuries. I sent a report by motorcycle messenger to the regiment, asking the commander to send the repair service troops. 
After getting past the ravine, we arrived at the step and moved in a broad wedge formation in the direction of Sagat Scott, Hill 114. After driving about three kilometres, I sighted an enemy tank convoy heading from north to south. There were about forty to fifty tanks which, travelling in a line, moved forward rather slowly due to frequent stops. I reported this enemy immediately to the regiment. Because I stood out in the open step, the Russians sighted me quickly. As their interest in my vehicles grew, I waved a hand to them, by which they apparently assumed that we belonged to them. At any rate, they turned off without firing on us. Soon, a radio message came in. Return to the starting point. But since I saw more enemy movement, in addition to these tanks, I considered it my duty to remain there longer and send a report to the regiment. It was not long before I noticed a new enemy tank unit to my left, possibly even larger than the first, apparently headed for Verkhnyakumsky. I reported this to the regiment. Just as I started to withdraw, a third unit appeared from the direction of Sagat Scott, which, like the previous one, consisted of T-34s, KV-1s and KV-2s. At first the convoy moved south, following the earlier one, but later on turned more to the west. Its mission appeared to be to surround Verkhnyakumsky from the south. My long pause may have provided the regiment with valuable information, but now my own unit was in a very difficult position. I found myself practically in the midst of three very strong Russian tank convoys. The two-centimeter weapons were no match for the Russian 12.5, 10.5 and 7.62 cannons. A battle would be hopeless from the outset. I radioed my situation to the regiment and requested support. In response, I was told that both battalions were already engaged in battle with enemy tanks. I therefore tried to move slowly in the direction of Verkhnyakumsky, in the hope of finding terrain features for cover. Quite soon, however, we were discovered by enemy convoys from the north and came under fire. Six T-34s and KVs turned off toward us. We had to engage. The motorcycle messengers assigned to me attempted to reach the village one by one. Later, many of them came up missing. After the Russians had completely surrounded us, I concentrated my fire on the engine area of a T-34 and set it on fire. I then ordered a dismount. We sought safety in a ravine, but there we came upon some Russians who, although some of them were wounded, immediately fired on us. Because there were more of us, we were able to overwhelm them after a short firefight and take their weapons from them. In their midst I also discovered a woman in a first lieutenant's uniform, who, according to her statement, had been the commander of a tank that had apparently been destroyed in the battle at Verkhnyakumsky. Quite soon we were discovered by Russian tanks, and we had to flee further. Before us was another flat plain. In the midst of this hopeless situation, several crew members surrendered. At the end I had only one sergeant and one NCO with me. Because we had broken up into several groups, I could not see any of the others. Then three more Russian tanks appeared in front of us and began shooting. There was no place to take cover, and our black uniforms stood out against the snow, leaving us no other choice but to pretend to be dead. On my order, we threw ourselves to the ground and remained lying there without moving. We could tell that these tanks had stopped one hundred meters away from us. The minutes passed, seeming like an eternity. Finally, a tank drove up to us very slowly, and then passed by us about three or four meters away. Then the second tank followed. Then finally the third came by. This one came so close that we feared it would run us over. We could have grabbed onto his track. Hardly had they passed than we jumped up and took cover behind the last Russian tank and sought safety and cover in a nearby dune. Here we found more members of our unit who had also escaped. We had reached the end of our nerves, but we were no longer being hunted. From there we could see that two Russian vehicles remained standing near our deserted panzers. Behind us and to the south we heard sounds of battle, but our own troops were nowhere to be seen. It was not until three hours later that some German panzers appeared and, after a short firefight, destroyed the two Russian vehicles. I requested that these panzers remain with us until we had rescued our own panzers, but they were called away by radio. We then went to our panzers and found them nearly undamaged. Only a few cables had been ripped from the radio equipment. Apparently the Russians had wanted to tow these panzers away intact. Soon I regained contact with the regiment. If the Russians had had the ability and intention, 
they could easily have listened in to all of the radio traffic. It was not until dark that the German panzers from 2nd Battalion came and picked us up. The panzers from my platoon that were still operational were either towed or driven into Verchniakumski. War Diary of 11th Panzer Regiment 1500 hours At early nightfall the battle has to break off. The regiment regathers and returns to Verchniakumski. Meanwhile, Verchniakumski is under enemy pressure. Two attacks by 20 to 30 T-34s and KV-1s must be fended off. Three T-34s destroyed, first in the village at a very short distance, three others blown up by German panzer destruction troops, Panzervernichtungstruppen. In particular, Oberstleutnant Schafe distinguishes himself here. For the regiment, the day is a complete success. Out of about 80 enemy tanks, 43 are destroyed, with only a few losses on our side. The bridgehead at Zalivsky is also holding out against strong attacks from the west, north and south of the Aksai. Orders for the following day, wipe out enemy still located in Verkhnyakumsky. Battle Group Hunersdorf Radio Traffic 1510 hours. Radio message to division. Tank battle broken off at nightfall. Enemy fleeing north. 43 heavy enemy tanks destroyed. 1546 hours. Radio message from 6th Reconnaissance Battalion. Battle sounds south of Krugel Yalzov. Presumed to be 23rd Panzer Division. Wounded, two officers, 53 NCOs and soldiers. 1710 hours. Radio message from Squadron Borges. Location two kilometers east of Salivsky. Since 1300 hours, Salivsky under strong enemy tank and artillery fire. Now ended. We are on the march to Verkhnyakumsky and attempting to break through. 1717 hours. Radio message from 1st Battalion, 4th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, Remlinger. After heavy defensive fighting against Russian attack on both river banks, after fall of darkness, enemy repelled for the time being. Russian attempt to surround with T-34s and infantry on our southern flank defeated. For the time being, all quiet. Unknown hours. No Luftwaffe activity. Reached Verkhnyakumsky line. In Salivsky, 1st 4th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, minus 3rd Company, 1st 2nd of 1st 41st Panzer Jäger Battalion, 57th Pioneers, 8th Anti Aircraft Training Regiment, 1 Heavy Anti Aircraft Battery, Group Cooper, 2nd 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, minus 5th Company. In Verkhnyakumsky, 11th Panzer Regiment, minus 5th Company, 4th 6th Reconnaissance Battalion, 3rd Company, 4th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, 5th Company, 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, 1 Platoon from 41st Panzer Jäger Battalion, 3rd Battalion, 76th Artillery Regiment, minus 6th Battery, 10th Company, Anti-Aircraft Training Regiment. Captured goods, not counting Remlinger, 43 tanks, 3 anti-tank guns, 6 lorries, 1 infantry battalion dispersed, 50 dead. Russian 235th Tank Brigade. Our losses, not counting Remlinger, dead, 1 NCO, 2 soldiers, wounded, 1 officer, Lieutenant Preisendanz, 10 NCOs, 13 soldiers. Out of action, Two panzers totaled, nine panzers damaged, some mechanical, some from shooting. 2109 hours. Radio message from Remlinger, 1st 4th Panzer Grenadier Regiment. Casualties at Bridgehead, dead, one officer, seven NCOs, and soldiers. An eventful and victorious day. The Russian units that had recently entered the battle, believed to be from the enemy's 3rd Tank Army, prevented any further advance, but were still unable to overpower our division's positions. Until fall of darkness, all hills gained were successfully held, and with high enemy casualties. The Aksai front solidified, and after the arrival of most of Unrein's group, would not become a dangerous hotspot in days to come. Furthermore, in the coming days, the 17th Panzer Division would arrive from Ariol, meaning that a whole division would be positioned in the area between the Don and Salivsky. Even with its low number of panzers, it was still combat effective, and its presence was reassuring. 
As for casualties, they remained in a low range, especially considering the tough battles of that day. The 23rd Panzer Division was also able to hold its positions against reinforced enemy pressure on the Aksai, east of the division, and further solidify its bridgeheads. This overall situation brings up some interesting points regarding leadership practices, for instance. 1. The Panzer battle took place in open terrain, and all Panzers were retained despite all calls for help. Both contributed to the victory at Verkhnyakumsky. 2. Group Remlinger was temporarily placed under command of Battle Group Unrhein. This reduced Hunersdorf's span of control in Verkhnyakumsky and placed Remlinger in a better position to receive help from Battle Group Unrhein, which had meanwhile moved in closer to him. 3. The quick and unadorned situation reports, by radio, on the rear battle area from the logistics officers of Battle Group Hunersdorf. It was now certain that in the days to follow, the Russians would focus their entire strength and effort on Verkhnyakumsky, which, for them, was an uncomfortably far-forward area. Wehrmacht Report, 15th December 1942 In the Volga-Don region, the infantry and tank units defeated the enemy attacks in hard fighting. They inflicted high losses on the Soviets and destroyed 67 tanks, etc. 15th December 1942 the Panzer Battle at Verkhnyakumsky. Map 9. Battle Group Hunersdorf Radio Traffic. 0025 hours. Radio message from Niemann, Logistics Commander. Bridge crossing only possible by towing due to icy surface, therefore requesting towing equipment. 0030 hours. Radio message from 1st 4th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, Remlinger. Russians occupying Hill 79.9 at strength of about one company with three tanks, and this early in the morning they are sitting directly under my nose. Couldn't someone come in from the rear and knock them flat? 0045 hours. Radio message to Niemann, supply commander. Anything not over the bridge, leave it where it is. Put under bridge. What is north of the bridge, take with you. 0400 hours. Radio message to division. Morning report. Night in Verkhnyakumsky passed quietly. Supplies underway. March readiness at dawn. Task organization and Panzer situation as reported yesterday. War diary of 11th Panzer Regiment. Verkhnyakumsky, 15th December 1942. The night is passing quietly. Scheduled reconnaissance reports, strong enemy movement from the north toward Verkhnyakumsky. Battle Group Hunersdorf Radio Traffic 0530 hours Radio message from 1st 4th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, Remlinger Russians appear to be readying for battle with their Schwerpunkt at our southern flank. Can I count on a spoiling attack toward the enemy force mustering in front of my northern position? 0626 hours Radio message from Niemann, Logistics Commander Located eastwards of Salivsky crossed stream with some elements, trying to bring vehicles across stream one at a time. Since daybreak, Salivsky under strong enemy bombardment. 0720 hours. Radio message to division. Enemy infantry and cavalry elements and a few tanks in ravine area northeast and north of Verkhnyakumsky. Scouting of terrain opportunities for flank and rear attack. Are made difficult by lack of anti-tank ammunition, 1,500 rounds are missing. The Division 6th Column urgently needed. 0725 hours. Radio message from 4th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, Unrhein. Tank attack on southwestern portion, Salivsky, successfully defended against. Several T-34s confirmed destroyed. 0730 hours. Radio message from 2nd 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, Cooper. How is situation there? We are stopping. Strong defensive battles here. 0745. Radio message from 4th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, Unrhein. Convoy traffic possible in northern direction in great depth. Railway in the southern part of Selivsky from time to time under artillery and tank bombardment. 0752 hours. Radio message from Niemann. The Selivsky Verkhnyakumsky road is not open able to guide vehicles across the stream under most difficult conditions. 
Oberst Leutnant Herbert, with me. As predicted, the Russians did attack promptly on the morning of 15th December, but they made their appearance at Selivsky on the front that had been fortified by Battlegroup Unrhein during the night. They were fought off and suffered many losses. During the quiet moments that settled over Verkhnia Kumsky during the night, the necessary resupply began to Battlegroup Hunersdorf, which was in position there. But because of the frozen roads to and from Aksai, and the constant artillery fire on the overpass and on large stretches of the supply highway, it could only be carried out to the smallest extent. Reconnaissance had reported enemy forces moving in from the north and northeast, and Oberst von Hunersdorf decided to attack them again at first light with elements of his battle group, in open terrain, just as on the previous day. War Diary of 11th Panzer Regiment 0800 hours. Ordered by the division to destroy this enemy force, the commander decides to take the Panzer Regiment and the 5th 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, SPW, sweep northwards and strike at its flank. He leaves behind a defence force in Verkhnia Kumsky under command of Major Löwe, Commander 1st Panzer Regiment 11, consisting of two companies of Panzers, the 2nd 76th Artillery Regiment, the 3rd 4th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, the 4th 6th Reconnaissance Battalion, and the available anti-aircraft guns. The regiment attacks in a long assault line toward the right, breaking off at the end again and again, lengthening at the front, moving toward the northwest. The enemy resistance is tenacious, especially the strong and well-camouflaged anti-tank force, which stands fast and inflicts heavy casualties on the regiment. Our commander is out front and personally urges the unit on, but the enemy is very strong, well-camouflaged and cannot be seen, and he is unable to develop the attack in a fluid manner. Battlegroup Hunersdorf Radio Traffic 0810 hours Radio message from 2nd 11th Panzer Regiment Commander Major Dr. Baker. Baker, ready to march in 15 minutes. 08.15 hours. Radio message from Unrhein. Commander, 4th Panzer Grenadier Regiment. Get going. We are standing fast on our own. 08.22 hours. Radio message from 2nd 11th Panzer Regiment. Baker is on the way. 08.30 hours. Message to Cooper. Commander, 2nd 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment. Bravo, Cooper. Pursue quickly. 0831 hours. Radio message to Baker. Commander 2nd 11th Panzer Regiment. Straight ahead, two of our own lorries set afire by enemy tanks. Get there fast. 0835 hours. Radio message from Unrhein. Battlegroup Commander at Salivsky. Everything here in good order. Bridgehead is holding. Herbert on return trip. A T-34 blown up by tank destruction detail. 0843 hours. Radio message from 1st 11th Panzer Regiment, Löwe. Request Becker's position. 0845 hours. Radio message to Löwe. Three kilometers northwest of west exit Verkhnia Kumsky. 0849 hours. Radio message from Becker. Löwe asking me for panzers. 0900 hours. Radio message from Becker. Anti tank guns everywhere. Can't see them. 0902 hours. Radio message to Becker. Then sweep around left at highest speed and surround them. 0904 hours. Radio message from Becker. Wils, commander, 4th, 11th, Panzer Regiment, reports nothing visible. Nothing. Request artillery fire on enemy position. 0906 hours. Radio message to Becker. Quickly forward with strong left flank. 0908 hours. Radio message from Becker. Wils reports eight enemy anti-tank sighted. 0928 hours. Radio message from Löwe. From east, attack on Verkhnia Kumsky with over-battalion strength and enemy tanks. 0930 hours. Radio message from Löwe. What is Becker's situation? 0932 hours. Radio message to Löwe. We are surrounding the enemy from left. 0955 hours. Radio message from Cooper, 2nd 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment. What is situation with 5th 114th and Cannon Platoon? Report personnel and material losses. Is resupply needed? 0958 hours. Radio message to Cooper. 
Answer not possible this second, in middle of fight. 10.01 hours, radio message from Lerva. Where is Hunersdorf, and what is intent? 10.03 hours, radio message to Lerva. We are surrounding enemy to left. 10.05 hours, radio message to division. In the middle of heavy fight with enemy tanks northwest of Verkhnerkumsky. In the morning, with the enemy closing in from the north and northeast, the commander ordered five of the seven panzer companies that had remained in Verkhnerkumsky, reinforced by a mechanized company, to counterattack. This enemy force, already very close to the village and familiar with the German positions, could not, as it had been on the previous day, be taken by surprise. The battle began from a long distance away. Due to the enemy's poor optics and perhaps scant training, the German side did not suffer great losses. One problem was the supply vehicles which had not returned, as a battle over this village could be expected. Under orders to return immediately, they were forced to run the gauntlet. The question remains as to why the Russians closed only the village entrances and exits, and left the road between Verkhnerkumsky and Salivsky open, although this would have been easy to block. Because the fronts and positions shifted quickly during the running tank battle, the ability to provide artillery reinforcement was very limited. This was why it was of little use in the area northwest of Verkhnerkumsky. Amid the interweave of fronts and the breadth of the battlefield, any outside observer would have had problems distinguishing friend from foe. A more detailed description is provided in the following. Report by Commander, 6th, 11th Panzer Regiment. On the morning of 15th December, in heavy fog, the village of Verkhnerkumsky came under continuous and increasingly heavy tank, mortar, and machine gun fire, yet the enemy remained out of sight. The fires came predominantly from the north and northwest. Information gathered from reconnaissance troop and sector reports, as well as reports from the vehicles returning from the drive to Selivsky, which had suffered enemy bombardment, soon made it clear that the enemy was advancing toward the village, not just from the north, but from other directions as well. On orders from the battle group commander, Oberst von Hunersdorf, the first and second companies of the Panzer Regiment, as well as the other elements of battle group in the village, were to remain in the village under command of Major Löwe, commander of 1st 11th Panzer Regiment. Meanwhile, 3rd, 4th, 6th, 7th and 8th Panzer Companies, and one mechanized company from 2nd 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, were to break out toward the west, penetrate the enemy ring around the village, then pivot around the village northwards and overrun the enemy from the side. Simultaneously, the supply vehicles, other easily damaged elements of the battle group, and non-combat personnel were ordered to head for the less threatened Zalivsky through the opening that had been made earlier. Initially everything went as planned. The Russians retreated from our heavy panzer strike. Today I can still see Oberst von Hunersdorf as we formed up for the breakout and rolled past him. In all his winter gear he stood at the turret of his command vehicle, and to each commander he called out encouragement. Scheibert, get on it now! Show what you can do! I heard him yell out to me. We soon reached open terrain. Looking back, I saw the supply lorries and other wheeled vehicles scattered far apart, disappearing at high speed behind the gently rolling terrain. The drivers in their unarmored cabs had my sympathy, but under our protection almost all were able to reach the protection of the village of Selivsky. Only a few fell prey to enemy tanks and anti-tank guns. After turning off and reassembling our four companies, we nevertheless understood that we faced a strong enemy, a foe whom we could not surprise, and one who could take us under fire at long distances. The distances were too great for our five centimetres to score any kills. To have any effect on a T-34, we would have to be under one thousand metres away. Thus, in the first phase of the battle, only the heavy fourth company with its 7.5 centimetre cannons could score any kills. Aware of the situation, the battle group commander ordered the heavy company, 8th Company, which was still in the village, to follow after us. On the other hand, we tried again and again to surround the enemy in a pincer movement, but each time the enemy was always a step ahead. What developed was a lopsided front, one that wandered slowly toward the northwest, which, after incorporating 8th Company, had a width of about 8 kilometers. Finally, a ravine, north of Hill 95.6, 
prevented any further extension toward the left. Amid losses on both sides, we initially succeeded in pushing the enemy back, but soon enough we found ourselves facing a heavy anti-tank force that completely showered us with salvo fires. The Russians worked according to a system of which they were the proven masters. It appeared that every tank towed an anti-tank gun, and initially the crew would be riding on the tank. When taking fire, they jumped off and acted as an infantry force. When the German defence grew too strong for their tanks, they hooked up their anti-tank guns and moved back under the protection of the tanks. Then they either created a new formation or tried to surround us from the other side. It was this game that we faced over again, in which their anti-tank guns grew increasingly miserable to deal with. In comparison, the Russian tanks were smaller targets than ours. They were almost invisible due to good camouflage, and they shot better than our panzers. So it went, back and forth all morning. If we obscured the Russian tanks in order to quickly move in for a more favourable shooting distance, by the time the smoke lifted, we would find ourselves facing a most unpleasant anti-tank front. When we managed to set a Russian tank or two on fire, due mostly to the work of our heavy companies, these successes only brought us losses and no victories worth mentioning. The entire horizon to the north and east was filled with Russian tanks and anti-tank fronts. Yellow muzzle flashes lit the air, and everywhere clouds of black smoke hung over burning panzers, within both their lines and our own. It was like a sea battle, with a series of attacks followed by withdrawals, so vast in scale that an overall perspective was not possible. Much anti-tank fire was quieted by high explosive fragmentation shells, yet the Russians appeared to have inexhaustible reserves. It was clear that the third Russian tank army was in full deployment against us. By radio came the most drastic attack orders, and again and again either Oberst von Hunersdorf, Major Dr. Becker, or our personal commitment led us to the enemy. All the while our ammunition grew scarcer, and in the end we were only using high-explosive fragmentation shells. It was a chaotic scene, with about one hundred German panzers, including the ones in Verkhnyakumsky, against about three hundred Russian tanks and countless anti-tank weapons. The snow whirled around us. Enemy rounds left long black streaks on the white steppe. Between our frequent changes of direction and the uniformity of the terrain, we had lost all sense of compass points. I could only sense my neighbours. From the light of the flares, I could now and again determine where my commander was located. Companies enmeshed with one another, and at long ranges vehicle identification was sometimes difficult, and it seemed at times that we were bombarding our own side. Because of our reports that ammunition was running dry, and Lerva's reports of heavy defensive battles in Verkhnyakumsky, we were called back at around 1100 hours, and regrouped in a low, protected area about three kilometres west of Verkhnyakumsky. I also had to leave behind some disabled vehicles from my own company, along with the leader of my first platoon, Lieutenant Bonke, although we were able to rescue the crew. Between our position and the village, we could see unaided that the Russians were moving toward Verkhnyakumsky in a thick convoy of tanks, anti-tank guns and infantry, without being at all concerned with us, although we lay clearly within their sight range. It was bizarre. From the direction of the village came some sounds of battle. We were feeling emotionally crushed, nearly beaten, and had had no significant successes, and added to this was the image of a mass of Russians who would just not quit coming. Between anger and loss, despair and anxiety, we felt overwhelmed. But in the meantime, what had happened in Verkhnyakumsky? Battle Group Hunersdorf Radio Traffic 10.30 hours. Radio message from Lerva. Request for immediate help. Enemy is in front of the village with 20 to 30 tanks. 10.50 hours. Radio message from Lerva. Requesting permission to clear area. If no help soon, Verkhnyakumsky cannot hold. 11.10 hours. Radio message from Lerva. Now also under attack from the north. Request permission to clear out of the village, moving toward the west. 11.20 hours. Radio message to Lerva. Stand fast. We're coming. 11.35 hours. Radio message to division. Verkhnyakumsky is under attack from all sides. Must break off battle in order to relieve Verkhnyakumsky. 
11.50 hours. Radio message from Lerva. Extreme emergency. Enemy in the village. When is Baker getting here? We can't hold out much longer. 1200 hours. Radio message to division. Verkhnir Kumsky lost. Attacking despite little ammunition. 1300 hours. Radio message from division. If Verkhnir Kumsky can't hold, clear out and return to Bridgehead. Hold Bridgehead at any price. 1320 hours. Radio message to division. Verkhnir Kumsky retaken. Clear out as per orders due to lack of ammunition. 1435 hours. Radio message from division. Is it possible to hold Verkhnir Kumsky if ammo is replenished? 1435 hours. Radio message to division. Verkhnir Kumsky is already vacated as per orders. War Diary of 11th Panzer Regiment. 1100 hours. Just at the moment the enemy appears to be weakening, Major Lerva reports attacks from the east on Verkhnir Kumsky by some 20 T 34s. At 11.10 hours, Lerva reports, now under attack from the north as well, request permission to move out of the village to the west. Becker, on the other hand, went into battle not fully resupplied with ammunition, now reports lack of ammunition due to the heavy expenditure. Therefore, the commander decides to cease the attack and return to Verkhnir Kumsky to support Lerva, who is under threat. At 11.20 hours, Remlinger reports new heavy attacks by tanks from the north against the bridgehead, and that the resupply route to Serlivsky is disrupted. Lerva reports breach by Russian forces into the village, and his calls for help more urgent. 1200 hours. After a short halt in the advance, the commander attacks from the west in a broad wedge, despite lack of ammunition. Thanks mainly to his decisive, high-speed attack, he wins the battle quickly, and retakes the village which had previously been lost, except for a group of houses in which Lerva had stopped with the remainder of his forces. Report by Commander, 6th, 11th Panzer Regiment, continued. Then two things happened that brought us back to life. First, Oberst von Hunisdorf arrived in his panzer right in the middle of us all, pulled his headset angrily from his head and roared at us. This is the only way to describe it. This is supposed to be my regiment? You call those attacks? This is a day of shame! And so forth. We were quite irritated about this talking to, no matter how well we knew and loved his tough manner. Although we respected him greatly, not least because of his personal commitment, we believed he was treating us unfairly. He had been our commander for too short a time to be able to pass such judgment on us. Major Dr. Becker, commander of 2nd 11th Panzer Regiment, defended us, but the tension remained in the air, and our anxiety grew visibly. The second thing that happened was the repeated urgent call for help from Major Lerva, commander of 1st 11th Panzer Regiment, from Verkhnekumsky, which brought us to our next task. Anyone who knew the old warrior, Major Lerva, knew this radio message was serious, if he had thought there was the smallest chance of holding Verkhnir Kumsky, not one call for help would have passed his lips. Oberst von Hunersdorf and Major Dr. Becker immediately called us commanders together, briefed us on the situation, and ordered us to break through into Verkhnir Kumsky on the double at all costs. It was a matter of freeing our regimental comrades, clearing the village of enemy, and rescuing all wounded. For this, the few panzers that still had ammunition were to take the lead and the remaining panzers, with the still abundant machine-gun ammunition, were to shoot wildly in hopes of creating panic. And so it happened that Major Dr. Berker led us forward, two companies in front, three behind. The tank tracks kicked up snow, which whirled around us. We were in a wild mood, and if it had made any sense at that moment, we would have shouted, Hurrah! We shot at every target that presented itself, and as long as the machine-guns lasted, any Russian tank that stood up to us was shot by our lead vehicles, using rounds that the crews had saved up for this moment. Russian infantry fled in all directions, probably thinking us insane. But we succeeded, and in a very short time we were in the village, and, as best I remember, without casualties. My only terrifying moment was when several T-34s suddenly appeared to my right from a depression in the terrain at about two hundred metres. I saw them direct their guns at me, but, having no ammunition, 
I sat in the turret expecting to be shot any second. Then the vehicle closest to me was hit by a 7.5 centimeter round on the front of the turret, so that it just lit up. It immediately rolled backwards and disappeared into the ravine. When the next one caught fire, the others turned back. Soon we were in the middle of the village, and there we found the staff of 1st 11th Panzer Regiment. Almost every officer was wounded, and all around us were burning panzers, both ours and Russian, sometimes standing nose to nose. I was ordered by Major Baker to proceed to the eastern edge of the village. Every house was on fire. In the streets all around us lay the dead and wounded. Reaching the eastern edge of the village, I saw Russian infantry fleeing up the slope on the opposite side. In between times we pursued with our machine guns. From the hills to the east several Russian tanks fired on the village. We could not touch them as we had no ammunition left. From the impacts and metallic pinging on the armor of our vehicles, we knew we were still being fired on from some of the buildings around us. Not far away I saw two German wounded lying in a gully, who beckoned to me with feeble hands. I thought about how I could rescue them and take them with me without placing others in danger, when my gunner pointed out to me that to my left the company commander of First Company, Hauptmann Hofmeier, was attempting to rescue wounded men. He was on foot, as his vehicle had probably been shot. I tried to get his attention, but then he made a leap into the village road, fatally wounded, and collapsed. Seeing this approach wasn't going to work, I called other panzers from my company and formed a square as a shield against enemy fire. In this manner I succeeded in retrieving these and other wounded. Due to the extra human cargo we could barely move in the turret. A short time later a panzer IV came up alongside, 7.5 centimetres long, and took out an enemy tank on the eastern hill. From the number I recognised the command panzer of 4th Company. As empty shells were being thrown from the side ports in the turrets, I recognised Hauptmann Wils, who waved to me, apparently having also recognised my panzer's number. We continued firing to give the troops behind us the chance to rescue anything that could be rescued. The Russians were once more on the attack, having recovered from their earlier shock. Suddenly, however, the Panzer IV turned off and drove back into the village. Later I discovered that during another round of discarding empty shells, Hauptmann Wils had been killed by an incoming burst of fire. Meanwhile, the other vehicles and the grenadiers in the mountain of wounded had not been idle. I received orders to slowly return to the west side of the village, as I would not have been able to remain standing still for long with no ammunition. As I appeared with my company at the point where we had broken through, I was confronted with a sad image. The entire battle group, Hunersdorf, stood ready for the breakout to Salivsky. At the head was one combat-ready company, behind it the ambulance vehicles loaded with lightly wounded, followed by the infantry SPW, behind whose armoured plates lay the seriously wounded. At the end was 8th Company, commanded by Oberstleutnant Ranzinger. I transferred wounded men from my company, still hidden, to the group of wounded men. I was then ordered to take 8th Company and stall the Russians as long as possible, and to blow up and destroy anything that could fall into their hands. We were allowed several minutes so that we could provide cover to one another, long enough to fill our tanks with the remaining stored fuel, and to pull the little ammunition that remained from the disabled tanks. War Diary of 11th Panzer Regiment On orders from division we vacate the village according to plan. Group Hunersdorf retreats southwards under the cover of darkness in order to conserve materiel. The day cost the regiment many lives. Two officers dead, four officers wounded, one officer missing. Especially hard is the loss of Hauptmann Hofmeier and Hauptmann Wils, both of whom fought with high valour to the end. Breaking off from the enemy goes relatively well. Although the route was bombarded from the west, we succeeded in bringing the supply convoys and the drivable panzers back to Salivsky. An attack by enemy tanks and infantry at the bridgehead in the evening is repulsed. Radio Messages 1600 Hours Radio Message to Division Daily Report Assets Report 23 enemy tanks hit Several anti-tank guns destroyed. Enemy infantry incurred heavy losses. Our losses, dead, two officers, Hauptmann Hofmeier, Hauptmann Wils, 
17 NCOs and soldiers, wounded, four officers, Major Löwe, Oberstleutnant Hiesen, Oberstleutnant Berges, Stabsalmeister, Staff Paymaster, Röchter, 20 NCOs and soldiers, missing, Oberstleutnant Ernsting. Hunnersdorf still unhurt, Panzer badly shot up. Requests. Requesting suitable commander for 1st 11th Panzer Regiment. Suggestion. Hauptmann Glesken. Panzer Report. 6-21-7-5-2. Out of service for mechanical issues, 5. Total out of service, 1 Panzer 2, 2 cm. 13 Panzer 3, 5 cm. 5 Panzer 4, 7.5 cm. Report on the retreat by Commander 6th 11th Panzer Regiment. At nightfall the long convoy began to move. I had to stay in the village until the vanguard reached certain points in the process in the march back to Salivsky. I was then picked up by 8th Company, which was running security further to the rear at Hill 147.0. There I remained, my cannons pointed to the rear, until the company that I was to follow had rolled past me about three kilometres in the direction of Selivsky and waited for me again. In this manner we provided cover for one another. After the vanguard of the convoy had got through the ring around Selivsky, I finally received orders to follow after them in a convoy. Incomprehensibly, the enemy did not pursue us. I still only had contact while in the village, so that I was able to keep to the schedule and break away from the enemy. It was not until just before Salivsky, in total darkness, that we ran into problems. From both right and left of the road, mostly from the right, west side, came flashes of light. Not four hundred metres away stood Russian tanks, which had probably heard the noises from our tank tracks and were creating a defensive barrier. They didn't trust themselves to come any nearer, however, and without any vehicle being affected by the illumination flares that sizzled around us, I reached Selivsky at lightning speed. It was also probably eerie for the Russians. Barely had we arrived when we were immediately deployed as security at the bridgehead's front. Along with 8th Company, my defence sector was the west part of Selivsky. We didn't have to wait long, for soon we had T-34s in front of us. In the light of the grenadiers' flares, we could see no more than two hundred metres in front of us. Their winter camouflage flashed bright white. Two of them were immediately set on fire when the firefight began. Then attack after attack went on all night long. In the light of burning houses and haystacks, we fought the Russians off repeatedly. We were no longer short on ammunition, so on this night the cannon bores barely cooled down. A hard day for the regiment. What had become perfectly clear was that the German Panzer III, five centimetres long, was no match for an enemy that was attacking mostly with T-34s. That day we saw that with panzers alone, any forward progress against this opponent was not going to be possible. We would have to go at him systematically with artillery and air support. Reports to this effect were sent to the senior office, the 57th Panzer Corps under command of General of Panzer Troops Kirchner. Verkhnia Kumsky was lost. Had the Russians decided more quickly, and if they had gone after our retreat lines to Zalivsky, which they absolutely could have done, it would have meant catastrophe for battle group Hunersdorf, which had almost no ammunition. And so, despite all the losses, the combat vehicles that had meanwhile been put back into service amounted to about one hundred panzers. Here around Zalivsky was enough artillery to spoil any Russian attacks. To remain on the defensive with these forces was contradictory to the mission and tactics of the German commanders. So the decision was made to launch a renewed panzer raid only two days later in the direction of Werchner Kumsky, in conjunction with the panzer forces of the 23rd Panzer Division, 201st Panzer Regiment. The next day, 16th December 1942, was set for fortifying the front at Aksai and establishing contact with the 23rd Panzer Division leaving the Russians on their own for the time being. Wehrmacht Report of 16th December 1942 Excerpt Between the Volga and Don, German and Romanian troops stormed several well-defended villages, fiercely defeating counterattacks. 16th December 1942 Fortifying the Aksai Front 
Map 10 War Diary of 11th Panzer Regiment Selivsky, 16th December 1942 The intent for the 16th is Hold the bridgehead while Group Unrhein attacks the enemy at his western flank at Vodyansky. This is to neutralise the threat to our flank. Regiment leaves for the hill two kilometres north of the bridge and arrives after a short battle with enemy tanks, during which two are destroyed. At 1200 hours, enemy sends reconnaissance from the north to scout out the situation. From the west, ten tanks attack with riflemen, which were fought off after a hard battle, during which four T-34s, nine anti-tank guns were destroyed. We made contact with our neighbour to the right, the 201st Panzer Regiment, and set up communications. Our reconnaissance reports strong enemy position with anti-tank guns on Hill 147.0. At nightfall, the regiment is brought back to the starting position at the bridgehead. During the commander's conference in the evening, a renewed attack on Verkhnyakumsky is ordered to take place in conjunction with the 201st Panzer Regiment. We are to take Verkhnyakumsky from the west. Leaving at 0500 hours, we advance from Klikova toward the east as far north as Shestakov. From there we turn north, onto divided road through the Neklinskaya ravine as far as the intersection one kilometre west of hill 146.9. Here we are to turn off to the west, capture the enemy field positions on hill 147.0 from their flank and rear, and capture Verkhnekumsky from the west. No other approaches to the village have proven to be possible for German panzers. Battlegroup Hunersdorf Radio Traffic 0645 hours. Radio message to division. Assembled at the hill two kilometres north of the bridge. 0800 hours. Radio message to division. Established communications with Heidebrack, Commander, 201st Panzer Regiment. 1200 hours. Radio message to division. Destroyed anti-tank gun position with four T-34s, nine anti-tank guns, including one 7.62, a 76.2 in American and British nomenclature, and eight lorries. Our losses? Three tanks. One totaled. Report on the retreat by Commander 6th 11th Panzer Regiment. The morning of 16th December found us in an attack that had been well prepared by our artillery. Amid very high enemy losses, we pushed as far as two kilometres forward and secured the area from a high elevation point with a clear overview of the steppe. From these positions, over the course of the day, we were able to perform various missions. During one of these raids, together with Hauptmann Gericke, commander of 7th Company, I stumbled on an anti-tank defence position. But the Russians were shooting so badly that, with 7th Company's fire support, I dared a frontal attack. I got my track guards shot off, and two other panzers of my company were damaged, with the vehicle of Ufitz, Sergeant Pertgen, losing half of his cannon mantlet, sending shards flying. But, despite the damage, we reached the enemy in a quick final pass and overran him. After we had driven through all the defensive nests and had shot into their openings, I jumped behind some panzers. We were held under fire from a Russian position to the northwest. That day I found an undamaged jeep, an American make, tied it to my panzer and towed it behind me. Later on I had a great deal of fun with it. Slowly all grew quiet. Apparently the Russians had pulled back their units for recuperation. The great panzer battle ended with no decisive win either way. As it turned out, few of the enemy tanks had followed us as we left Verkhnyakumsky. We had always met the Russian attacks with a sharp rebuff and, moreover, their attacks had also lost their previous toughness. Careful estimates indicated that in the past days the Russians had a total of 180 tanks completely destroyed from both tank divisions at the front. In the same time period, our regiment had 21 totaled tanks, with all others back in combat condition after a few days. Battlegroup Hunersdorf Radio Traffic 1415 hours Radio message to division at nightfall I am taking panzers back to the perimeter of Zalivsky village and leaving combat outposts on the hills, reoccupying at daybreak unless ordered otherwise. 1600 hours. Radio message to division. We reached the ordered objective, the hills three kilometres north of the bridgehead, 
after a short battle against enemy tanks on both riverbanks. Enemy deployed reconnaissance from the north with tanks and from the west attacked with ten tanks and riflemen. He was beaten back, having lost four T-34s, nine anti-tank guns, and eight lorries. Along with the 201st Panzer Regiment, three kilometres northwest of W in the morning, communications established. At nightfall, the infantry combat outposts left at map contour line, while the majority of the reinforced regiment spent the night providing security directly on the perimeter of the village. Command post Hunersdorf in Salivsky. Enemy assessment? Majority of the enemy with numerous tanks at Vyachnyakumsky. Security at the map contour line both sides of 147.0. The 16th of December was a relatively quiet day except for the expansion of our bridgehead to the north and the various forays by our panzer forces starting from that line. The time was used to repair and deliver restored panzers, which meant every company returned to a reasonable fighting strength. It was surprising to note that the stronger Russian tank units showed little activity and did not make an appearance. During the course of the afternoon, the commander's conference took place, as was mentioned in the war diary. During this time, the weaker 201st Panzer Regiment, under command of Oberstleutnant von Heidebreck, and reinforced by several other units from the 23rd Panzer Division, was placed under battlegroup Hunersdorf. Orders were issued for the combined advance on 17th December. The order follows in its original form. Orders issued. Battlegroup von Hunersdorf, 16th December 1942. To Regiment Heidebreck. Heidebreck, supported by an SPW battalion, one artillery battalion, and one heavy anti-aircraft battery, is assigned to Hunersdorf. On 17th December, at 0500 hours, Hunersdorf will advance from S. Selivsky by way of K.O. Klikova East, to the east section of the Neklinskaya Ravine, on the southern slope of Hill 146.9. From there they are to advance west, destroy the enemy tanks positioned south of Verkhnekumsky, and take Verkhnekumsky from the west. Simultaneously, the reinforced 6th Reconnaissance Battalion from S. Selivsky will advance northwards to tie down the tank forces positioned south of Verkhnekumsky. After the capture of Verkhnekumsky, Hunesdorf's mission is to go around Sagotskot from the east, advance to Gramoslavka, capture it, and hold open the bridge across the Mushkova River for the units that will follow. Heidebreck will hold open the passage either across or east of the Neklinskaya Ravine for Hunersdorf, and in this manner will be placed in front of Hunersdorf. The routes of advance through and east of the Neklinskaya will be scouted well in advance, along with reconnaissance in the direction of Gromoslavka. As of 0515 hours, signalers must stand ready to guide most of Hunersdorf. I will be in S. Salivsky, as of 0500 hours, at the head of the main body of Hunersdorf. Signed, von Hunersdorf. With Stuka support arranged, and the 17th Panzer Division finally assembled, a major advance in the direction of Generalovsky was planned for 17th December. This would relieve the threat to 6th Panzer Division's left flank, and allow Group Zollenkopf, at this time still positioned south of the Aksai, to be released for other missions. The following days promised to be more successful. Wehrmacht Report of 17th December 1942 Excerpt In attacks supported by combat air units, German and Romanian troops pushed the enemy further back between the Volga and Don. At the large bend of the Don River, they fought off repeated attacks from strong forces, sometimes in counter-attacks, and destroyed some thirty Soviet tanks. 17th December 1942. The first failed attack on Verkhnyakumsky. Map 11. War diary of 11th Panzer Regiment. 0800 hours. The departure is delayed for about one hour, as Heidebreck Regiment is not ready on time. At 0620 hours, the first enemy contact takes place north of Shestakova, where enemy tanks have broken through at the bridgehead of the 23rd Panzer Division. At 0715 hours, after destroying six enemy tanks, the advance continues. One company from Heidebreck is left behind in Shestakova to mop up, 
and four enemy tanks are destroyed there with no losses to our side. Battlegroup Hunersdorf, radio traffic. 0525 hours. Radio message to our battlegroup. Fall in. 0530 hours. Radio message from division. Attention. Enemy tanks from the northwest at Chestakova. 0550 hours. Radio message from division. 40 enemy tanks from Chestakova heading west. 0550 hours. Radio message to division. Hunersdorf has reached Klikova. 0603 hours. Radio message to division. Further advance from Klikova delayed because Heidebrecht hasn't left yet. 0620 hours. Radio message from division. Enemy tanks have broken through into Shestakova from north. 0650 hours. Radio message to division. Enemy tank advance from north in area two kilometers east of Klikova fended off. So far, two T-34s destroyed. 0712 hours. Radio message from Heidebreck. So far, six enemy tanks destroyed. 0725 hours. Radio message to division. Are any of our troops remaining in Chestakova? Otherwise, Stukas. 0728 hours. Radio message to division. Turn around at hill 66.5 kilometers east of Klikova and head north. 0805 hours. Radio message to division. Start of fighting directly south of Niklinskaya Ravine. At hill north of this, enemy tanks sighted. In Shestakova, still fighting. One of Heidebrecht's companies mopping up. So far, ten enemy tanks destroyed. Pushing further north. 0806 hours. Radio message from Heidebrecht. Arrived at Neklinskaya Ravine. 0810 hours. Radio message from division. Response to radio message at 0725 hours. In Shestakova, infantry of neighbor, 23rd Panzer Division. An enemy counterattack at the bridgehead of 23rd Panzer Division was successfully fended off. The attack cost the Russians 12 tanks, but delayed our advance by two hours, which would prove painful later on. The delay meant that we had to travel over the iced over Niklinskaya ravine so as to save time, a long detour that made us more vulnerable to attack, which, in turn, could divert us from the day's stated objective, Verkhnyakumsky. War Diary of 11th Panzer Regiment 1200 hours At 0850 hours, Vanguard arrives at the road intersection, one kilometre west of Hill 146.9, and comes upon a large enemy position with very strong tank defence and mines. The commander orders artillery to take positions and deploys 2nd 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment. At 0930 hours, the enemy position is captured and the area is strewn with Russian, question mark, anti-tank rifles. About 50 are captured. The 1st 11th Panzer Regiment takes over direct fire protection against the enemy tanks that were reported to be north of the ravine. They proved later to be the ones already destroyed on 14th December. At 1000 hours, the unit turns off to the west. At 1030 hours, 2nd 11th Panzer Regiment takes over security of north flank, where several enemy tanks are also scouting. At 11.50 hours, after a smooth forward advance, the group reaches Hill 147.0 on southern perimeter. Battlegroup Hunersdorf, radio traffic. 08.20 hours. Radio message to division. With elements on north map contour line of the ravine. Icy march conditions, very difficult. Captured so far are six heavy mortars, two anti-tank systems, five lorries, and several machine guns. 0850 hours. Radio message from Heidebreck. At Hill 146.9, enemy position with anti-tank rifles and mines. Request deployment of infantry and artillery so that I can continue attack. 0900 hours. Radio message to Cooper, Commander 2nd 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment. Cooper, vacate enemy position at 146.9. 0910 hours. Radio message from division. Strong enemy supply traffic from Zagatskot to Verkhnyakumsky. Air reconnaissance report. 0920 hours. Radio message to Becker and Heidebreck. Fifteen enemy tanks on advance from the west. Heidebreck and Becker firefront. Ten hundred hours. 
radio message to division. Holding enemy at road intersection west of 146.9, advancing en masse to attack toward the west. Ten hundred hours. Radio message from Cooper. Enemy anti-tank rifle position captured. Ten twenty hours. Radio message from division. Fifth Company, 11th Panzer Regiment, with seven tanks with Remlinger, will make contact with Hunelsdorf along with Quentin, Commander, 6th Reconnaissance Battalion. 10.26 hours. Radio message to Baker. Baker, provide flank protection at road intersection, toward north. 1100 hours. Radio message from Division. Kolchos 8M, Marta, large assembly of enemy motor vehicles. Kolchos 8M, Marta, is a location code. Marta is letter M. 1150 hours. Radio message to Division. Arrived 147.0. Report on retreat by Commander 6th 11th Panzer Regiment. Continued. With elements of the 23rd Panzer Division, we attacked toward the north, avoiding Sagat Scott, intending to retake Verkhnyakumsky. Simultaneously, the non-armoured elements pushed out from Salivsky towards the same destination. They were accompanied by the assault guns, Sturmgeschütz, that had been assigned them earlier by the division. After early successes, we ran across a strongly built-up defence position north of the Niklinskaya ravine. In shielding ourselves from this front, our attack had to head more to the west. With the help of the SPW battalion, we smoked out this position. At the same time, 1st 11th Panzer Regiment, along with the panzers of the 23rd Panzer Division, made a failed attempt to capture Sagat Scott. Our advance was thwarted, just as it had been in Verkhnyakumsky, by a whole system of defensive positions around the village. The position right in front of us also proved to be set up excellently. Very narrow and deep firing ports, occupied by a very tough enemy. No one surrendered, although we were located with the entire battalion in the middle of the enemy positions. The Russians would have to be shot out from their positions, one by one. As the ground was thoroughly dug up, any driving back and forth had to be avoided so as not to throw a track. Each panzer took on a certain share of firing ports which they had to monitor and wait for a Russian to appear from one of them. Peering out sideways through my observation slit, this was an eerie scene. The tanks stood like elephants with long stretched out trunks, as if sniffing at the earth. Finally, the infantry came with their SPWs and cleared out the entire system rather quickly under our protection. It was high time, too, because far off in the northern areas, the enemy tanks and anti-tank fronts, which were always better than us at aiming in, became uncomfortably visible. Our waiting panzers also offered an easy target, even for the worst anti-tank gunners. After neutralizing this position, we moved somewhat back into a reverse slope position and rejoined the firefight. Meanwhile, the artillery took on this anti-tank front, so we soon followed the other panzer units already positioned far to the west. So we took off, with security on our north side. Sagat Scott lay before us, and we ran through our old battlefield of 14th December, with all of its derelict Russian tanks. We were still under constant fire, although we could never properly see the enemy at the village perimeter of either Sagat Scott or Verkhnyakumsky. We managed to arrive at the attack on Verkhnyakumsky and had a second confrontation. The system of positions at the perimeter of the village, however, prevented us from breaking through. In addition to this, despite a preparation attack by the Stukas, the enemy defensive fire proved too strong. Enemy tanks appeared at our left flank and pulled us toward the north. Then, as we drove through the battlefield of 15th December, darkness fell. Our burned-out panzers still stood there, but we could not rescue them. The Russians tried to cut off our line of retreat. This time they proved very clever, and we had to escape in total darkness, zigging and zagging as we went. As was frequently the case, we were guided by illumination flares from the south, thanks to the grenadiers from our division that had finally pushed forward halfway to Verkhnyakumsky. The entire operation proved to be nothing more than a puff of air. War Diary of 11th Panzer Regiment 1800 Hours Due to terrain difficulties and the very slow clearing out of enemy positions at the road intersection, it is not possible to bring the infantry and artillery forward quickly enough. 
Because of the hour's delay, the commander decides to take full advantage of daylight and attack Werchner Kumsky without infantry and artillery. The attack, now only supported by Stukas, runs into tough defensive fire, and by 1350 hours is fought off. During the attack, darkness falls. This night attack, which had been ordered by the division, promises little success due to the badly worn panzer forces and the fact that there is only one battalion, not to mention that there is little ammunition and fuel available. The commander therefore decides, with the consent of the division, to retreat and regroup on the southeast slope of Hill 147.0. Due to navigational challenges and darkness, the group does not arrive at the collection point until 1730 hours. It is not until 2100 hours that the division orders the panzers to return to the original starting area. Battle Group Hunersdorf Radio Traffic 1230 hours Radio order to 1st 11th Panzer Regiment. Careful attention at Kolchos 8M. 1300 hours. Radio message from division. Hill 147.0 to 137.2 occupied enemy positions. 1335 hours. Radio message from division. 17th Panzer Division in battle for bridge at Generalovsky. 1335 hours. Radio message to Himmelsbach, Lerver's replacement as commander of 1st 11th Panzer Regiment. Leave the village, Kalchos 8M, alone. Your place is behind Heidebrecht's left flank. 1345 hours. Radio message to 1st 11th Panzer Regiment. Destroy enemy tanks and... Question mark, at the left flank of Heidebrecht. 1420 hours. Radio message to division. Our first attack on Verkhnekumsky was fended off by extremely strong anti-tank guns. Stuka attack had no effect. Several panzers destroyed. 1445 hours. Radio message to division. Gathering west of Verkhnekumsky for another attack if it is still light enough. 1500 hours. Radio message from division. At 1400 hours, Quentin began advancing on Verkhnekumsky. 1520 hours. Radio message from division. Take the village with dismounted grenadiers under artillery and panzer protection. 1545 hours. Radio message to division. Due to darkness, attack will not be renewed. Group assembled at 147.0. Suggestion. Return to start position and carry out resupply. 1600 hours. Radio message to division. Message from 1520 hours not put through until nightfall. Night attack with only one battalion promises no success, considering enemy strength. 1605 hours. Radio message to division. Decision requested as to whether night attack is to be carried out. 1630 hours. Radio message to division. Lost forward air control officer with radio station, as well as Heidebrecht's radio station from direct hit. 1730 hours. Radio message to division. Renewed preparations undertaken at 147.0. Renewed tank attack not possible due to darkness. Strong occupation in Sagat Skod, Verkhnekumsky and Kalchos 8M. 1800 hours. Radio message from division. Location of panzers and both SPW battalions. Author's note. 6th Reconnaissance Battalion also had SPWs some of the time. 1855 hours. Radio message to division. Location is southeast slope, hill 147.0. Unknown hours. Radio message to division. Day's report. Successfully repulsed a strong tank advance at Chistakova with quick, determined action, throwing enemy back across Niklinskaya ravine toward the north, also capturing the hills north of there. After breaking through the very stubborn resistance from field positions at Hill 146.9 and west of there, we drove past Hill 147.0, always in a quick forward push toward the west, overrunning numerous anti-tank guns and fighting off tanks. Then we launched enveloping attack from the west on Verkhnekumsky. Our artillery was still not in place and the grenadiers remained behind. The tanks attacked in order to take full advantage of daylight. Due to extraordinarily strong defensive fighting, despite Stuka attacks, 
the Russians fended off our attack. During preparations for a renewed attack, darkness fell. The preparations for a possible night attack on 147.0 were postponed in order to refuel and reload ammunition. Captured slash destroyed. Eleven tanks destroyed. Fifteen lorries. One armoured reconnaissance vehicle. Speerwagen destroyed. Numerous infantry weapons captured. Ten anti-tank guns. Fifty anti-tank rifles destroyed. Six trench mortars. Granatenwerfer destroyed. One hundred prisoners of war brought in. Out of service. Fourteen panzers. Number of salvaged panzers undetermined. Ten SPWs. Losses. Killed. Forward air control officer. Three NCOs and soldiers. Wounded. Twenty-six NCOs and soldiers. This day of attacks, essentially unsuccessful attacks, had something to teach us. Regardless of the particulars of the enemy situation, it was now seen that a systematically constructed attack could cut a swath into this strong enemy. Working with combined arms against a tough, defensive enemy proved insufficient. Once more, as had happened earlier on the Aksai, an iced-over ravine hindered the arrival of supporting troops, so that even in daylight it was not possible to arrange a coordination of all weapons to face this most important target. It seems incomprehensible that the grenadier forces advancing north from the positions north of Salivsky were unable to coordinate with the panzers that were coming from the east for their arrival at Verkhnekumsky. The very short Stuka attack, although helpful in its timely execution, showed little effectiveness against the deeply dug-in enemy. Once more the Russians demonstrated their gift for digging in very quickly and very deeply, even in the worst weather conditions, such as frozen ground. Furthermore, the Russian positions out in the middle of open terrain, for example road intersection 146.9, showed their preference for less populated villages compared to the Germans, regardless of cold weather. For 18th December, therefore, an artillery and air attack was ordered from positions near 147.0 on Verkhnekumsky. The Panzer Regiment was to break through into the village and attack the enemy in its weakened condition. On the same day they were also to capture bridges on the Mushkova river sector. On this evening, Battlegroup Hunersdorf presented a very sad appearance, both materially and physically. This is depicted in the last paragraph of the war diary of 11th Panzer Regiment for 17th December. War Diary of 11th Panzer Regiment Because of the uninterrupted deployments of the past days, which have left no opportunity for maintaining vehicles, the deployment readiness of the regiment has sharply fallen. But also the crews, who, since 11th December, have had no roof over their heads and barely any time to sleep, are much exhausted. Under these conditions, a renewed deployment on the next day promises little success, and in the opinion of the commander, will only cost an unnecessary loss of resources, which would be incommensurate with the goals that have been set, as has been demonstrated in the recent days. Wehrmacht Report of 18th December 1942 Excerpt Between the Volga and the Don, German divisions penetrated strongly held enemy positions on a dominating mountain range, and by this attack gained further territory. 18th December 1942. The second failed attack on Verkhnekumsky. Map 12. Battlegroup Zollenkopf had been freed up when 17th Panzer Division took over their sector. Now it was they who were ordered to attack Verkhnekumsky, with support from other of the division's forces, including two panzer companies from 11th Panzer Regiment. War Diary of 11th Panzer Regiment. Salivsky. 18th December, 1942. For today the Panzer Regiment remains available to the division, with orders to first penetrate the resistance, then pursue the enemy. The morning passes amid constant deployment preparations with technical service. After Group Zollenkopf makes good forward progress, the regiment is ordered to the southeast slope of Hill 147.0 to be able to defend against the enemy tanks at the group's flank and rear. They move into the assembly area at 12.30 hours. Against the objections of the regimental commander during the night, the division orders two panzer companies to deploy as direct support for Group Zollenkopf, one on each flank. The two companies support the panzer grenadiers in an outstanding manner. 
But by 1200 hours, due to damage from anti-tank weapons, mines, and mechanical breakdowns, they are so weakened that the division requests they be sent back, especially because they shot up all their ammunition and only have two combat-ready vehicles left. The division makes it known that according to a wire-tapped Russian radio message, the defenders of Verkhnekumsky have been designated as guards by Stalin, a sign that the Russians, too, recognize the dangerous potential of our advance. A deployment of the regiment will no longer be necessary today. After several requests by the commander for permission to bring the panzers back to the starting position for further maintenance, a retreat order is issued at 1750 hours. The panzer count is still 8 slash 25 slash 13 slash 5 slash 6. This means that now the entire regiment amounts to only one much weakened battalion. For the next day, however, there are still some panzers expected to come out of maintenance. Battle Group Hunersdorf Radio Traffic 1200 hours Radio message to division Moved into assembly area east of 147.0 1220 hours Radio message to division Request withdrawal of Panzer Support Company Panzer Unterstützungs Kompanie Assigned to House Schild As only two vehicles and no ammunition are left 1400 hours Message from division Stalin has named the defenders of Verkhnekumsky as guards. 1510 hours. Radio message to division. Request permission to pull in for repairs at north boundary of Salivsky, as no more opportunity to attack due to darkness. 1600 hours. Radio message from division. Wait for order, as termination situation is unclear. 1610 hours. Radio message to division. Daily report. Preparation for attack at 147.0 to prevent an enemy counterattack at the flank of Group Zollenkopf. Panzer count 8 slash 25 slash 13 slash 5 slash 6. Losses dead Oberstleutnant Böhm 1 NCO. Out of service 3 Panzer 3s. 1730 hours. Radio message to Division 6. I consider any further waiting around here an unnecessary waste of resources and a serious disregard for maintenance. 1745 hours. Radio message from division. Return to starting position. 1750 hours. Radio message to division. Retreating. Despite all artillery support and various breaches into the exterior system of positions around Verkhnekumsky, we failed to capture the village. The enemy had brought forth all of his toughness and tenacity. During the night, the grenadiers remained close to the enemy, in the positions they had already taken, planning to spearhead a new attack next morning. Reinforcements were brought forward, air support authorized, Stukas, and the 17th Panzer Division was instructed by the Corps to expand their bridgeheads across the Aksai at Generalovsky in the area of Kolchos 8M, and west of there, on 19th December, eliminating a possible flank threat during the coming assault on Verkhnekumsky. Battle Group Hunersdorf, consisting of the 11th Panzer Regiment and the SPW Battalion, 2nd 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, received the following mission for 18th December. Capture Verkhnekumsky and then pursue the retreating enemy as far as the Mishkova sector, without regard for the flank. Editor's Note This paragraph is placed as in the original book, though chronologically out of order. Wehrmacht Report of 19th December, 1942 Excerpt Despite tough resistance, German and Romanian troops threw the enemy further backward toward the northeast, between the Volga and Don. 19th December, 1942 The Breakthrough at Vasilievka Map 13 War Diary of 11th Panzer Regiment on 19th December, the attack by Group Zollenkopf continues. At about 1100 hours, we take Vertnokumsky from the east and west. The Grenadiers greatly benefited from the attack by the Panzer Regiment from the 17th Panzer Division, which had joined them on their left. The regiment, which launched its attack southeast of 147.0 yesterday at 0700 hours, is now in pursuit of the enemy on his northward retreat, as Division believes enemy is wearing down. 1530 hours. 
After advancing smoothly, hampered only by difficulties in terrain, the regiment is brought to a halt and ordered to turn off to the west. Regiment starts out again at 13.20 hours, now ordered to cross the road intersection one kilometer west of 146.9, west of the Solenaya ravine to Vasilyevka, and to construct a bridgehead there. At 14.40 hours, facing strong enemy positions north of the road intersection, they retreat. At 15.25 hours, Central European time, in the darkness, they overrun a strong anti-tank position south of the road intersection, and, after a short battle, they are able to break through. Battle Group Hunersdorf Radio Traffic 12.22 hours Radio message to division Not able to turn off to the right if I don't know where I am supposed to go. Author's Note This message came in response to division's orders to break off the advance by way of Verkniakumski and Sagat Scott, and to pursue the enemy eastwards. 13.20 hours Radio message to division. Hunersdorf arrived at 146.9. Crossed road Sagat Scott Selivsky. 1440 hours. Radio message to division. From 146.9 to Ravine, three kilometers west of Sagat Scott, strong position with dug in anti tank guns. In addition, eight tanks sighted so far. Turning south, hill 146.9. 1450 hours. Radio message from division. 23rd Panzer Division under strong attack at its bridgehead, coming from the direction of Shivkaya Ravine southwards. By order from Corps staff, as long as there is no immediate flank threat, under no circumstances will Battle Group Hunelsdorf be permitted to turn off and move south. Capturing the bridgehead of Vasilevka is of crucial significance. Group Zollenkopf is ordered to immediately release Battalion Hausschild along with a battery and anti-aircraft gun, and have them follow Battle Group Hunersdorf. When Battalion Hausschild arrives, it will be placed under command of Battle Group Hunersdorf. Regiment staff of 114th will also follow immediately, and will place their two Panzer Grenadier battalions under command of Hunersdorf. Artillery will follow as soon as possible. 1455 hours. Radio message to division. Location west of 146.9, 3 kilometers, taking fire from the south. Due to darkness, targets cannot be seen well. 15.25 hours. Radio message to division. Have broken through enemy position south of 146.9. Enemy retreating northward. 16.05 hours. Radio message to division. Location 6 kilometers east of D. Hill 146.9. 1645 hours. Radio message from division. Just keep on riding. Fourth Husserenreiter. 1730 hours. Radio message from division. Honoring today's victory. Expect pursuit by all possible means into the night hours. Signed, von Manstein. Finally, Verkniakumski was in German hands again, as was Sagat Scott. The enemy units fled, and Battlegroof Hunersdorf immediately pursued them between the two villages and on to the open plain, overrunning them easily and taking them all prisoner en masse. In the middle of this push, however, the commander was ordered to turn off east toward the familiar Hill 146.9, and on further to the Mishkova sector near the village of Vasilevka, and to set up a bridgehead there. This objective lay at a distance of about 30 kilometers and even without enemy contact, it was clear they could not reach this location before nightfall. The unit quickly regrouped and departed. Report by Commander, 6th, 11th Panzer Regiment, continued. During the battle for Verkniakumski, the 17th Panzer Division was to the left, and at last in the position to take on the task of flank protection, freeing up other forces for further attacks. Everything was to be concentrated on Verkniakumski, the attack was deliberate and systematic, and because the individual enemy positions were known, the Stuka units were well guided as they flew in and found their targets. The grenadiers, supported by assault guns, soon broke through into the village. Having been able to watch the show from three kilometers away, we panzers then came in from behind, passed through our own troops in a broad front, and encountered the fleeing enemy between Verkniakumski and Sagatskot. 
as we met no resistance, and the enemy had given up group by group, I forbade further shooting. We rounded them up using just our panzers, had them put down their weapons if they had not already done so, and sent them to the rear in a closed formation where they were received by grenadiers who guarded them closely. Sergeant Scott, too, was taken almost without a fight. At this moment the radio called us together, and we were briefed on our new task, to pursue as long as the fuel lasts. The first attack objective was Hill 146.9, which we were all familiar with. As part of 2nd Battalion I was in the lead. The day was coming to an end, and as I pushed towards Sagat Scott from the south, shortly before 146.9, I ran into fire. The entire eastern horizon lit up in front of me. Panzers were also visible in the dusk. Behind us the western sky was even brighter, so much so that we must have stood out on the horizon like practice targets. The battalion was ordered to attack immediately, which would allow the enemy positions to be detected by their gunfire. As casualties grew, the commander, Dr. Baker, broke off the battle and pulled us together behind a furrow in the earth for a new attack. In total darkness we pushed to the right, surrounding the enemy again. On the order of Major Dr. Baker, we carried out this attack very quickly without thinking about losses, and suddenly we were right in the middle of the enemy. The battle was brutal. The shots from the enemy blinded us badly, so that their tanks only appeared as shadows moving towards us. My panzer, probably like all others that had got through, shot at an extremely high rate of fire. Enemy tanks drove past us at ten metres. We had to be careful not to get rammed. Soon several tanks caught fire and illuminated the battlefield. Then we broke through and were once more in darkness and stillness. Behind us the steppe glowed with scattered fires and the shooting continued. Other companies kept fighting to enlarge the hole in the front, finally handing over the rest of the task to the grenadiers. Sadly I had dead and wounded in my company, along with mechanically disabled panzers that had lost their tracks while we were overrunning the enemy anti-tank guns. We regathered, and with Oberst von Hunersdorf and Major Dr. Baker at the furthest forward point of the advance, we moved on. The sky was clear that night, and I could tell by the stars that we were moving further and further toward the east. I only knew that, cost what it would, we still had to reach the crossing point at Mishkova that night. We were told that at this bridge we would meet up with our comrades who had broken out of the Stalingrad encirclement. This thought spurred us on all day. This breakthrough had succeeded, and our march to the Mishkova sector continued far into the night, in completely unfamiliar terrain and with little certainty of the enemy situation. War Diary of 11th Panzer Regiment 2200 Hours The march to the east takes place in moonlight, without concern for threats to the flank. Two small companies from Cooper Battalion, 2nd 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, which lagged somewhat further behind the remainder of the battalion, ran into an enemy counter-attack and remained waiting at the road intersection, together with the elements that had been following them. Group Zollenkopf, which is under command of Group Hunersdorf, consists of 1st 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, Commander Major Hausschild, 1st 4th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, Commander Major Remlinger, 1st 76th Artillery Regiment, and anti-aircraft and anti-tank guns. It does not reach Hill 130.0 until very late. Without prospects of an immediate arrival of these units, and with the realization that the fuel would only last as far as the expected attack position, the commander himself, who is not more than the third or fourth vehicle back from the vanguard, recklessly decides to continue on to reach the attack position. In order to retain the element of surprise, all firing is prohibited. The original plan was to turn north at the road intersection two kilometres west of 157.0, but the units miss this turn-off and move on further east. Here they have to contend with terrain difficulties caused by the ravines, but at 18.25 hours they reach an intersection two kilometres north of Gilo Aksaiskaya, and from there they are able to turn north. Along this road are heavily occupied enemy positions which they slipped through thanks to the calm guidance of the leader of the vanguard, Oberstleutnant Michaelis. Despite this and other challenges caused by the iced-over ravines, 
they surprisingly reach the bridge and cross the river. At 2200 hours, they capture the bridge intact. At the northern exit of Vasilyevka, they run into their first active enemy resistance, infantry and tanks. It is here that Mikhailis is killed in action. Battle Group Hunersdorf Radio Traffic 1750 hours. Radio message to division. Cannot advance on the roads in ice-covered ravine, making new attempt by sweeping around eastwards. 1805 hours. Radio message to division. Solenkopf isn't responding. Please convince him to follow as quickly as possible. 1845 hours. Radio message to division. On main road from south to the objective. 1922 hours. Radio message from division. Solenkopf with Hausschild and Remlinger, Schultz, 1st 76th Artillery Regiment. Anti-aircraft and anti-tank guns at 1800 hours, reported from Hill 130.6. 1930 hours. Radio message to division. Get fuel to us as quickly as possible by any available means. Convoy of armoured reconnaissance vehicles and Panzer Support Company. Niemann ordered to report there. 1945 hours. Radio message to division. At bridge six kilometres south of target, very long delay getting through due to icy conditions. 2050 hours. Radio message to division. Stuck again in attempt to go through a second ravine one kilometre north of the previous one. 2205 hours. Radio message to division. Advanced through village two kilometres south of attack objective. 2110 hours. Radio message to division. Solenkopf moving forward quickly. Elements of Cooper, three kilometres east. 22.25 hours. Radio message to division. Solenkopf advancing quickly. The reinforced 8th Cooper, three kilometres east of 146.9, under heavy siege, in all-round defence position. Einigeln. 22.50 hours. Radio message to division. I am at attack objective, in battle with enemy tanks and infantry. Bridge in our hands. 22.56 hours. Radio message to division. Here we only have two weak SPW companies. I'm engaged in battle with enemy tanks and infantry at the attack target. Bridge in our hands. Rapid advance by Tsolenkopf urgently needed. Have no fuel left. 23.59 hours. Radio message to division. I'm holding north part, which is being cleared out of enemy. Fire from tanks and mortars from outside of village has not yet been neutralized. Where is Tsolenkopf? After a night march, with a detour of over 30 kilometers, far behind the Russian defensive positions, through several occupied enemy lines, a march over ice and snow and extremely difficult terrain, Group Hunersdorf reached the assigned objective, captured the bridge intact and occupied the village. This march brought praise from the highest echelons, but it gave even more fuel to the hope that we could still relieve Stalingrad. Only another 48 kilometers stood between battle group Hunersdorf and the surrounded and trapped army. If General Oberst Paulus, even against the orders of the OKW, meaning Hitler, could have brought himself to decide to break out at that time, there was now a possibility of establishing contact with 57th Panzer Corps, and thereby opening the road to freedom for the majority of Paulus's divisions. The failure of the Italian army at the Donets put the overall situation of the southern front in serious jeopardy, and now a decision was urgently needed. Report by Commander, 6th, 11th Panzer Regiment, continued. For me, the march to the east seemed almost endless, even surreal, enveloped as we were by total silence. The moon climbed slowly in the sky and threw our surroundings into sharp relief. The stars were clear, and the snow glowed as if lit from within. Our greatest fear was losing sight of the person in front of us. Sometimes we struck a quick tempo, but then the vanguard would stop again and search for the assigned route. Because we crossed many of our own tracks, and the roads shown on the map were hard to make out even during the day, due to the uniformity of the snow cover, the vanguard often took a wrong turn. Sometimes the leaders became stuck in a ravine that was difficult to get across. So as not to lose any time, the lead was given to the commander of whichever company was on the correct road, and the ones who had got on the wrong direction had to weave themselves back in. 
Finally, Oberst Lieutenant Michaelis and his sharp instincts brought us to our destination. We missed the shorter route, two kilometers west of Hill 157.0, forking off toward Vasilyevka, which caused us to make a long detour, but then we ended up on a good road closer to the objective and exactly south of it. Here it would have been impossible to lose our way as a telegraph line ran along the road. By now I was moving somewhere near the centre of the battle group. Again and again we ran into ravines, whose ice-covered slopes glistened a strange shade of green. We were under orders not to shoot so as to avoid giving away our presence. I must admit I could never find our exact location on the map, but I trusted the vanguard and the commander. On both sides of the road I noticed several prepared enemy positions, which to me looked very much occupied. To me this was absolutely incredible, and I found it all the more eerie when I realized the real reason for this apparent peacefulness. Then there was a sudden halt and we waited. My watch showed it was after twenty-two hundred hours, which meant after midnight local time. We stood panzer to panzer, having driven quite close behind one another on the road. Nearby on our right was the telegraph line, further ahead of us was a dark area, and behind it a range of mountains, crowned by what was apparently a village. Diagonally to the road, almost at my height, were well-constructed panzer hull-down positions. It was very cold, and suddenly, I no longer recall how it happened, Russian soldiers were standing around our panzer, and they were armed. Out of the darkness right and left, more of them appeared. My crew and I stared through the open hatches, wondering if we were seeing things. My gunner pointed out that the Russians still had weapons on them. I shushed him and whispered in his ear, Quiet! They think we're Russians! I thought at any second there would be gunfire. Yet nothing happened. They leaned against our tracks and tried to joke around with us. Not a shot fell. What did these characters want? Didn't they notice the Wehrmacht's Balkenkreuz, the cross symbol of the Wehrmacht, on the sides of our vehicles? I fingered my pistol then reached for a hand grenade from behind my seat. Just in case. My God, what should we do? And how can this be taking so unbelievably long? I looked at the vehicles ahead of and behind me, and there was the same scene. It has never been quite clear to me how we fell into this situation. There is only one likely explanation, that because we had simply rolled on into their positions in the middle of the night, making no battle sounds, the Russians thought these were their own tanks. We also arrived in a non-combat march formation, and Vasilevka lay about twenty kilometers behind their front. At this time the Russians were still fighting against the remainder of Cooper's unit at Hill 146.9, and by now may also have had to deal with Group Solenkov. Because they were preoccupied, and it was so dark, they may not have noticed that thirty or forty panzers had broken through their lines and were driving around somewhere in their rear area. In any case, these Russian troops had clearly not been warned against an invading panzer group. Still, our column did not move on, and while we waited, we could easily have shot them all. But aside from the fact that we were still under a no-shoot order, we would somehow have found it repellent to shoot these curious Ivans. Instead, we had almost a quarter hour of something like fraternization. Suddenly, at the front of our column, the peace ended. On the hill, which was still not visible, a shot fell, soon followed by further shots and machine-gun fire. We disappeared immediately into our turrets. The Russians stood in darkness on both sides of the road, and we moved slowly forward toward the village, which we could now clearly make out. As I later learned, near the north exit of the village, our vanguard panzer was destroyed by a T-34 at ten meters. The enemy tank met the same fate, but our vanguard leader, Oberstleutnant Michaelis, an admirable officer, died a hero. Over the following days we kept seeing the two tanks standing next to one another. Still in front of the bridge I heard loud yelling. As I looked out of the turret, a Russian scout car was driving backwards alongside of our column. In its turret stood a figure straight up, wearing a leather vest and safety helmet. He rushed past me, his face not three meters away. A Russian. After overcoming the first seconds of horror, the vehicle disappeared. At the end of the column someone shot at him as he drove off, but with no success. 
but surely now the Russians understood what was happening. We entered the village, the few grenadiers dismounted, and in the light of dawn we took possession of the largest part of the rather spread-out village of Vasilyevka. But we had already captured something more important, the bridge that was still undamaged. Thus, by midnight, the panzers of battlegroup Hunersdorf stood far forward in Vasilevka on the Mishkova River and manned the bridgehead there. They were low on panzers and almost out of ammunition and fuel. They had reached the objective, but would they be able to hold on to it? This was what concerned the commander. What good are tanks with no ammunition and no fuel? The latter was the most serious concern, and the situation looked grim, as even during the march some individual panzers had come to a standstill and the crews had to be transferred to other vehicles. Moreover, there were not enough grenadier forces for the task of clearing the enemy from the village, or defending against a possible enemy attack, nor was there any artillery. Twenty kilometres back, straight south, lay 23rd Panzer Division, and to the southwest was Group Zollenkopf. Both were desperately needed, but both were probably still engaged with the enemy. Would they be able to fight their way to Vasilevka before it was too late, even without the right panzer attack force? This was a matter for the division. If they were too slow in sending in supporting forces, the successes of battlegroup Hunersdorf would be squandered, and irreplaceable panzers, which were needed in further operations, would be lost. The Russians would soon become aware of just how weak the panzer group in Vasilevka was. In their case, it would have been a smart tactic to establish a weak ring around Vasilevka and then go and stop the German troops north of the Aksai. But it was questionable whether there were sufficient Russian forces for this, because once the 17th Panzer Division arrived, the Russians appeared to have become splintered. Would the troops from the nearby Stalingrad encirclement be pulled out and brought here? That would mean that our operation had contributed to Paulus's breakout from the encirclement. It would all come down to timing. The night march to Vasilevka clearly illustrates how disadvantageous it can be to separate panzers and grenadiers. The Russians succeeded in doing this to battlegroup Hunersdorf, which almost led to a catastrophe for the battlegroup. The panzers in the village were almost completely on their own and were just barely holding on without fuel and ammunition. Meanwhile, the grenadiers had to fight their way for thirty kilometres without panzers once more, with more problems, against an enemy who could no longer be taken by surprise. This led to casualties on both sides, which, with better coordination, could probably have been avoided. The assigning of blame is problematic here, but the fault in this case did not lie with the grenadiers, as can be seen in the following report. Report by Commander, Battlegroup Solenkov At around midday of 19th December 1942, after two days' hard struggle, 1st 114th, Hausschild, broke through into the much-contested village of Verkhnekumsky. At the same time, at around 1500 hours, division orders arrived instructing Battalion Hausschild to immediately release one battery of anti-aircraft guns and one battery of artillery, which were sent to follow Group Hunersdorf. The battalion, Hausschild, was still engaged in face-to-face -face combat in the process of clearing the village. It was already dark and the village was burning. To the east was a raging spectacle of firing by Group Hunersdorf in a night battle. Clusters of anti-tank tracer rounds travelled back and forth across the black night skies. A truly frightening but beautiful scene. The first 114th had shot up all their ammunition. The companies engaged in close combat in the village had become completely mixed up with one another, and hours passed before they could regroup, bring in their vehicles, refuel, eat, and take on ammunition. At around 1900 hours, Battalion Hausschild arrived with orders to follow the tracks of the panzers made by Hunersdorf and his battalion, and, after meeting up with them, to join Group Hunersdorf under its command. The staff of the 114th, Zollenkopf, along with its subordinated unit, Battalion Remlinger, 1st 114th and 1st 76th, was to follow likewise, in order that both battalions could be subordinated under Group Hunersdorf. This appears to be an error in the original. Remlinger is commander of 1st 4th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, which was subordinate to Group Zollenkopf at this point in the operation. Battalion Hausschild, 
1st 114th with 2nd 114th, Lieutenant Jung, at the vanguard, followed the confusing mishmash of panzer traces toward the east. The march during the dark of night was extremely difficult. The slippery slopes of the sand dunes caused the vehicles to slide, and going uphill, one often had to dismount and risk getting shot. At other times, wheeled vehicles were hampered by the ruts made by the panzers. Very often the columns were broken apart, and there were continual stops. Eastwards of 146.9, the battalion ran into elements of 2nd 114th, SPWs, which had become separated from Hunersdorf and had become disoriented. Because they were continually harassed by Russians attacking from the cover of darkness, they had to gather into an all-round hedgehog defence. Driving with dimmed headlights, the column of 1st 114th drew nearer to the Russians, who disappeared into the darkness, probably thinking the panzers would attack again. While trying to catch up to 1st 114th in the darkness, the staff of 114th lost its radio station. As it was later learned, the radio station had failed due to technical problems, and this interrupted the communications to Division and Group Hunersdorf. At around midnight, the vanguard company came up against the railroad track. Thus, it was apparently too far east. After a quick reorientation, it was discovered that the panzer tracks turned to the north. The entire column then followed the tracks northwards. After advancing a few kilometres, the vanguard company was fired on by cannons and machine-gun fire. As dusk fell, a Russian field position was spotted. While the companies fell into battle positions and pulled the battery into position, the battalion was attacked by Russian fighter planes with bombs and onboard weapons. Casualties were few. The attack with 1st and 2nd 114th in front was successful. At 10 hundred hours, enemy resistance was defeated, and the battalion was able to regroup and mount up. They quickly continued across a broad open plain. The terrain sloped gradually down toward the Mishkova sector. Soon several houses in Vasilevka became visible in the morning haze. From that direction came sounds of battle. There, Group Hunersdorf was engaged in a defensive fight. No radio communication was available. The first 114th deployed in a broad front, planning to push into Vasilevka. The commander assumed that the enemy would not be particularly strong, and that the panzers would possibly be able to neutralize the anti-tank systems they encountered. It therefore came as quite a surprise to be fired on within such a short time by artillery and anti-tank systems from the high mountains facing them. The battalion had to turn off to the right and take cover in a ravine that led to the village. Here they dismounted, with the intention of fighting on foot to the bridgehead, where Group Hunesdorf was surrounded. Shortly before nightfall, the vanguard company, 2nd 114th, neared the southern part of the village and was fired on from individual buildings in the vicinity of the bridge. Bringing House Shield with him, Major Baker left the bridgehead in an SPW and met with Hunersdorf, who briefed him on the overall situation, the enemy, and developments at the bridgehead. According to this, the most urgent issues were to reinforce the displaced panzer crews in their unaccustomed type of defensive battle, and to resupply the panzers with ammunition, which had been completely used up. House Shield returned in the SPW, gathered his companies, circumvented the Russian-occupied southern section of the village, and swept around to the left. By crossing the ravines and fighting in constant close combat, they were able to infiltrate the village from the southwest. In our counter-attacks, we recaptured some of the buildings and strengthened defences. On the same road came munitions and some fuel for the panzers, with this, two of the most urgent tasks had been accomplished. The battle strength of the companies had shrunk to about 50% during the battles of recent days. Unfortunately, Lieutenant Jung, the courageous and highly respected commander of 2nd Company, was fatally wounded, and Lieutenant Kelletat, commander of 3rd 114th, fell in battle. Thus, in recent days, 1st 114th alone suffered three irretrievable losses, a night attack was declined because the incoming battalion was unfamiliar with the terrain, the front was fully closed, and neither our heavy weapons nor the tanks or artillery could offer even the slightest support. An attack toward the northwest, whose intent was to first clear the village of enemy and then capture the hills north of the village, 
was postponed to the next day. Wehrmacht Report of 20th December 1942 Excerpt Between the Volga and Don, German panzer divisions, attacking a tough enemy defence and, in cooperation with Romanian troops, captured an important river sector. As is clearly shown in following two documents, it was becoming urgent that the surrounded Sixth Army come to a decision. Letter from von Manstein to Army Chief of Staff By hand of officers only, three copies. Secret material for command headquarters, three copies. Matter for high-level commanders, 19th December, 1435 hours. Secret material for high-level command, by the hand of officers only. To Chief of Staff of the Army, for immediate submission to the Führer. The situation at Army Group Don, due to developments at Army Group B and the cutting off of further forces, has developed to the point that an extraction of Sixth Army cannot be considered for the foreseeable future. The supply and thereby the maintenance of the army in the fortress area by air has proven impossible due to reasons of available resources as well as weather, as has been demonstrated over the four weeks since the encirclement. 57th Panzer Corps obviously cannot even establish contact with 6th Army by land, let alone preserve it. I now believe the final possibility is for the army to break out of the encirclement from the southwest, by which means at least the majority of the soldiers and the elements of the army that are still mobile can be preserved. The breakout, whose first goal is to establish contact with the 57th Panzer Corps, can only be accomplished somewhere at the Yerik Mushkova by a gradual pushing of the army toward the southwest, which will take place through combat, in the manner that will expand the fortress area, vacating one section at a time in the north, while gradually pushing toward the southwest. During this operation, it will be necessary to use sufficient pursuit and fighter planes to furnish supplies by air. Because there is already apparent enemy pressure toward the north flank of the 4th Romanian Army, forces from the Caucasus front must be brought here quickly, by any and all means, to provide security for the deep right flank of 57th Panzer Corps, to enable it to carry out its task. In case of any further delay, it is foreseeable that 57th Panzer Corps will come to a standstill at or north of the Mishkova, or become tied up through attacks at its right flank. With this, the combined effects of the attacks from within and outside will be overtaken by events. Before deploying, 6th Army will need several days to regroup and refuel. Food supplies inside the ring area sufficient through 22nd December. Already great weakening of the soldiers. For last 14 days, only 200 grams of bread. Majority of the horses, according to statement from the army, have already been sidelined due to exhaustion or eaten. The commander-in-chief of Army Group Don, signed von Manstein, General Feldmarschall, signed Schultz. 1A, number 0368-42, Secret Top Priority Matter, Geheime Kommandosache, Chefsache. Letter from von Manstein for 6th Army and 4th Panzer Army. Secret Command Document, 5 copies. Top Priority, 4 copies. Officers Only, 19th December, 1800 hours. Secret Command Document, for Officers Only. For Commanders, 6th Army, 4th Panzer Army. 1. 4th Panzer Army has defeated the enemy in the area of Verkhnekumsky with 57th Panzer Corps and has reached the Mushkova sector at Nishkimsky. Attacks against strong enemy groups in area of Kamenka and north have begun. Hard fighting still expected. Situation at Chir Front does not allow advance of forces west of the Don toward Kalach. Chirskaya in enemy hands. 2. Sixth Army is set to deploy for the Wintergewitte, winter thunderstorm attack, as soon as possible. Thereby it is expected that, if necessary, the link-up with 57th Panzer Corps, in order to get the convoy through, will be done by way of the Donskaya Zaritsa. 3. The development of the situation could force the mission outlined in paragraph 2 to be extended so that when the army breaks out, it will link up with 57th Panzer Corps on the Mishkova. Code word Donnerschlag, thunderclap. 
It is a matter of getting Panzer's 257th Panzer Corps so that they can get the convoy through under the cover of the flank of the lower Karpovka, and then lead the army toward the Mishkova as it leaves the fortress area. Donnerschlag must at all costs operate directly in conjunction with Vintergewitter. Support by air will essentially have to be carried out on a continuous basis without a great deal of preparation. It is important to hold Pitomnik airfield for as long as possible. All movable weapons and artillery are to be brought out, especially all guns that are required for battle, and are to be loaded, as are the heavy and hard-to-replace weapons and equipment. These are to be assembled in the southwest area in ample time. 4. Advance preparations must be made as in paragraph 3. Do not deploy until ordered with the command Donnerschlag. 5. Attack day and time will be reported to number 2. Commander-in-Chief, Army Group Don. 1A, number 0369-42. Secret High Priority Document, dated 19th December 1942. Signed, von Manstein, General Feldmarschall. Five copies. One, Signal Office, original. Two, Air Fleet, four. Three, Q Branch. Four, War Diary. Five, Draft. 20th December, 1942. 57th Panzer Corps and the push to the Mushkova. Map 14. War Diary of 11th Panzer Regiment. Vasilyevka, 20th December, 1942. O oh, six hundred hours. The slowly developing enemy opposition grows stronger over the course of the night. Our own weak forces, only twenty-one panzers without fuel and two weak SPW companies, are not enough to expand the bridgehead to the extent that a further advance is possible. Commander therefore orders them to take a position of all-round defence on the north bank of the river. Amid constantly growing enemy pressure, with continual heavy bombardment by infantry, artillery, and anti-tank guns and mortars, we fend off several enemy attacks and can hold the bridgehead, hoping for relief from Group Zollenkopf by the following day. 0900 hours. At 0430 hours, we fend off the first strong advance by enemy infantry from the northwest. But the commander is aware that we can expect stronger attacks in the course of the 20th. Yesterday evening via radio message, the commander ordered the commander of the staff company of 2nd 11th Panzer Regiment, who is in charge of the pooled repair service, to consolidate the repaired panzers in Salivsky into one company and form a convoy for transporting fuel and munitions forward. But the company was co-opted by division and pulled forward to support Group Zollenkopf. The attack by Group Zollenkopf is visible off in the distance, but as yet they have gained no further ground. From constant firing of tanks and anti-tank guns, more panzers are disabled. The dismounted crews are being deployed as infantry to reinforce the grenadiers. Battlegroup Hundersdorf Radio Traffic 0450 hours. Radio message to division. Constant bombardment from tanks and mortars. Advance of enemy infantry from the northwest is halted. Attack objective north of the river is held. Heavy enemy attacks expected over the course of the 20th. Still have 21 panzers without fuel. 0620 hours. Radio message to division. Why is the consolidated Neiman Company still being held up? Still have 18 vehicles without fuel. Urgently request relief. 0725 hours. Radio message to division. Constant bombardment from heavy mortars and tanks. Repeated advances by small units were fended off. Counterattack not possible, as no fuel. Two Cooper companies are too weak to expand bridgehead. 0735 hours. Radio message to division. Request air support against enemy on hills hard north of the bridgehead. Inform as to appointed time of attack. 1235 hours. Radio message from division. Proposed mission for 21st December. Turn off to the north. Division order to follow. Division Battlestaff, Klikova. 1325 hours. Radio message from division. To Oberst von Hunersdorf, to you and to all Panzer gunners and Panzer grenadiers, my full recognition and thanks for your guts and fortitude. 
General Raus. By morning, the vanguard of the long-wished-for battle group Tollenkopf was visible to the south, although one had to realize that between the northern higher hills and the southern bank of the Mishkova, there was an elevation difference of about thirty meters. With this, battle group Hunersdorf, which was encircled in the northern part of Vasilevka, could see as far as five kilometers into the southern terrain, which was lower and gradually sloped up to the horizon. What could be seen coming from the area of battlegroup Tollenkopf were some individual impacts from their artillery along the southern horizon. But these might also have been the artillery fire from 23rd Panzer Division, which was also slowly advancing. Nevertheless, watching our battle groups as they came near, knowing relief was on its way, was of great reassurance. The enemy attacked the villages almost without pause, but because his attacks were so unsystematic, they were fiercely fought off. Except for the bridge ramp, however, the entire southern bank of the river, along with the houses there that belonged to the village, were now transferred into Russian hands. The ammunition was being used up quickly, including machine-gun ammunition. Something had to happen soon. War Diary of 11th Panzer Regiment 1600 Hours the enemy is constantly being reinforced, but still only attacks some of the time, and with small units. Contact with Tollenkopf is not yet established. Tollenkopf is instructed by radio message to immediately capture several houses on the southern bank near the bridge, in order to enable two grenadier companies and scout vehicles to move past them into the bridgehead. As to the orders from division that on the 21st we turn off to the north, the commander finds this very problematic, as the Panzer Regiment and SPW Battalion would have to be reassembled again, and no one will be able to count on the communications to the rear. At 15.30 hours, the enemy breaks through from the northwest. Throwing him out on our own is no longer a possibility. 1900 hours. At 16.45 hours, the first of the company commanders from 1st 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment arrives, but with only a few people, by 1900 hours, only two platoons of 1st 114th Battalion Hausschild are at the bridgehead. Impossible to get scout vehicles through from the southern front, but the plan is to do so during the night. Without this, the breach to the northwest of the bridgehead cannot yet be rectified. At dawn, once all of Hausschild has arrived, Commander intends to lead an attack out and to the west of the bridgehead, onto the hill northwest of Vasilievka, in order then to deploy further out from there. Due to lack of water, noticeable exhaustion among the crews at the bridgehead, with suffering especially among the wounded. Since yesterday, at midday, at total of twenty-five panzers are sidelined, some for mechanical problems, but most due to shelling. First Battalion has only seven deployable panzers. Battlegroup Hunersdorf, Radio Traffic 13.15 hours Radio message to division. Enemy constantly reinforced, but has not attempted renewed attack. Breakthrough by two companies on SPWs not possible so far due to heavy defence. Tollenkopf instructed to capture several buildings near the bridge in order to enable the SPWs to enter. 14.15 hours. Radio message to division. Am stopping now as before in face of enemy forays and heavy bombardment not counting on arrival of House Shield before 1700 hours. For possible continuation of action, request addition of strong grenadier force to prevent miserable situation such as this one today, as the troops are very worn down. 1600 hours. Radio message to division. Day's report. After a short battle, breakthrough in enemy defence line southwest of 146.9, with careful advance, hampered only by terrain difficulties, the enemy was completely surprised, and the bridgehead was taken after a short battle. Due to shortage of resources and fuel, the bridgehead at the north bank had to be kept very small. All day and night the enemy attacked continuously, and due to the immobility of our vehicles we incurred heavy losses. Enemy broke through at 15.30 hours from the northwest, and could only be thrown back again with help from Hausschild. Launching battle early morning is questionable, as Panzers and Cooper must first be regrouped, and the fuel and munitions have not yet arrived. 16.15 hours. Radio message from Division. 
Solenkopf instructed to reach Vasilevka as quickly as possible. Lead element of 6th Reconnaissance Battalion, 1505 hours, past Hill 146.9. 1645 hours. Radio message to division. One company commander from Hausschild arrived. Mop-up scheduled. 1840 hours. Radio message to division. Enemy attack from north and west not carried out further as yet. Breakthrough not yet rectified, as only two platoons from Hausschild are at the bridgehead. During the night, two companies are to be brought in on SPWs through the weak enemy-held area into the bridgehead area. At dawn, the Hausschild attack from out of the bridgehead and to the west on the high hills to the north. Remlinger on enemy-owned south sector with support of newly provided panzers. After establishing communications, expand bridgehead, organize the units at the bridgehead, reload ammunition and fuel. Only then is renewed action possible. For radio equipment, necessary fuel is to be brought forward during the night on SPWs. At bridgehead considerable casualties due to heavy shelling. Troops very strained because of no quiet, no warm food, and no shelter. Unknown hours. Radio message to division. Casualties at bridgehead. 11th Panzer Regiment. Deaths. Oberstleutnant Michaelis. Seven NCOs and soldiers. Wounded. Assistenzarzt Dr. Schmidt. 16 NCOs and soldiers. 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment. Deaths. Oberstleutnant Jäger. 24 NCOs and soldiers. Wounded. Oberstleutnant Jung. 36 NCOs and soldiers. 57th Pioneer Battalion. Deaths. 3 NCOs and soldiers. Wounded. 7 NCOs and soldiers. Disabled vehicles. 25 Panzers, some mechanical, some from shelling. 5 SPWs. Successes. 2 T-34s, 1 Christie, 4 4.7 anti-tank systems, 3 7.62 anti-tank systems, 165 prisoners taken, approximately 150 kills, numerous infantry weapons and anti-tank rifles. 1900 hours. Radio message from 1st Battalion, 11th Panzer Regiment. Panzer count 0 slash 4 slash 2 slash 0 slash 1. Toward the end of the day, there was even a scouting foray with Group Zollenkopf. Still, we did not push back the enemy south of the sector, who may have been weak, but remained tenacious. The division's situation toward evening was as follows. Battle Group Hunosdorf, without fuel and ammunition, in an all-round defensive position in the north section of the village, but still occupying the bridge. With them were elements of the Cooper Battalion, 2nd 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, on the southern river bank, almost without contact with the panzers. Group Zollenkopf with the Hausschild Battalion, 1st 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment. Behind Zollenkopf, on the march toward Vasilievka, were 1st 4th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, Remlinger, and Group Quentin, mainly the 6th Reconnaissance Battalion, followed by the rest of Group Unrhein with 2nd 4th Panzer Grenadier Regiment. Elements of the 23rd Panzer Division on the right side of the division, towards Birsavoy, which Hunersdorf had already crossed during the night of the 19th. To the left of the division, the 17th pushed toward Gramoslavka, without having reached the Mushkova sector to this point. With this came the urgent task of clearing out the southern river bank and the nearby outskirts of Vasilyevka. Here the enemy were few in number, but were tough fighters, with a well-constructed system of positions inside the buildings. Both these enemy units and those on the northern river bank, which stood at a higher elevation, had so far been able to prevent any sizable flow of munitions, fuel and soldiers in SPWs into the bridgehead. From the hill to the north, on both sides of the village, the Russians had a good view the southern bank and dominated it, mainly with their anti-tank guns. The terrain was almost bare and without cover, and our own artillery could not find effective positions. The 21st of December promised to be a day of battle. It was clear to us that once the Russians realized the long-term consequences of our attack on Vasilyevka, they too would bring in new forces. After all, the fortunes of the entire German front from Aksai to the Mushkova sector 
now turned on the strength of the first breakthrough by battlegroup Hunersdorf. The next push by the Germans would be from this village in the direction of Stalingrad. For the Russians, everything depended on their putting a stop to this attack with all their might, and ultimately safeguarding the encirclement around Stalingrad. This was a crucial moment, but not just for the Sixth Army. Should a breakout succeed at this time, the Russians would have a dilemma on their hands. This was the last chance for General Oberst Paulus to save his army, and the decision had to be made immediately. The situation at the Southern Front left doubts as to whether Army Group Don could still fuel and otherwise sustain both the front at the Chia River and the advance by 57th Panzer Corps south of the Don. Back on 18th December, during the first assault, the enemy had broken through the Italian army at the mid-Don, at the junction of Army Group B and Army Group Don. Now a large number of enemy mechanized and tank corps were on the move toward the Donetsk and the Tatsinskaya and Marasovskaya bases, which were vital for the German air support to Stalingrad. At that moment there was nothing to stop them. If the Russians could not be brought to a halt before they reached Rostov, there was the danger of a crisis even worse than Stalingrad, in which the entire Army Group Don and Army Group A, now fighting in the Caucasus, would also be surrounded. But what resources were available to Army Group B and Army Group Don at this point? As of 20th December, practically nothing. The OKW had promised to bring in the 7th Panzer Division, due to arrive from France, plus some individual Luftwaffe field divisions. But the minor combat power of a Luftwaffe field division would be irrelevant, and in any case, none of these forces would be able to arrive in time to save the situation. If General Oberst Paulus did not immediately decide to break out of the encirclement, then there would have to be a regrouping within Army Group Don in order to secure their open left flank, which extended hundreds of kilometres. The necessary divisions, however, could be pulled from only the Cheer Front and the 57th Panzer Corps, which was fighting south of the Don. For the most part, all other fronts consisted of Allied divisions, which were either unreliable and on the verge of disintegrating, or so deeply engaged in defensive battles that pulling them out would lead to new catastrophes. Ultimately, this all added up to a temporary abandonment of the plans to liberate Stalingrad, and along with it, as was no doubt clear to every commander, was a death sentence for the encircled Sixth Army. If General Paulus would not make an immediate decision to break out, and would not shoulder this risk himself, only a miracle could save him. And it was a risk, as he might not have succeeded in pushing on through until the German troops met up with the 57th Panzer Corps, be it in the direction of the Don or to the southwest, and out in the open steppe, torn loose from his solid positions, his troops might have met the same fate. Wehrmacht Report of 21st December 1942 Excerpt in the Volga Don region, heavy fighting continues. In fierce tank and infantry battles, the Soviets again suffered extremely high losses in men and materiel. 21st December 1942 Holding the bridgehead at Vasilyevka War Diary of 11th Panzer Regiment Vasilyevka, 21st December 1942 O 600 hours With all ammunition depleted, the situation at the bridgehead has become more and more critical overnight. The enemy attacks again and again, using a concentric pattern, and can only be fended off through close combat. At zero zero hundred hours, and for some time after, the Russians were no more than fifteen metres from the Hunersdorf command post, the heart of the bridgehead. The commander called for the soldiers, who were physically and mentally exhausted, to counter-attack and to continue to stand fast. Fuel has become so scarce that the radio traffic must be limited, as there is no way to recharge the dying batteries. The troops are at the end of their strength due to the constant fighting, lack of rest, lack of warm food, water and shelter, all of which is felt more harshly in the increasingly cold temperatures. In the early morning hours, just two house shield companies are at the bridgehead, which are just enough to hold off any enemy breakthrough. The arrival of SPW companies proves to be just as impossible as before. Despite all orders, under these conditions any plans for further deployment are unthinkable, 
as are any adjustments to the bridgehead. The shelling from weapons of all sorts, which now include artillery, Stalin's organs, and fighter planes, greatly increases our casualties. Our weapons can hardly compete. Battlegroup Hunersdorf Radio Traffic 0612 hours. Radio message from Division. Attack by Zollenkopf begins 0530 hours. Continue advance to ordered objective after clearing of the area around the bridgehead. 0850 hours. Radio message to division. Vanguard of attack, Remlinger, southeast perimeter of Kaptinka. House shield, southwest perimeter, Vasilyevka. 0945 hours. Radio message to division. Vanguard of Tolenkopf, already turned in at village perimeter. 1000 hours. Message to division. The attack by group Tolenkopf, which began at 0530 hours, has succeeded. At 0900 hours, the battalion on the right, 1st, 4th, Remlinger, broke through into the southwestern village perimeter of Kaptinka. House Shield stayed on the left and established contact with the south. 1130 hours, radio message from division. After arrival of necessary reinforcements, seizing hills north of Vasilyovka, security measures at hill 124.05 kilometers east of Vasilyovka, and Hill 109.5, four and a half kilometres northeast of Vasilyevka. Reconnaissance toward east, north, and west. Establish communication with Boyneburg, 23rd Panzer Division, direction Gnila Aksaiskaya. 1345 hours. Radio message to division. Requesting Tollenkopf's arrival here with me soon, otherwise I cannot move and Solenkopf must take command of elements not deployed at Bridgehead. 1430 hours. Radio message to division. Solenkopf just arrived here. Remlinger and Hausschild still in fight over enemy ground bunker positions north of the village. Near the northeast flank, enemy tanks and infantry on the attack. Panzer support deployed against them. Whether or not bunker positions can still be taken before darkness appears doubtful. Intent? Hold bridgehead. The withdrawal of panzers as close shock force not possible at the moment, as infantry are not certain to hold out without panzers behind them. At the bridgehead, deployed elements of Cooper are so worn down that their use as attack troops not possible at this time. After a very tense night, Group Zollenkopf attacked successfully, warding off the most dangerous threat to battle group Hunersdorf. Because of the order placing Zollenkopf over von Hunersdorf, the rare situation arose in which the commander of a surrounded unit became the commander of the unit sent to relieve him at Vasilyevka. The relationship may have been difficult prior to the development of this situation at Vasilyevka. Radio message of 19th December 1942, 1450 hours. That the relationship proved untenable is evident in the radio message of 21st December, 1345 hours. The division, under pressure from the Corps, repeatedly attempted to get the advance underway in order to meet up with the surrounded troops as close to Stalingrad as possible. This resolve, a valid one in and of itself, flew in the face of the actual reality. At that point, battlegroup Hunersdorf was no longer battle-worthy. The order for the continued advance was announced by the division on 20th December, but according to a radio message, 1235 hours, it appears to have already reached the hands of Oberst von Hunersdorf ahead of time. As the war diary of the 11th Panzer Regiment states, and as the division itself came to realise, even considering the shortage of time, this order had been scheduled prematurely. War Diary of 11th Panzer Regiment 1500 hours Our continued attack against the hills to the northwest, north and northeast of the bridgehead proves to be very difficult as the enemy is very strong and sits in ground bunkers. The enemy deploys new forces, including tanks, against the northeast corner of the bridgehead, which presents some threat to our panzers. Clearing the hills is no longer successful. The attack of the panzer grenadiers must be broken off at nightfall. This means that the bridge position remains under further direct shelling. When Solenkopf arrives, Commander reports that the use of the panzer as close attack force for the time is not possible, as the panzer grenadiers, without the panzers behind them, would certainly not hold out. The elements of the SPW battalion deployed on the bridgehead 
are so exhausted that using them as attack troops is not possible. 2100 hours. Commander is ordered to Division Battle Command Post for conference on situation and intent. Battle Group Hunersdorf Radio Traffic. 1630 hours. Radio message to Division. Hill 110.4 in our hands. Bunker position north of the hill and at northwest perimeter of the village of Vasilyevka could not be taken. Artillery shelling from north and northwest direction. Cannon, mortar and machine gun fire from defensive nests in local area. We are holding Vasilyevka and 110.4. 1650 hours. Radio message to division. Decrease in artillery support not tenable. Formation of mobile panzer spearhead initially not possible as tanks must remain as backup for infantry and are allocated to positions. A renewed assembly will only be possible after removal of enemy bunker positions. A summary by Commander, 6th, 11th Panzer Regiment. The first two days were the most difficult for us in Vasilyevka. While the other parts of the division slowly fought their way closer to this sector, we were positioned forward, occupying the only usable bridge leading to Stalingrad, having to hold out against the extremely hard Russian counter-attacks. Almost all hours, day or night, the Russians, concentrated or individually, deployed their weapons. Always pressed into a tight area, we no longer exited our vehicles. The few grenadiers among us positioned themselves under our panzers, or dug in near to us, bursting forth only for occasional counter-attacks under our fire support. Because we were without fuel, we could not move. Each panzer had his sector, but a close command was no longer possible, and one saw only his sector, his grenadiers, and his crew. The almost constant fire from artillery and the Stalin's organs, which came in hurricane-like surges proclaiming new attacks, was most aggravating and caused the most casualties. This caused the losses of panzer after panzer, and among the casualties was one of my best platoon leaders, Feldwebel Reusch. Our deepest concern was for the wounded. We no longer had anywhere to lay them out, as the last houses had caught fire or sunk into ruins. Added to this was the lack of water and the bitter outside cold. The first two days we were completely cut off from supplies and had no artillery of our own with which we could have defeated the enemy. We did have Stukas, Junkers 88s, which brought occasional noticeable relief and which grew more effective each day. From a low altitude they dropped bombs only a few metres in front of us and right into the Russian attack forces. While we also took serious casualties, soon the outskirts of the village were strewn with Russian dead as a result of the persistent German air attacks. While on the way to see the regimental commander, Oberst von Hunersdorf, who had his command post in a hole under his panzer, I was shot as well. A bullet lodged between my ribs. It was all a miracle, as the shot, which itself was very painful, was impeded by the thickness of winter clothing, my tobacco pipe, and my cigarette case, which it penetrated, but ended up causing no harm. The impact knocked me down. Fellow soldiers pulled me under a panzer, and the doctor removed shot right there on the spot. I assumed it was not a targeted shot, but instead something that came from far off, as otherwise the padding would not have helped but at least this way I could still stay with my company. Group Zollenkopf's attack brought significant relief, as well as ammunition and fuel. Our artillery became all the stronger in its defensive fighting, and on the 22nd, with the use of flamethrowers, the grenadiers cleared out the last pockets of resistance. Report on events of 21st December by Oberst Zollenkopf, Commander 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment. During the night, Remlinger's battalion was also affected. In order to expand the bridgehead toward the right, the commander of the 114th engaged the battalion in an attack on the southern part of the village, after whose capture the follow-on mission would be to turn off toward the right through the Mushkova trough and capture Kaptinka. Both battalions began their attack at 0530 hours, now effectively supported by heavy weapons, smoke mortars and artillery. Despite our low battle strength and great fatigue from constant overexertion, the attack went forward. Close to midday, the 1st 4th succeeded in breaking into Kaptinka, and the 1st 114th cleared out the west part of the village. 
the enemy constantly received reinforcements and was in position on the hill north of the village in dug-in bunkers. So the 1st 114th and the 1st 4th were not able to capture these hills, which still ruled over the southern part of the village and the bridge. The battalion set up their defence of Kaptinka and the northern perimeter of Vasilyevka. The supply route had been fought open, and the bridgehead was expanded and strengthened. After finishing this task, the staff of Tolenkopf began modifying positions in the village, in which almost the entire division was now assembled in a defensive front. The fronts were now solidified, and neither the Russians nor the 6th Panzer Division were able to free up forces for another thrust. As part of the 57th Panzer Corps, the division had gained over 100 kilometres, and now there were still 48 kilometres between the furthest forward units and the Stalingrad encirclement. They had fought their way through three quarters of the entire distance, and it was unclear to everyone as to why the other army was not coming to meet them. Surely 200,000 soldiers ought to be able to fight their way across 50 kilometres. That day more than enough rumours swirled around us. Someone claimed to know for certain that the 6th Army had already deployed, while someone else claimed to have already spoken with someone from Stalingrad who was part of the advance guard from the main body of the army, which had already made contact with the relief troops at some neighbouring sector or another. Still others spoke of a connecting passage across the steppe, where materiel was already rolling in toward the 6th Army. The only bit of genuine news was that the 4th Panzer Army at Kotilnikova was preparing a large depot area to enable the immediate transport of urgently needed materiel on a soon-to-be-won corridor to Stalingrad. But General Paulus had not yet launched the breakout. He had likely received the breakout order from his direct superior, General Feldmarschall Manstein, commander-in-chief of Army Group Don. But at the same moment, Hitler forbade any breakout that would involve giving up ground that had already been captured. To bring both demands into compliance would have been impossible, not just for Paulus, but for any other army commander as well. Moreover, General Oberst Paulus harboured doubts as to whether it was at all possible, given his scant fuel and ammunition, to manage to break out and advance as far as the relief army. Given that he would have been in defiance of Hitler's order, and given the lack of the necessary materiel, it is unclear as to whether Paulus would have taken it upon himself to risk a breakout. But such question marks and moral dilemmas remain beyond the scope of this book. It was primarily left to the army group Don to create a connecting corridor to the encirclement, and without help from those inside the encirclement. Its forces were too weak, and at that point in time, and due to the overall situation, the task still proved to be impossible. On the evening of 21st December, the Russians broke through the Italian army at the Don with their advance guard and were close to the important Donetsk bridge at kamensk shachtinsky At Milerova, further north, a small German contingent that had already been surrounded barely held on. What took place in the area between the Donets and Marasovskaya was not quite clear, but there was no longer a continuous defensive front there. At the lower and middle cheer was the army detachment Hollit, to the left, with a completely open left flank. Then came remnants of the 3rd Romanian Army with some stand-in units and some worn-down Air Force field divisions, forming a front that could be quickly penetrated by any reasonably strong Russian foray. Attached to this, with its right flank at the Don, in the region of the mouth of the Cheer, was the 48th Panzer Corps, whose mission it had once been to operate in conjunction with 57th Panzer Corps in clearing the route to Stalingrad. Due to the constant defensive battles toward the north and the withdrawal of the divisions that had been designated for the task, this never took place. In a very short time, the Russians had covered far more than half the route to the Azov Sea from their starting point on the Don in front of the Italian army. In the most dangerous area between Voroshilovgrad on the Donets and Marasovskaya at the large bend in the Don River, the Russians had no strong enemy forces in front of them. It would not take more than a few days for a huge catastrophe to develop. The only parts of Army Group Don with combat strength, the 48th and the 57th Panzer Corps, lay 200 kilometres further to the east on their way to relieve Stalingrad, the Italian army and the majority of the 3rd Romanian army had disappeared from the battlefield. Now, 
The two German panzer corps were in danger of being surrounded like the Sixth Army, and further, once the Russians reached Rostov, Army Group A would have no route of retreat. 22nd December 1942 Repulsing All Attacks War Diary of 11th Panzer Regiment 0635 hours The night passed with the usual enemy forays, but with help from the two Panzer Grenadier battalions and support from the artillery deployed outside of the bridgehead, we were able to defeat them more easily than on the previous days. Shortly after 0600 hours, the enemy attacked from the northeast with a regiment-sized force and from the southeast with about fifteen tanks. The 2nd, 11th Panzer Regiment fended off the tank attack, hit four of their tanks, and pursued the enemy, who then turned away and escaped. Battle Group Hunersdorf Radio Traffic 0635 hours Radio message to division Enemy attacks with strength of an infantry regiment from the northeast, from the southeast with tanks, so far twelve sighted. Tank attack defeated, four destroyed, pursuit. 0910 hours. Radio message to division. Continued enemy attacks from northeast and tanks appear. Probably the ones that were previously fought in the southeast. To the southeast, the enemy attack is halted for now. Hausschild and Remlinger are holding their positions. Kreis, 2nd, 4th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, moves into security position toward the east and south. Enemy apparently strongest in the southeast. 0915 hours. Radio message to division. Luftwaffe support requested against the enemy from northeast and southeast. 0920 hours. Radio message from division. By order of Corps Headquarters, General Commando, attack immediately toward the northeast by way of Farm 1, location code, to reach ordered march objective. A comparison of the two bridgeheads, Salivsky versus Vasilyevka, might be useful here. On the Aksai, one reinforced battalion, Ramlinger, was sufficient for defence, but both grenadier regiments were deployed there, so that the division was unable to deploy a combat-ready shock troop for a sustained attack. In Salivsky, the regiment had grown much stronger and had been able to ward off the enemy, thanks mostly to the panzers that had been forward deployed in Verkhnyakumsky. This meant that the enemy, with his essentially weaker forces, would have to concentrate them fully on Selivsky. Nevertheless, it was a rather weak 6th Panzer Division that now stood face to face with a very strong enemy, which had been reinforced by the addition of reserves and units pulled from the Stalingrad encirclement. Therefore, when Division issued the order, 0920 hours, to continue advancing immediately, this could only have happened under strict instructions from a higher level command. War Diary of 11th Panzer Regiment. Ten hundred hours. Enemy continues to attack from the northeast, now with tanks as well, probably some that had already been defeated in the southeast. The attack from the northeast is successfully defeated. Because the commander assumes that the enemy is strongest in the southeast and is preparing for a new attack, the newly arrived 2nd 4th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, Kreis, is deployed south of the Mishkova, with its front facing east, southeast, and south. Luftwaffe support requested for enemy attacks, which increase constantly. These pose a threat to the front, as our artillery and the rocket battalions assigned to them, meanwhile, have no visibility from behind the mountains. To hold the front, extreme effort and commitment of all elements will be needed. Despite this, the Corps nevertheless orders an attack from the bridgehead toward Verkhner Zarezinsky, the last stretch of ground before reaching Stalingrad. The commander reports the impossibility of further deployment. Battle Group Hunersdorf Radio Traffic 10.05 hours Radio message to division Defending from heavy enemy attack from northeast and southeast, holding out only with greatest exertion. Everything deployed. No forces available for ordered attack. Corps staff can be personally assured of this. 12.20 hours Radio message to division very large infantry columns advancing from northwest to Vasilyevka. Luftwaffe support requested. Beginning 12.15 hours, 5 kilometers northwest of Vasilyevka. 12.55 hours. Radio message to division. Heidebrecht, 23rd Panzer Division, 
11.46 hours attacked at Bir Savoy. Enemy attack warded off. 13.35 hours. Radio message to division. Situation unchanged. Attack against Heidebrecht outside of Bir Savoy halted for now. Brisk enemy air activity. On 22nd December, the Russians deployed a ground attack aviation unit which came on stronger than on previous days, and whose rocket fire made life especially miserable. Yet, here too, the Russians showed their weaknesses in terms of leadership. They deployed all of their weapons with great force, but seldom managed to organize a coordinated, combined arms attack. What happened repeatedly was that they first allowed their infantry to bear down, and then, after it took its beating, set the tanks on attack, and finally, without any coordinated action, let loose with the artillery, or all of the above in a different order. They deployed their troops as they became available, without waiting until everything could move together in a well-settled, simultaneous, meaningful attack. War Diary of 11th Panzer Regiment 1400 hours Reconnaissance reports very large infantry columns at 1212 hours, from the northwest toward Vasilyevka. Beginning at 12.15 hours, five kilometers northwest of the village, combat air units deployed against them to good effect. With its attack on Birsavoy, the 23rd Panzer Division provides relief against enemy coming in from southeast, but this does not lead to capture of the village. Enemy air activity growing heavier. 1700 hours. The enemy has halted his attacks for the time being and has dug in at his presently occupied lines. 1900 hours. The commander reports intent for 23rd December. 0500 hours. Attack by Hausschild Battalion to capture the Northwest Hill. At 0700 hours. Attack by Remlinger Battalion for recapture of Hill 110.4. According to situation, regroup for advance northward. Battlegroup Hunersdorf's radio traffic. 1630 hours. Radio message to division. Enemy dug in at his present line, southwest, east, and northeast. In the northeastern part of Kaptinka, enemy movements. Enemy pressure has decreased. 1900 hours. Radio message to division. Intent, 23rd December. At 0500 hours, attack by House Shield to capture Hill, northwestern Hill. At 0700 hours, attack by Remlinger to capture 110.4. Then, according to the situation, regroup for advance northward. At 0700 hours, Luftwaffe support, especially fighters, at mid to northeast Kaptinka and northern perimeter 110.4. Thanks to the successful deployment of the Luftwaffe, the addition of a 4th Grenadier Battalion from the division, the attack by the 23rd Panzer Division on Bir Savoy, and the formation of a second bridgehead at Gromoslavka by the 17th Panzer Division. The enemy pressure on Vasilyevka over the course of 22nd December decreased. With this, we came closer to being able to advance further in the foreseeable future, or, more specifically, to put together a battle group from the defensive front. Events of recent days showed once more how just one unit that has penetrated deeply into the enemy's territory can enable a neighboring unit to advance, just by holding on and tying up a number of enemy forces. This is also discussed in the advance by battlegroup Hunersdorf on Verchnekumski. The situation of the overall army group Don, however, had become more serious. The Russians and their vanguard were positioned between Voroshilovgrad and Forstadt, close to the Donets. Tsatsinskaya, the important air supply base for Stalingrad, was about to fall. Army detachment Holit abandoned the upper cheer and turned back to the west, now completely deserted by the remnants of the third Romanian army that had been assigned under them. Because of the absence of the Romanians, the 48th Panzer Corps at the lower cheer and its mouth into the Don was now almost completely without contact with Holit. On orders from Army Group Don, the 48th Panzer Corps now had to give up its strongest force, the 11th Panzer Division, so that it could move to Marasovskaya to prevent the capture of Tsatsinskaya. At the same time, however, it was very doubtful whether the Corps could still hold on at its former position at all. If Feldmarshal von Manstein, as Commander-in-Chief of Army Group Don, despite 4th Panzer Army's situation south of the Don, 
still allowed it to continue attacking in the direction of Stalingrad, and even demanded increased activity, this only shows how very much he strove to order liberating of Stalingrad, and still hoped that General Oberst Paulus would decide to break out of the encirclement. The hour was near, however. Although in the meantime the Sixth Army made no visible effort to cooperate with the relief army, when forces would have to be pulled out in order to prevent a breach by the Russians at the Sea of Azov. Army Group Don could no longer offer to rescue the Sixth Army without placing one million German soldiers at risk. Wehrmacht Report of 23rd December 1942 Excerpt In renewed futile attacks between Volga and Don, as well as in Stalingrad, the Soviets suffered high casualties. 23rd December, 1942. The last day in Vasilyevka. Map 15. War Diary of 11th Panzer Regiment. Vasilyevka. 23rd December, 1942. 04.30 hours. The night passes quietly except for an enemy attack from the north and northeast at 03.45 hours. 06.30 hours. The ordered attack by House Shield started at 0600 hours with support from panzers of 1st 11th Panzer Regiment. Simultaneously, Remlinger was attacked by an enemy infantry unit of regimental size with several tanks, but the attack was fended off by our artillery fire. Enemy retreats to Birsavoy. 1200 hours. During the morning, the commanding general, General der Panzertruppen Kirchner, and the division commander, General Major Raus, arrived at the bridgehead to see the situation in person. The attacks by Remlinger and House Shield are discontinued. 1350 hours. The order from Division arrived to vacate the bridgehead, as the necessary additional forces are unavailable, making a breakthrough into Stalingrad hopeless. Any further holding of this position also appears to be without purpose, as the flanks are completely unprotected. Moreover, the Division can be better used in other areas where the Russians are attempting to break through. Battle Group Hunersdorf Radio Traffic 0430 hours Radio message to Division Morning Report Prior to enemy attack from the north and northeast at 0345 hours, the night passed quietly. Ordered procedures in place. 0620 hours Radio message to Division Attack by House Shield with Panzer support begun at 0600 hours. 0623 hours Radio message to Division since 0600 hours, enemy infantry attacking with several tanks from the southeast. Remlinger operation must not proceed until after the defence. 0630 hours. Enemy attack from the southeast halted by our artillery fire. Five enemy tanks returned to Birsavoy. From the south, decreasing movements toward Birsavoy. 1345 hours. Radio message to division. In area both sides of 117.8, strong enemy position with artillery and anti-tank systems. 1350 hours. Radio message from Division. Notification. Division is to be released tonight and transferred to Patimkinskaya, leaving behind a rearguard. Appropriate preparations to be made. Orders to follow. In the midst of the effort to expand the bridgehead and the struggle over starting positions for the further advance towards Stalingrad, the unexpected order arrives to release 6th Panzer Division. A valid decision, but a difficult one. The situation on the Donets and at the large bend in the Don River had become so tense and so dangerous to the entire southern front that the 4th Panzer Army High Command was ordered to sacrifice three Panzer Divisions, it only testifies to the foresight of General Oberst Hoth that as commander of 4th Panzer Army and fully aware of his own difficult position, he was nevertheless willing to give up his strongest division, the 6th Panzer Division. The Russian armies that faced them included two that had recently become known, the 51st Army and 2nd Guards Army, which had a total of three mechanized corps, one tank corps, three infantry and one cavalry corps, these forces had mostly come from the encirclement at Stalingrad, but there were also new forces among them that had been brought in from the other side of the Volga. Moreover, to offer a comparison using the German military designations, a Russian corps corresponds to one and a half German divisions, 
two battle-weary German panzer divisions faced twelve enemy divisions. The Romanian Fourth Army, consisting of two Romanian corps, was assigned to the German Fourth Panzer Army and was tasked with providing flank protection for the German 57th Panzer Corps while it attacked. Left to the Don, the Romanian 6th Corps, right toward the steppe, the Romanian 7th Corps. By this time, the Romanian units could no longer be relied upon. Their fighting strength and will to resist had vanished. Sometime later, as there was no alternative, they were returned to their homeland. The new mission of the 6th Panzer Division was to serve under the 48th Panzer Corps. It would replace the 11th Panzer Division on the lower Chir, the division given up by General Hood. At the Chir, the 6th Panzer Division was to prevent a Russian breach through the now weakened 48th Corps. War Diary of 11th Panzer Regiment 1600 Hours The order issued to the adjutant by 1A, Operations Officer, reads as follows. Expedited departure by 2400 hours, leaving rearguard in place consisting of the Panzer Regiment, the 6th Reconnaissance Battalion, one company from 11th 114th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, on SPWs, and two batteries from 76th Artillery Regiment, under the command of Oberst von Hunersdorf. Destination, Patimkinskaya, on the Don. March Route, 146.9, reception there by 17th Panzer Division, which is stopped in the line of the southern perimeter, Salinaya Ravine, 146.9 to Serlivsky, Generalovsky to Potemkinskaya. It had been decided. The Sixth Army had given up its final opportunity to break out, a decision whose rightness or wrongness is easy to judge in retrospect. But who can know of the inner struggles and moral dilemmas of the leaders in that cauldron? As to the extent to which human failure and technical impossibilities informed or dictated the decision, let us not allow ourselves to pass judgment. In recognition of the enormity of this tragedy, the almost unprecedented valour, and the merits of the troops inside as well as out, it is far better to remain silent and bow down before God's judgment. That the entire basis of the summer offensive and the further development of this assault on Stalingrad and the Caucasus was a mistake is irrefutable. To transfer the blame onto our allies is unjustified. The assessment of their combat strength was a matter for the Wehrmacht High Command, and thus also for Hitler, whose ideas served as a basis for the entire operation. These forces should not have been given tasks that, given their low strength, they could never have fulfilled. Moreover, to deploy purely German units only at Voronish, Stalingrad, and in the Caucasus, and against an enemy like the Russians, was dilettantish. In this manner, the forward units were simply offered up to the Russians for the encirclement. To give due justice to the coalition forces, it must be stated that at times, to the extent that was possible given their low strength, the Romanians in particular gave their utmost. What still remained of the harrowing Stalingrad mission was that we would have to tie up as many Russian forces as possible for as long as possible, without any hope of reinforcements, in order to enable the southern front of German Army East, which was bleeding from all wounds, to consolidate its position. 24th December 1942 War Diary of 11th Panzer Regiment Vasilievka 24th December 1942 Zero, zero, hundred hours. The retreat from the bridgehead begins without enemy interference at twenty one hundred hours. The rear guard disengages at zero, zero, hundred hours as ordered, disrupted only by a few fire attacks. The radio message comes in that the Fuhrer, Hitler, has awarded Oberst von Hunersdorf the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross. With this, the first phase of the regiment's battles an unfortunately futile final attempt to achieve a breakthrough to Stalingrad, now come to an end. The regiment has additional laurels to attach to its colours, and now, undefeated by the enemy, it marches off to new missions. In radio messages and orders of the day, Army Group Captain Don, 4th Panzer Army High Command, and 57th Panzer Corps pay tribute to the performance of 6th Panzer Division, with special recognition to the 11th Panzer Regiment and its commanders. 1800 Hours At 0500 hours, 
The last vehicle drives southward across the blocking position formed by 23rd Panzer Division on line 157.0 to 146.9. Enemy pursuit is weak. At around 1000 hours, after a short refueling stop, the vehicles cross the bridge in Salivsky toward the south. At 1600 hours, they reach Potemkinskaya. Despite initial orders to continue on immediately, the troops are instead allowed to overnight in Potemkinskaya in order to rest for the first time since 11th December and to celebrate Christmas Eve. Telegram, 23rd December 1942 To the 6th Panzer Division via 57th Panzer Corps Order of the Day Tomorrow the 6th Panzer Division is to withdraw from our area of operations. It has borne the main burden of the advance across the Axai. I wish to express recognition and gratitude of the division, particularly to the 11th Panzer Regiment and its commander, for their unswerving fighting spirit and willingness to make sacrifices. Hote, General Oberst and Commander-in-Chief of the 4th Panzer Army. A related report by Commander, 6th, 11th Panzer Regiment. The order for our relief, or better said our separation, found us completely unprepared. Shortly before midnight, our panzers, almost the last of the division, left Vasilievka without enemy interference. In doing so, we were vacating one of the points furthest to the east that was still occupied by German Army East at that time. It was already dawn as we drove across our old battlefields, and it was close to midday when we rolled across the bridge in Salivsky. Fully replenished with panzers that had been restored in the workshops, we once more had the look of a respectable force. The evening of the 24th found us in Potemkinskaya on the Don. The village was already filled with Romanians, and we were able to overnight there. After moving into my shelter, I went to find the staff of my battalion, wanting to spend a short time with the commander, Major Dr. Baker, and other comrades on Christmas Eve. Right above me, just as in previous nights, I heard the stream of transport squadrons flying toward Stalingrad. They came from Salsk, as Marasovskaya could no longer be used as a supply base, and even Tadzinskaya had been taken by the enemy. Our future mission was to roll up on these enemy attack vanguards from the flank outwards toward the west. We sat together quietly and pondered the past days, as well as the uncertain future. Would the 4th Panzer Army be able to hold the Axi without us? Apparently no one was counting on it, as the present bridge over the Don was to be dismantled immediately after the last vehicle from the 6th Panzer Division had crossed. Would we get out of our present encirclement, which threatened to become much larger than the one at Stalingrad? We placed our faith in the commanders and the strength of our division. Wehrmacht Report, 24th December, 1942 Excerpt between Volga and Don, six hundred prisoners of war captured, and fifteen tanks destroyed. Counterattacks by the Soviets collapsed. Chapter 5 Retrospect and Outlook December 1942 to January 1943 Map 16 Lessons Learned Assessment of our forces, our Allied forces, and those of the enemy the end situation and later developments. Outside perspectives. The following will be an analysis of the overall situation of the Southern Front for the period beginning at the end of December 1942, with a short summary of the further developments specifically from perspective of the 6th Panzer Division. A valuable first step, however, would be to take an analytical look at the attack by the 4th Panzer Army. Overall, there is little argument as to the necessity of the attack and the manner of its execution, but many factors were in play. With respect to the time of the deployment, it must be stated that by 12th December it was too late. If this attack had begun on 4th or 5th December, according to plan, at a time where the 6th Panzer Division was deployment ready, the 4th Panzer Army would have had greater success. On 21st November, the minute the ring closed around Stalingrad, the Wehrmacht High Command should have deployed troops there. For reasons of time and distance, the best choice would have been the divisions and corps of Army Group A in the Caucasus, which were available at that time. In any case, without a stable Don front, these divisions would not have been able to continue to hold their positions in the Caucasus. 
As understandable as Hitler's order was, never to give up what had been captured, this tactic does not lead to success in battle. No decisive victory can be won without mobility and without the constant interplay between Schwerpunkt, main effort, and risk. This involves giving up ground that is unimportant or cannot be held. Trying to hold on to everything with weak forces simply surrenders the initiative to the enemy. When it came to Germans and Russians, another factor quickly became apparent. Although we were more flexible and superior in leadership, we were always inferior in numbers. The OKW, the OKH, had essentially become too disempowered by this time, should have given up on the situation in the Caucasus with its oil and shifted the entire Army Group A to operational mobility in the area of the Kalmyk Steppe and sent it to relieve Stalingrad. Hitler was, however, completely obsessed with his hold-out-to-the-last idea, especially because he had undeniably mastered the crisis outside Moscow with this approach during the previous winter. For this reason, he leaves all of Army Group A standing nearly idle, forbids the breakout of the Sixth Army from Stalingrad, and hands over the job of restoring the situation on the Don to General Feldmarschall von Manstein with nothing but wreckage to work with. Then, as if all that had not been enough, he orders Manstein to relieve Stalingrad. The first of these missions, considering the available forces and the weak and hesitantly led troops, was just about impossible. The second mission, that of relieving Stalingrad, was essential. It therefore remains even more incomprehensible that this mission was ordered without the simultaneous addition of strong troops. This could have been THE mission for Army Group A. Without any commander-in-chief, Group A was under the direct command of the Wehrmacht High Command, it remained almost completely in the same old positions, which were much too far away. At the same time, however, it was clear that in case of a breakthrough by the Russians at Rostov, not only would this army group be cut off, but the oil, as Hitler repeatedly pointed out, could not be transported out of the area. It was almost a miracle that at this moment the 6th Panzer Division was so readily available. It was brought in by rail from Brittany beginning in early November, that is, before the surrounding of Stalingrad, to serve as reserves behind the Italian army on the Don. This was a sound move, but too late again. By the time they arrived, the crisis had greatly expanded. Instead of receiving the needed forces from the Caucasus, the newly forming 4th Panzer Army received only the 57th General Headquarters, Corps Headquarters, and the worn-down 23rd Panzer Division. By giving up the bend of the Terek River, the fully intact 16th Infantry Division, motorized, which had only been tying down enemy forces, could have been released and supplied to the 4th Army. Furthermore, other forces from Army Group Don could have been provided for the benefit of Army Group A. The promised 15th Luftwaffe Field Division not only had limited attack power, but was still not completely put together, and in any case it arrived too late. Precious hours were squandered before the Wehrmacht High Command finally realized this and sent in the 17th Panzer Division, stationed at Ariol, as reserves. But the delayed decision caused this unit, too, to arrive on the battlefield too late. These three German divisions alone, the Romanians no longer counted as an attack force, might well have been too weak to relieve Stalingrad under any circumstances. Yet there was still hope, and not a totally foolish one, of still being able to rescue the surrounded troops. This would involve two spearhead attacks. The 48th Panzer Corps, which was still in need of reinforcements, would attack from the Chir bridgehead, and simultaneously the 6th Army would break out of the encirclement. How could this well-formulated intent be transformed into action, considering the following realities? 1. The 48th Panzer Corps did not receive the expected divisions, because these were, if they arrived at all, deployed at crisis locations, with the result that the Corps had been robbed of its attack power. It could only hold its positions with the greatest of effort. It could not recapture Kalach, an important Don bridge, nor could it hold the bridgehead at the Chir mouth. For that Corps the only task remaining was to tie down Russian forces. 2. The 57th Panzer Corps did receive its expected divisions, but because the 23rd Panzer Division had to leave its wheeled vehicles behind due to the thawing period on the steppe, it arrived too late. 
Instead of the more favourable time of early December, the attack could not begin until 12th December. The 17th Panzer Division, for the aforementioned reasons, participated only in the second half of the attack, which was already in progress. One can well imagine the degree of success that might have been granted the 57th Panzer Corps had it been able to command the 17th Panzer Division from the very start of the attack. Had this been the case, the delayed attack date would have been well compensated by strength. 3. The 6th Army could not commit itself to breaking out, so that the entire operation plan to set them free essentially collapsed. The forces outside were too weak to break through the ring alone. Above all, the season proved unfavourable for large operations. The days were much too short, and often prevented a budding victory to reach full bloom. It was not until later that the chance for a victory on the steppe presented itself, despite the disconnected fronts and the darkness of night. But the successful advance on Vasilyevka was not founded completely on the boldness of battlegroup Hunersdorf, but on a bit of good fortune involving the failure of the Russian intelligence technology. The earlier successful breach of the enemy's strong anti-tank gun positions at Hill 146.9 proved that the night can become a great aid to the attacker. Although it may be presumptuous to draw generalized theories from one attack by the 57th Panzer Corps, the fact remains that because of the German Wehrmacht's fear of engaging in night attacks, which was later more or less discarded, many chances for victory had been wasted. For scheduled movements, the iced-over ravines, Balkas, not only disrupted and impeded our progress, but also had an effect on our decisions and successes. Chilyakov on 12th-13th, Askai Bridge at Salivsky on 13th-14th, 15th and 16th December, and at Neklikskaya Ravine on 17th December. Depending on temperatures, by day or by night, these presented a difficult hazard. On the slick surfaces, especially if the thermometer read over zero, or if a short period of sunshine had thawed the southern slope, neither snow chains on the wheeled vehicles nor ice studs for the panzers were of any help. The panzers spun down the slopes as if on a tilted sheet of ice. In the fluctuating temperatures, the more traffic on the roads leading through the ravines, the slicker the surfaces. When short bursts of sun rays appeared, followed quickly by frost, all the work done by the pioneers— deployed here for this very reason, was quickly cancelled out. Added to this was the delay in the urgently needed bridge construction at the Aksai in Salivsky. Due to inability to bring in ammunition and fuel, those troops who had fought from the beginning were deprived of success. It had come to this, even though every panzer always carried almost double the expected amount of ammunition needed, for instance the panzer three five centimetre long, about two hundred rounds, and 5,000 to 7,000 rounds of machine-gun ammunition. The issue of carrying ammunition and fuel along versus having it resupplied deserves some serious discussion. Measures taken by the troops on their own initiative proved to be temporary and were limited to specific vehicle types, regions, or other particulars. In quickly shifting situations, a stricter leadership is needed when it comes to coded radio messages. A critical appraisal of the radio messages quoted in this book reveals again and again that the radio orders from the division often no longer fit the situation. Due to technical difficulties, answers to questions were delayed. This meant that they reached the commanders too late, and the decisions that came from them were no longer valid ones. This presents a definite obstacle to rapid mobile operations. The encoding regulations and the way they were used by the German army during the war made it impossible to quickly summarize a situation and develop a Schwerpunkt, the most important basic principle in leading an attack by a panzer division. Although concrete proposals for changes in this area are beyond the purpose of this work, the documentary evidence in the reports quoted here demonstrates that even within the structure of division-level leadership, in lower echelons, below the level of battalion or section, radio messages were not encoded, a faster means of conveying orders must be found. It is left to us to commemorate the achievements of the troops on both sides of the encirclement. It is true that the larger goal of rescuing the troops there provided us all with a special incentive, but the fighting spirit of the Grenadiers, Panzer crews, and the other military branches deserves special recognition, having suffered through the cold weather and faced a tough, numerically superior enemy. 
The resupply units, despite the rough terrain and the vast areas that were under enemy fire, constantly tried to bring ammunition, fuel, and provisions to the comrades fighting at the front, sometimes unsuccessfully, but through no fault of their own. The workshops and the repair services worked without respite. No one let his comrades down. The cooperation in the corps, down to the smallest units and battle groups, was outstanding. In the case of the older, more seasoned divisions, it once more became evident how important it was to know and trust one another. For this reason alone, they were far superior in comparison to the newly established units. Unfortunately, as the war drew to its close, the highest levels of leadership failed to recognize this fact. Increasingly, the old divisions with tried-and-true troops were permitted to bleed dry, while we searched for salvation in the multitude of newly established units. We often paid for this with blood. As late as 1945, the exhausted but more experienced divisions had far more defensive victories than the newly established ones that were equally well equipped. Experience can neither be taught nor learned, but gathered by the individual over the course of time. As to our enemy in the Kalmyk steppe, one cannot deny him respect. He may have fought differently, but he never lacked in fighting spirit, toughness, or ruthlessness toward himself. In these areas we can only continue to learn from him. He, too, knew what was at stake. The errors in leadership, which could clearly be seen at the time, cannot be analysed in detail until such time as appropriate documentation is available from his side. In particular, the Romanians showed themselves to be excellent soldiers, especially those who later fought under German leadership. In toughness and fearlessness for their own lives, they were similar to the Russians. Their own commanders may have been of lesser quality, and, to be fair, their equipment was not equal to that of the enemy. Moreover, there was no relationship of trust and loyalty between commanders and subordinates. Symptomatic of this was the fact that in a Romanian company there were separate messes, very different from one another, for officers, NCOs and soldiers. End Situation and Assessment At the end of December 1942, the situation between Voroshilovgrad and the Kalmyk steppe had deteriorated to the point that it was not only about the encircled troops, but also about the fate of the entire German Southern Front. At this point, the Russians had only been held at bay by small, scattered German units, particularly Group Freter Pico, in the area of Milerova, which held on tenaciously amid heavy losses. The Russians were now positioned in Tatsinskaya, in the centre of the large bend in the Don River, in the outskirts of Marasovskaya, deep in the rear of the German troops fighting at the Chia River. They were now pushing harder in the direction of the important Donetsk bridges. The 4th Panzer Army stood south of the Don, and after the departure of the 6th Panzer Division, had only had two weak German divisions. Unable to hold back the heavy Russian counterattack on 25th December, they had to retreat by way of the old starting positions at Katyelnikova to an area behind the Sal River. Without flank security, the Russians could repeatedly raid their positions using double envelopments out in the vast open steppe. In mid-January, the 4th Army was able to link up with Army Group A, which was also retreating. They were reinforced by the relatively strong 16th Infantry Division, motorized, which came from Elista. Only then did 4th Panzer Army finally gain a somewhat firm position on the Manich River. When the 4th Panzer Army retreated, it was weaker than a corps in terms of size, the Russians took advantage of the opportunity and crossed the Don at Potemkinskaya and Zimlianskaya. They then attacked the troops in the rear that were fighting at the Chia River, Army Detachment Hollit and 48th Panzer Corps. The 6th Panzer Division was attached to these units, but had already crossed over the Don. For the units left behind at the Chia, their only option was to secure the rear of the quickly organized group Meet and relocate to Tadzinskaya on the Danets via Marasovskaya. The retreat took place between 27th December 1942 and 20th January 1943. There was no sense of panic, but as the units moved back they also counter-attacked, often inflicting heavy casualties on the Russians. Back in mid-December 1942, the Italian army had dropped out. Now the Hungarian army south of Voronezh failed completely, creating a similar crisis. But Army Group Don was able to hold the Donets, 
and by springtime of 1943, after heavy fighting, the new situation was brought back under control and was finalized with the recapture of Kharkov. It is unfortunate that currently there are no translations available of archived reports on the German advance to relieve Stalingrad. The following excerpts from Russian, English and Romanian publications, however, attest to how significant the battles in the Kalmyk steppe were for the Russians as well as for the Germans. The numbers cited in these works are mostly inaccurate, particularly those in the Malinovki report, which are subject to bias and are likely much exaggerated. From these documents, however, one is free to form his or her own impressions. The Soviet Land, the Great War of the Fatherland of the Soviet Union, 1917-1947 I. I. Mina, I. M. Raskon and A. L. Sidorov S. W. A. Verlag, Berlin, 1947 Pages 104-5 Simultaneously, the Soviet units contained the attack by the Manstein Group, which had attempted to break through from Kotilnikov to Stalingrad. In bitter defensive fighting, they allowed the enemy to bleed out and, after reinforcements had arrived, transitioned to attack mode. The Manstein Group suffered a decisive defeat. All possibility of rescuing the encircled troops was now beyond the reach of the German high command. Soviet Marschelle haben das Wort Soviet marshals have their say. Kirill D. Kalinov, Hansa Verlag, Josef Tot, Hamburg, 1950, pages 285 to 287. Malinovsky begins his presentation with this. On 11th December 1942, we intercepted a message addressed to Paulus, which was worded as follows. Begin morning offensive to liberate you. Orders from the Führer. Counting on celebrating Christmas with you. In fact, on 12th December the German offensive did begin. The starting point was Similianskaya. Von Manstein had prepared considerable troops, four armoured divisions, 6th, 11th, 17th and 24th, two motorised divisions, 15th and 16th, three infantry divisions, 4th, 5th and 18th, two divisions of Romanian cavalry, 12 artillery regiments, as well as an independent air fleet. The entirety formed a Mot Pulk, consisting of the best forces in the Wehrmacht. Mot Pulk is a particular type of motorized formation attributed to the Germans in World War II. Its firepower in cannons and panzers was fully equal to our forces against which the attack was directed. The first days saw extremely hard fighting. The Germans succeeded in crossing the Axai and pushing through onto the left bank of the Don, as far as the small river Chir, and on the right bank, as far as Abgonorova. We had to request our heavy tanks and our anti-tank guns in order to bring von Manstein to a halt. Besides these, our combat aviation units, our yaks, our migs and our lags had to be brought in as quickly as possible. The 16th of December, the decisive day, arrived. The Germans drew nearer to Stalingrad, coming as close as just 42 kilometers from the ring. The German soldiers trapped inside the city could hear the thunder of the cannons in the distance. On 17th and 18th December, we deployed all of our available tanks against von Manstein's panzers. Yeryominka even gave the order to send the 1,500 tanks that were being held in reserve by the High Command to the most threatened place in the sector, the village of Biryukov. Vasilyevsky protested this measure, but after a short quarrel over who had the direct authority for this, Stalin permitted Yeryominka's measures. The tank battle near the village of Biryukov developed into one of the most difficult of the entire war. Against the 1,000 German panzers, we sent double the number into the battle. The entire success of our operations at Stalingrad was at risk if we did not succeed in intercepting the Germans here. No cost was too high. Meanwhile, I requested permission from Voronov to send the 3,000 motorized guns, which he held in reserve, to the 42-kilometer-wide corridor, which still separated von Manstein from the Paulus army. On 21st December, these batteries opened fire from all tubes. The effect was so powerful that after three days, von Manstein only had 400 panzers and two artillery regiments left. The armoured part of the Mot Pulk formation was completely in shreds. Then, on 24th December, we transitioned to the offensive. Over the next three days, we threw von Manstein not just back to his starting positions, 
but also forced him to retreat even further. In the process of pursuit, my army captured the village of Katilnikova. Stalingrad, Steinberg Fairlag, Zurich, 1945. The first authentic report of the Russian generals Rakasovsky, Voronov, Telegin, Malinin, and war correspondents about one of the largest and most decisive battles in world history. Pages 15 to 16. After the German high command had led its troops into a blind alley in the outskirts of Stalingrad and delivered them into a catastrophic situation, it undertook the desperate attempt to liberate its troops encircled by the Red Army at Stalingrad. To this purpose, the enemy concentrated a strong assembly of troops in the area north of Katilnikova, and on 12th December began its attack operations against our troops. The Soviet troops, which operated south of Stalingrad, were tasked by the high command of the Red Army to defeat enemy's new assault group, push the Germans back toward the south, and remove all possibility of their reaching the divisions trapped in Stalingrad. In the attacks in the area south of Stalingrad, the Soviet troops advanced 100 to 150 kilometers and liberated more than 130 villages. During the battles from 12th through 30th December, the Soviet troops defeated the German 6th, 17th and 23rd Panzer Divisions and the 16th Motorized Division and the Romanian 4th and 18th Infantry and 5th and 18th Cavalry Divisions. The deaths alone cost the German fascists 21,000 men. The number of captured came to 5,200 soldiers and officers. Included in the wealth of captured goods brought in by the Soviet troops were 40 aircraft, 94 panzers, 292 cannons, 329 motor vehicles, and a large quantity of other weapons, as well as military equipment related to the Air Force and Panzer forces. In the battles, the Soviet troops destroyed 306 aircraft, 667 panzers, 257 cannons, 945 motor vehicles, and many other kinds of military goods. Ibid, pages 58 and 59. During the process of encirclement, the Soviet High Command immediately secured the units that were surrounding the enemy in the west, southwest, and south. Some of this security force held back the advance by Manstein in tough fighting. But then our glorious Guards divisions broke out like an avalanche from the north toward the south, pushed back Manstein's panzer units, took Katilnikova, and pushed the entire Group Don to Rostov. The hopes of the encircled fascists for the defeat of our troops had vanished, and with them went the hopes for their liberation. Mikhail Bragin The Hinge of Fate Winston S. Churchill Alfred Scherz Verlag Bern, 1951 Page 637 English edition, Horton Mifflin, Boston, 1951 Page 734 we must now revert to the tremendous drama unfolding around Stalingrad. As has been described, Paulus's 6th German army had been caught by the Russian pincers and encircled as the result of the November conflict. Manstein's supreme effort from the southwest in December to break through the Russian cordon and relieve the beleaguered garrison had failed. He pierced the Russian line to a depth of 40 miles, but there he was stopped, still 50 miles from Stalingrad. A new Russian offensive from the north threatened his flank and forced him into a retreat which spread to all the German southern front, including the Caucasus, and ended only when it was back behind Rostov on the Don. There was now no hope of further succor for Paulus. Der Zweite Weltkrieg, 1939 to 1945. World War II, 1939 to 1945. General Major J. F. C. Fuller, Humboldt Verlag, Wien, Stuttgart, 1950, pages 298 and 299. After von Manstein had assembled an army with the strength of about 150,000 men, he advanced to the railway line Salsk Stalingrad, broke through the Russian lines between Tsimlyansk and Katilnikova. After a tough battle, he captured the second of these villages. Yet hardly had this happened when, on the 16th, Volutin attacked Bakovsk in the north of his left flank. General Golikov's army group, which now appeared at Volutin's right, took Boguchar on Don and overran the Italian Eighth Army. Because of this upheaval, 
Manstein's left flank and the area that lay to his rear was now exposed. The reserves that were allocated for his front were quickly sent to the north, so as to stop Volutin's advance, and that of Golikov on Milyarova, a station on the extremely important railway line Voronezh rostov This scattering of reserves led, at least partially, to the defeat of Manstein's right flank. Here, on the 27th, he was defeated by the tank forces of General Malinovsky, which is also why Katelnikova was lost. For the relief army, this meant failure. Rumanian's Weg zum Satellitenstaat Romania's path to becoming a satellite country. Jon George. Kurt vor Winkel Verlag, Heidelberg, 1952. Pages 269 to 270. Left and right of Stalingrad there are enormous gaping holes. The German Sixth Army and the Romanian troops that had been forced back toward them were in a bind. Now the German commanders stood before a new, difficult question of a strategic and psychological sort. Stalingrad had become a symbol of the battle in the East, and in fact for Germany itself, as well as for the Soviets. Strategic wisdom required that the Sixth Army and a significant amount of war material be rescued. But the German commanders gave precedence to the psychological aspect. Stalingrad had to be held for reasons of prestige, and had to be relieved. The German commanders believed that the connection to the encirclement could be restored through rash, improvised measures. They appointed Feldmarschall von Manstein and awarded him the command of all the German-Romanian forces. Many had become exhausted, but then fresh troops were thrown in head over heels. From all corners, even from France, significant forces rolled in, above all panzer units. They assembled in the area of Rostov, as Manstein's mission did not only consist of consolidating the fronts and relieving Stalingrad, but it was also a matter of securing the troops operating in the Caucasus and holding the route open to Rostov. Some of Manstein's undertakings showed, at least in initial, their initial approach, a splendid personal character. This was primarily apparent in the southwest of Stalingrad, where two newly arrived panzer divisions, with support from Romanian forces, advanced nearer to Stalingrad. The superiority of the German troops proved clear, but their numbers were unfortunately too small. Despite splendid successes in the beginning, they were not able to cope with the onrush of Bolshevik masses. Now Manstein had to limit himself to halting the Russian assault in order to secure the important traffic hub of Rostov. This concludes On to Stalingrad by Horst Scheibert Narrated by Derek Perkins Copyright 2021 by Association of the U.S. Army This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Casemate Publishers, and was produced in the year 2022 by Tantor Media, Incorporated, a division of recorded books, which holds the copyright thereto. Please visit tantor.com for more information on our growing library of...